Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Greg Daniel. I'm deputy director at the Center for um, at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our um, public workshop today, leveraging randomized clinical trials to generate real-world evidence for regulatory purposes, which is being hosted by the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy and supported by a cooperative agreement with the FDA. I'm not sure I really need to remind all of you why we're here today, as many of you have been with us and FDA in forums like this uh, one over the last several years. But in short, an exploding amount of real-world data paired with new and increasingly sophisticated methods and analytic approaches for turning that real-world data into real-world evidence have led to a growing call to make these data and evidence uh, actionable for a wide range of healthcare decision makers including regulatory authorities like the FDA. FDA's directive to establish a real-world evidence program was codified in the 21st Century Cures Act in sixth, um, sixth PDUFA um, authorization, which outlined a path for the agency to explore the use of real-world data and real-world evidence to, one, help support the approval of a new indication for a drug already approved under 505C of the FD&C Act, or two, to help support or satisfy drug post-approval study requirements. To that end, the FDA has engaged with many of you to better understand the potential challenges of using real-world data and real-world evidence in a variety of regulatory contexts, and ultimately how to overcome some of those challenges. A framework published by the FDA in December of 2018 describes many of these challenge areas and key considerations for evaluating real-world data and real-world evidence and their roadmap for moving toward eventual guidance in this space. As all of you know, this includes a wide range of issues related to data quality and relevancy, study designs and analytic methods, and how best to potentially meet well-established regulatory requirements. Today's discussion will focus in on one specific part of the puzzle, the use of real-world data generated during randomized studies embedded in clinical care settings to generate real-world evidence for regulatory purposes. You'll hear momentarily from our FDA colleagues that there are a wide array, array of potential uses of real-world data to improve other parts of randomized study designs and randomized clinical trials, such as improving the efficiency uh, of identifying and recruiting patients, or for utilizing new technologies to take traditional randomized clinical trials to the patient through things like remote monitoring. But for the purposes of today's discussion and tomorrow's, um, we are discussing how to design and conduct a study that randomizes patients within their clinical care settings, follows those patients prospectively, and collects real-world data to generate real-world evidence that supports a regulatory application as outlined in FDA's framework. Throughout the day, we'll be highlighting actual trials and case examples that have uh, been or in the process of being uh, implemented in clinical settings to further illuminate the challenges in this space. While not all of these trials were designed to address regulatory questions, they do provide concrete examples of how trials and trial teams have dealt with relevant study design issues. Importantly, the discussion in this forum today will help to further refine FDA's RWE program and build the foundations for future guidance. Uh, just to provide a quick overview of the agenda for uh, today and tomorrow, and then I'll turn to a few housekeeping items. Um, we're going to start the day with a keynote address by uh, Jacqueline Corgan Karai, the Director of the Office of Medical Policy at CEDAR FDA, and she'll be providing some framing for the day's discussion as well as FDA's motivation for convening this particular public workshop. We'll then have two opening presentations that will explore key considerations for randomized designs at the point of care and the landscape of approaches currently in use. We'll then move into a series of panel discussions uh, for the remainder of the day, which will take on different methods components for implementing randomized clinical trials that generate RWE for regulatory purposes. Um, the first of those sessions will start at 9.45 and will focus on um, intervention selection and study design issues. That'll take us to our first break at 11 a.m. and we'll reconvene at 11.15 uh, for a session on outcome measurement using real-world data. This will take us to lunch uh, at 12.30. That will be on your own. Uh, we'll reconvene back here at 1.30 p.m. 
and start back up on a panel on key considerations for building in uh, real world settings. Uh, 245 will be another break and then we'll come back for a um, final panel session on causal inferences. So we'll hear a range of issues, uh, process issues, study design issues, implementation, uh, but how that all gets to causal inference will be um, discussed in that particular session. We'll end day one with an open comment period, and that'll provide time to reflect on what was discussed today. We'll hear uh, and encourage comments from the audience uh, and the webcast on how FDA might uh, consider appropriate uses for other key issues regarding the evidence generated for these from these trials for regulatory decision making. Um, on day two, we'll move our focus from trial design and methods to relevant uh, regulatory and practical considerations for ensuring appropriate conduct of the trial. Um, uh, we have three focus areas, uh, areas teed up for tomorrow. Uh, presentations will cover and center on the Salford Lung Study, which as many of you know is not the only but one of the um, uh, key examples of a trial that was integrated within clinical settings for regulatory decision making. Members of the trial team will show how they dealt with some of the, these issues and our panelists will provide some additional examples to further tease out key issues. This will then be followed by a session uh, where we'll hear from stakeholders on what issues they feel are relevant for building FDA's RWE framework, uh, continuing to build uh, uh, and a program moving forward. Uh, we'll end tomorrow with final open comment session. Okay, a few more housekeeping uh, items. It's really humid, so I'm sweating. Uh, <laughs> I had to walk several. Um, before I hand it over to Jacqueline, a few housekeeping items. I want to remind everyone that this is a public meeting. Uh, it's also being webcast online. Uh, the record of the webcast will be available on the Duke Margolis website following the event. Um, this meeting is intended to spur discussion. Uh, we're not looking to achieve consensus. Uh, uh, we won't be voting, uh, but rather we'll hear a variety of perspectives on these issues. And as you can see, there's a lot of uh, reserve time throughout all of the sessions for comments, questions, and then a, a session at the end for additional open comments. Um, there are microphones set up in the, in the aisles uh, and we'll be taking questions from the audience and the webcast. If you do have a question, uh, please send it to the following address, rweregulatory at duke.edu. Um, you can also follow us. Uh, we'll be live tweeting uh, the event, and many of you in the room can too. Uh, uh, please follow at Duke Margolis using the um, hashtag rweregulatory. And as a heads up to speakers and panelists, uh, Haley Sullivan will be keeping us all on schedule, and she's in the front with some um, uh, time cards. And lastly, feel free to help yourself to beverages and um, uh, drinks outside of the room. So with that, I'll uh, uh, open things up for uh, uh, Jacqueline corgan Curry, as I mentioned, Director of Office of Medical Policy at CEDAR. Okay, thank you, Greg. I have good news. This will be the shortest keynote you've ever had. I just want to say a couple things before we get started. First of all, I want to thank all our speakers and our panelists for joining us and really sharing their expertise over the next two days. I also want to thank um, those who are here in person and those who have joined us virtually for the next day and a half. I want to extend my thanks to the staff from Duke Margolis who really have done all the work to pull us here together and prepare us, and especially uh, Adam, Adam, Adam Kretsch, Kara Morgan, and Morgan Romain. And finally, I want to, of course, thank my colleagues at FDA who are coming here to share their expertise, as well as those who have sort of behind the scenes brought us here, and that's uh, Dr. El Zarag, Captain David Martin, and Captain D.M. Perron. So as Greg mentioned, of course, we do have a congressional mandate in this area to develop a program and evaluate RWE, but I think it's just as important to know that we are actually just as interested as Congress is in this. We understand that there's challenges to clinical trials. We understand the need to make them more efficient, and we understand the need to really integrate and, and bring clinical research and practice together. We've talked a little bit about real-world evidence. Our definition of real-world evidence is clinical evidence regarding the usage and potential benefits or risks of a medical product derived from analysis of real-world data, and I think most of us are familiar with sources of real-world data. By analysis of real-world data, we were referring to study design, which is inclusive of randomized trials as well as observational studies. In late 2016, leadership from FDA wrote about real-world evidence and what it might provide us. And they said that as we adopt the tools and methods of traditional trials to real world settings, we must consider the components of such trials that are critical to obtaining valid results and minimizing bias. 
And although real world evidence can be used in multiple scenarios, the selection of the appropriate analytic approaches will be determined by the key dimensions of the study design, including the use of prospectively planned interventions and randomization. So our goal over these next two days is to identify what are those key dimensions of the study design and break down the components of a clinical trial that could be integrated more closely into clinical practice and thereby capitalize on the use of data captured every day in these settings. The prospective randomized trial in this setting has the potential to both generate high quality data, be more accessible to diverse populations, and realize the efficiencies that RWD has to offer, while still providing assurance that randomization will control for key confounders, both known and unknown. You may have noticed that we are not using the term pragmatic in this meeting. We understand that by bridging the divide between clinical research and clinical practice, the resulting design will likely have certain pragmatic elements, such as broader inclusion criteria and intervention delivered in clinical practice with follow-up done by patients' providers, and endpoints that are relevant to patients and providers and therefore are captured in the course of clinical care. However, we also recognize that different clinical questions may warrant a more or less pragmatic design. And we don't, don't want to focus on achieving a degree of pragmatism, but rather a degree to which real-world data can enhance the efficiency and relevancy of our trials. In our framework, we promise to provide guidance in this area, and we hope over the next few days that this meeting will help us all illuminate relevant concepts of interest. Identification of these key issues in the design and implementation will assist us in determining where do we need to provide guidance. So I know a lot of you have been to real world meetings in the past. Um, we at this meeting were hoping not to talk about the forest, but to really get down to the weeds. So I want to thank everyone for being here. I want everyone to roll up their sleeves on this nice warm Washington summer day. <laughs> and let's get started and I'll yield any remaining time to Dr. Temple. <laughs> So how do I get my slides up? There you go. Oh, I see. Okay, here you go. There you go. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, despite the heat, it's reasonably comfortable in here. Um, as everyone in here knows, there's tremendous interest in making use of the vast amounts of data that are already collected in healthcare systems. Uh, electronic records, claims data, registries, all that stuff. To do that, to more efficiently generate evidence of effectiveness. The greatest interest actually, uh, not here today, is in use of uh, observational data. That is not randomized trials. But fortunately, I'm glad to say that is not the subject of today's, uh, of, of today's effort. Um, in previous publications by FDA, there's a well-known paper by uh, Rachel Sherman and a whole bunch of us in 2016. Um, we emphasize the lack of the difficulties and lack of experience in using observational data. And we've got an interesting study going on, but uh, other people can tell you about that. What we urged attention to was using real-world data in randomized clinical trials. And that's what this workshop is about, which is, which is terrific. Um, uh, but there are many issues that will need to be considered, and indeed the program shows this, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. Um, so the conference is about using data from the healthcare system in randomized trials to generate real-world evidence. As uh, Jacqueline indicated, what people mean by real-world evidence and the specific study designs to be considered is not well established, and that's why the conference is so important. Um, and the specifics of the data generated by a randomized trial within the healthcare system could vary tremendously depending on whether the endpoints uh, that are used are just extracted from routine care or are actually put at, into the study as something to be looked at. And I'll try to explore the full range of uh, possibilities, obviously, briefly. Um, before addressing study design issues, I want to just offer one note about the effect on outcome of the quality and precision of the data. 
Um, whether, for example, a person uh, did or did not have an outcome of interest and the severity of that outcome isn't always obvious, even for a well-done trial with hard endpoints and everybody looking at them. Um, and that's why in cardiovascular outcome studies, we often have adjudication committees to help dis uh, decide on that sort of thing. And many endpoints are even more subjective than that if they're recorded at all, like pain, depression, and stuff. You just have to know whether you, uh, whether you have it or not. And as everybody here undoubtedly knows, imprecision and noise can obscure effects. That is, if the thing is noisy, you can fail in a superiority study or get a spurious success in a non-inferiority study. So precision really matters, and that could depend on the data system. Maybe registries are better than EHRs or claims data. I don't know. That's one of the things we need to, uh, we need to find out about. I'm not sure anybody can read this, but the easiest use of real-world data, the so-called low-hanging fruit, um, and even though this is not really a major point of this uh, workshop, it seems very critical to take note of one obvious use of real-world data that doesn't get enough discussion, and that is by facilitating identification of potential study participants. That is, identifying the people for study using EHR or claims data that would be very important as recruitment, and, and that seems critical to me. But, you know, I don't do trials, I just, we just watch them, is that what everybody says is that recruitment is a major impediment to getting a trial done. This could make a big difference. You'd look within the system and find them. So you could find the presence of the disease or condition being studied. That should be fairly easy. Maybe you can get important patient characteristics like demographics or the past history and potential enrichment factors like how long the disease been there, how severe it was, whether it led to hospitalization and stuff. History of compliance with treatment, you can look at that sort of thing. Past outcome events, heart attacks, strokes and stuff. Relevant laboratory measures. Uh, maybe you can get a lot of what you need to uh, recruit the trial, which would be a big difference. And then having identified people, the actual study could just be a conventional trial uh, following the screen for patient identification, which would include specific study monitoring for effectiveness using relevant endpoints. Uh, you could look at safety outside the, uh, outside the system. Uh, that is, you could have a regular uh, case report form. You could, uh, you might need to get uh, new consent with full information uh, reported to the patients. You might need more detailed entry criteria, history, lab tests and stuff. I don't know if whether that's still real world evidence after you found the patients in the real world and then did it. But that's something to talk about. Um, so, as noted, an easy use of real world data is to find patients, uh, which is a major problem. And it seems possible, at least, that patients could be told about the study and consented, possibly queried to obtain more details beyond the EHR and stuff, to allow enrichment with disease severity, um, other features like abnormal renal function and stuff like that. Anyway, you then do a conventional randomized trial with identified investigators, scheduled monitoring, regular laboratory data, complete safety assessments, et cetera. That's one kind of thing to think about. Um, but at least in some cases, probably for a marketed drug where the need for safety data is more limited, maybe clinical, clinic visits could be markedly reduced by using novel endpoints to provide some or even all of the data. We're having growing numbers of examples of these, but um, they include uh, clinic visits by tele telemedicine. That reduces the amount of effort everybody has to go to come in. Use of online PROs and use of devices such as smart watches and others to detect how many steps you took and all that kind of stuff. So those endpoints are not EHRs or claims data, but they are at least arguably real world, uh, real world evidence. Um, when you could use real world data alone from EHR and claims to assess the effect of an intervention, uh, it's obviously possible for some very important endpoints, notably survival, uh, although there's always questions about cause-specific mortality and hospitalization, but again, there's always concern about whether the description of the reason for hospitalization is accurate. Um, and it's clearly recognized that 
the state of very few symptomatic endpoints will be reliably recorded, not anxiety, depression, pain, anxiety, and all that kind of stuff. So it's not clear that you can use the system to detect those kinds of endpoints. The only ones we've ever seen discussions of have been uh, in certain oncology settings, cardiovascular outcomes, and maybe some pulmonary settings. So when you might use real-world data remains to be seen. Um, sorry. Okay, if the drug is not marketed, um, you probably, sorry. If the drug is marketed, you probably need uh, safety monitoring that uh, goes beyond what can be captured in the, in the uh, uh, EHR. Um, so you'll need observations periodically, lab tests, actual visits with the investigator, although conceivably done uh, in decentralized ways with local lab tests, telemedicine, and so on. But in this case, the trial will be more or less conventional, uh, but with use of decentralized data. It'll probably still need identified investigators with clear monitoring responsibility, again with the potential for decentralized interactions, but that's a little more like a conventional trial. But there are some cases that seem special. Suppose the treatment is a one-time treatment, uh, TPA or streptokinase in a post-infarction trial. You only give it once. Um, or is a maintained, standardized, and unchanging treatment with late outcomes of interest, such as adjuvant chemotherapy or bisphosphonate fracture prevention trial. There's nothing much to think about in change. I mean, there may be toxicity to watch for. but. Maybe there's some way of incorporating those into the system and just watching for the outcomes, which should show up, in fact, in the healthcare, uh, in healthcare records. Uh, there could clearly be safety issues. Maybe these could be done without identified investigators as part of a sort of medical practice thing, and could that depend on the healthcare system? It seems easier to do those things in the VA, um, but maybe there could be standardized queries sent out periodically. So there are possible uh, hybrid uh, versions of all these things. Um, and there are examples of trials that have been done using real world data or almost real world data. I, I don't know, it's hard to tell. It's uh, funny, I've gone back to look at uh, protocols for the Gissy study a million times, and there's just a bunch of things you can't tell. You can't tell how they consented patients. You can't tell who the investigators were. Anyway, but in, 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 in the Gissy study, 176 Italian coronary care units um, took patients who were within 12 hours of a heart attack, and they were randomized to streptokinase or placebo. The primary endpoint was 21 day survival and it showed a nice effect, and that was based on registry data. They also got other endpoints later from the local resources, but it's very hard to tell from reading, it. and I tried again last night, uh, who the investigators were, what their individual responsibilities was, was it the whole clinic that was the investigator? Anyway, it's hard to tell. Um, the TASTE study, which everybody knows about probably, um, is a, a, a perfect case for this. And the question was, does intracoronary aspiration of thrombus prior to percutaneous uh, 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 intervention, randomize, uh, people were randomized to uh, uh, thrombus aspiration plus PCI or PCI alone in patients with STEMI, and the question was, did that work? They used the Swedish Coronary Angiography and Angioplasty Registry System, SCAR, to find patients within 24 hours of pain onset, and then they randomized to aspiration plus PCI or PCI alone. Primary endpoint was mortality, which they got from a registry, and they used other registries, uh, which are available in Sweden, uh, for other endpoints like recurrent MI and stent thrombosis. A pretty good example, again, made possible by the fact that the intervention was a one-time thing. Um, one that's going on uh, in this country, the IMPACT AF study, um, is a randomized trial in mini sentinel data partners of the effect of anticoagulant of the effect on anticoagulant use in patients with atrial fibrillation but not yet receiving an anticoagulant of a standardized message to physicians. And the study will also look at stroke, stroke outcomes. Uh, again, it's sort of a one-time thing, and you can then uh, let the system uh, do what it will. Um, 
It's also worth noting that the Peter uh, Collins proposal in 1995 for large simple trials goes a long way towards simplifying conventional randomized trials, bringing them closer to real world data by minimizing data collection exclusions and so on. And the ISIS trials were pretty good that way. But they had many remaining conventional components. There are, other, there are other issues that we'll be discussing about later. Who exactly is an investigator and what's their responsibility when you do something in the real world setting? Uh, almost all trials, even real world trials, involve investigators going beyond usual care, maybe except when there's a single dose, as I said before. How does this fit with the IND rules and responsibilities? And then a very important question always is the consequences of decreased rigor in assessing outcomes. As I said before, noise obscures much of what is sought in pragmatic trials could lead to less precision. Some patients may not have the disease or the desired severity of the disease. Some endpoints are missed or erroneous. Patients are lost to follow up. Patients stop using the drug or take other similar things. All of those problems decrease study power. A bad outcome in a different showing trial and a credibility problem in a non inferiority study. Um, I didn't do this very well. I mean, uh, one of the things that people talk about all the time is pragmatic trials. And when you go back to the Prisis uh, uh, presentation uh, by uh, uh, Wolf, uh, Varenstein, and others, you look at all the various things they want to do differently, and most of them uh, uh, aren't going to help very much. One, one is one that they say is you don't want perfect compliance in, in a pragmatic trial. Well. That's not right. Of course you do. You don't want to, what, do I want to know whether a drug still works if nobody takes it? No, I'm not interested in that. I already know the answer. It's, uh, it's, it's not important. So you need good compliance in any trial to find out whether the drug works. And then the other features, uh, what the, another principal feature of the pragmatic trial is that it has a broad range of people. Well, we're all for that. We've been trying internally to get people to include older people, people from uh, a wide variety of uh, races and all that kind of stuff. So we, we share that feature of the pragmatic trial. But most of the others sort of just get in the way. But it's one of the things that probably should be discussed. Um, but I, I, I was... <laughs> back and looked at a lot of the writings about pragmatic trials. And I confess the benefit doesn't really uh, seem entirely clear to me. If patients don't take the drug, the effect will be smaller. I know that. I didn't need a trial to tell me that. If the patient populations are poorly defined, if they don't really have the disease, all those things lead to failure to show that the drug works. Um, and uh, I don't see what the benefit of that is. Um, explanatory trials. Uh, I don't even know whether explanatory trials do give different results or how much documentation there is of the difference between a so-called pragmatic trial and an explanatory trial. And I have an old interchange with Sean uh, Tunis about whether there have been any showings that this has happened. And there are, according to Sfarenstein, very few, but they're interested in looking. So the whole issue deserves some discussion if we're going to talk about it. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm extremely skeptical. Uh, the, the main difference I see between the two is compliance, and I already know if people don't take the drug, it won't work. So I'm not sure how much you get out of that. Uh, anyway, so the discussion of theoretical and practical ways to make use of real-world data to gain evidence of effectiveness, that is, is that real-world evidence? Maybe. In randomized trials, we'll cover a huge range of issues, including data quality, clinical relevance, practicality, and much, much more. And I, and I'm sure everyone else, is looking forward to this exciting program. Thanks. Sit up here. Sit up here. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Bob. That was uh, Bob uh, Temple, Deputy Director for Clinical Science of the Office of New Drugs, Cedar FDA. And I'll also, uh, in the meantime, you know, this humidity has been bothering our sign as well. Um, uh, introduce Leslie Curtis, Chair and Professor of the Department of Population Health Sciences and Interim Executive Director at the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Leslie? Great, thank you, thank you, Greg. And it's great to be here, uh, not just this morning, but for the next uh, day and a half. I think this is gonna be a terrific, terrific workshop. 
And what I wanted to do this morning is just provide the group with some of the experience that we've actually had in the real world in the setting of randomized trials uh, that, that have all leveraged um, real world data or in, in one case uh, using real world data alongside a clinical trial. So I want to start by just touching briefly on the evidence base that I'm drawing from for my uh, sort of lessons learned or general experiences that I'll talk about. The first is the NIH Collaboratory, which some of you may be familiar with, an NIH-funded um, network uh, collaboratory um, that really is was developed, was created um, almost a decade ago to strengthen our capacity to do um, embedded clinical trials embedded in healthcare delivery systems, embedded pragmatic clinical trials, and really engage healthcare delivery organizations as partners. Um, importantly, the collaboratory also um, really tasked the coordinating center, of which I am one of the, the PIs along with Adrian Hernandez and Kevin Weinfurt, tasked us with creating generalizable knowledge about how how to do embedded pragmatic clinical trials. So currently there are about 15 demonstration projects, all randomized trials. They all have a one-year planning phase and then an implementation phase. So just to give you a sense, these trials that are, that are ongoing um, really reflect a variety of interventions and severity of participants. So just to anchor you at the, at the upper left and lower right corners, the HILO trial is, a, is one of our newest demonstration projects looking at whether less stringent control of serum phosphate um, yields non-inferior um, all-cause hospitalization rates in an ESRD population. And there at the lower right hand of this, and these are all of the 15 trials that are going on, in the lower right hand, the GGC4H trial, not not a catchy acronym, I'm afraid, but the GGC4H trial is looking at whether an educational intervention, a curriculum aimed at the parents of early adolescents is associated with lower health care utilization and lower behavioral health um, challenges, outcomes for those adolescents in subsequent years. So quite a range of, of trials here. Um, the other uh, evidence base that I draw from is the work that we are doing um, alongside a now completed cardiovascular outcomes trial, the Harmony Outcomes Trial, um, which was an event-driven um, trial looking at the effect of albiglutide on major cardiovascular events. Um, we, uh, colleagues of mine and I at the at Duke had a, um, an ancillary study alongside that trial, partially funded by FDA in addition to funding from the sponsor GSK, to really look carefully at real world data in comparison to the data generated and collected as part of the traditional trial. And then the final, uh, the final source of evidence for my uh, experiences, lessons learned, comes from the ADAPTABLE trial, which um, I suspect many of you will be familiar with, a trial um, through the PCORnet network uh, looking at high-dose versus low-dose aspirin in, uh, w with respect to uh, uh, secondary prevention of cardiovascular events. Um, you know, we're, we're especially excited that just a couple of weeks ago, we, we enrolled our 15,000th um, participant, which was a, a, uh, what we were heading for, and we have, we have a few more since then. So very, very exciting there. Um, so as I reflected back on this evidence base and what we've learned as we have done um, real-world evidence development in the context of the real world of healthcare delivery, I just have a few sort of summary um, experiences that I'd, that I'd want to share with you and the lessons that we've learned. Um, the first and probably the most sobering one that I think we'll want to really keep in mind throughout the discussion today and tomorrow is that change is an absolute constant in the real world settings in which we're aiming to do these studies. So the healthcare systems, as we know, they're complex, they constantly change, they are not alike. Um, and that has implications for 
everything from the way we design the trial to how we recruit to the intervention itself. Um, certainly through the collaboratory, we've seen how often leadership, providers, staff turn over, and that really has implications, again, to the extent that your intervention relies on, on continuity at that level. Um, Importantly, and, and Bob talked a lot about real world data, importantly the underlying data and IT systems in these healthcare delivery systems are not static. And they change and often change in response to needs on the healthcare delivery side or needs on the reimbursement side. So again, making sure that we have an ability to track those changes, to monitor those, and to know how those changes might impact the, the research, the, the evidence that we're trying to generate is, is really important. Um, you know, it, it can even be difficult, and we found this in the collaboratory, to maintain a stable control arm in the real world. Um, initiatives, competing initiatives arise. This has been a real issue for one of our trials that was um, focused, is focused on pain management. And um, as we all know, that has become a huge issue. The opioid crisis has brought that to the fore. So imagine doing a, a multi-year trial when that comes, it comes up and all of the changes that go on in healthcare delivery systems to address that, that public health crisis. Um, and it can be the case that changes in usual care may be unethical to control. So imagine, for example, when a new guideline comes out and um, really resets what standard practice should be and what happens when that comes out in the middle of the, of the trial. So these are the kinds of considerations that we, I would say, from the work that we've done have, have been very accustomed to, to staying attuned to. Um, really important for us to all recognize that, that the work that we're talking about and the work that we'll be talking about over the next day and a half, it really requires a team and a team of multidisciplinary experts. Certainly engagement of clinicians, engagement of health system leadership is critical when we are doing work that is embedded in care delivery, embedded in care delivery systems. Um, and those partnerships are not just partnerships with the leadership or the top tier, if you will, of those organizations, but it's really required at all levels. And in fact, I think many of our colleagues who do these trials would argue having that frontline support for the work that you're doing may be most important. And that can be especially, uh, that, that can be especially time consuming, also rewarding, but that's a, a, lot, of, a lot of engagement, if you will. Um, and that can, re that can result in the need for more investment in training and, and certainly retraining as there is turnover. Certainly from Adaptable, we have, we have learned, um, I think, the very, um, very exciting lesson about how valuable participant engagement is. And those partici participant, in, um, participant perspectives can really uniquely inform the way we approach design, recruitment, and implementation. Um, the, the adapters, the, the engaged group of participants in, in, the adapt, in the adaptable trial have really had um, considerable impact at every stage of that, of that trial. And um, as I know we'll, we'll hear and talk about again uh, later today, really engaging our colleagues on in those ethical and regulatory systems is very important as well. There, there are critical issues that arise throughout the trial and certainly in the design phase that really warrant discussion early on. Um, certainly for the collaboratory, we have those, those ethics um, reviews, ethics consult, and to, in some cases regulatory discussions very early on so that we're all aligned and, and know that the systems are ready for the trials that we're doing. And then it probably goes without saying, but I will say it anyway, that when we use existing data, when we rely on existing data and systems, we know why we're doing it, and there we believe that there are some real advantages to that, and Bob spoke to some of those, but they will almost certainly add complexity to the work that we're doing. Um, it's not just that those systems change, and we have to be aware of those changes when we're using the data generated by those systems, but 
integrating study data elements that we may need into existing workflows, into existing electronic health record systems, that actually has implications for workflow, has implications for compliance, and those can be more challenging to do than we might think. Again, um, certainly worth it in many circumstances, but, but we shouldn't be uh, naive about the impact. Um, oftentimes when we talk about using real world data, we recognize that outcomes may be incomplete and we often talk about the ability to link um, data to create that full outcomes perspective. Um, I would say in our experience, the technical aspects associated with linking data are relatively straightforward. The governance around that tends not to be straightforward. So again, to the extent that complete outcomes requires data linkage um, and, and more, make sure we're, we're clear about those governance issues going into it. And um, finally, and a, a topic that we'll dive into, I believe, a little bit later today, um, the data that we need may not be available in a timely manner, and that latency can vary considerably by site. Um, moreover, the real-world data that we get may not yet be curated for our uses. So again, that adds to, to some of the delay as well. Um, you know, just sort of pulling all of this together then as we think about the agenda and our time together, I think let's just keep in mind maybe three high level points and come back to these and, and as, as um, Jacqueline and Bob said, as we dive into the weeds and not just talk about the, the trees in the forest, um, this dynamic environment that we're talking about, that we're operating in, the real world, it has real consequences for the design, implementation, and monitoring of trials. Um, engagement is absolutely essential, and it really can both mitigate risk and increase the, the likelihood of success, which is what we want. Um, and, and finally, the, the last point that I made, that the reliance on real-world data has real benefits, we believe, um, but it does introduce complexity, and we need to be mindful of that. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Leslie and, and Bob. So um, we are going to take a few minutes to, uh, for audience Q and A. So if any of you have uh, questions or comments based on what uh, Bob or Leslie said, please um, feel free to join us. We have uh, we have microphones there and microphones there, uh, and I'll ask you to state your name and organization. Adrian. Uh, Adrian Hernandez uh, from Duke. And <laughs> so, Bob, I'm, I'm glad you gave a very optimistic view of uh, randomized trials and, and real-world evidence. Um, I guess a, a few comments uh, for you to react to. Um, you know, one is, you know, um, every day we're losing clinicians in terms of research. And in part, it's because of the burden that they have to deliver in terms of clinical care delivering electronic health records but also the burden administratively for filling out all the different forms, et cetera, for every study. So like the notion of a site investigator um, continuing on in this fashion is actually really problematic, especially when healthcare is actually going towards teams of people caring for patients or actually caring for populations um, uh, outside of the health system remotely. So, so all the things you talked about in terms of compliance makes us really worried in terms of how is that going to fit in to uh, clinical investigators' everyday life. So that's one comment for you to consider. Uh, the, the second thing is that in the U.S. we've seen uh, a significant drop off in terms of participation in research. You know, at best, most centers have 2% of participation for those who are eligible, yet we have to translate that evidence to the other 98%, and there are vast differences there. And so every time we add something else for someone to come in to do to make sure that they are fully compliant with a protocol, while we think that's actually um, uh, adding quality, it may actually limit the generalizability in how we operationalize this. So uh, clinician engagement and how can we streamline things in the real world? Well, obviously, I don't know the answer to those things. That's one of the things that uh, is going to be looked at. Um, it raises the question of who's an investigator. I'm, 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 uh, 
uh, was looking back at the Gissy trial, okay? What they did was, if you came into one of the clinics that was part of the study, you either were randomized streptokinase or placebo. I don't even know who the investigator was there, and you can't tell from reading it. Was it was the investigator the whole clinic? It couldn't have been one person because one person isn't there 24-7. Um, I don't know how they did it, but somehow the, the unit or something functioned as the investigator. Within certain systems in the U.S., I can imagine similar behavior, VA notably, where you know everybody's an employee, maybe they could all be investigators for the purpose of study. But I think that's one of the main questions that you have to answer. How do you be sure that the treatment is given in a reasonable way? Who's responsible? Who's looking? And I, I think that's one of the questions that has to be uh, has to be answered here. Um, if, if you can simplify it enough so that everybody in the unit is, is a de facto investigator, and I'm not sure technically how you do that or what they have to sign and stuff, um, maybe you can do certain kinds of trials that would otherwise be extremely difficult. Uh, I think that's one of the things we, uh, we have to learn. Uh, it's also obvious that if you don't have reasonably good compliance with the system, you're gonna not be able to show anything. Well, one, of the, one of the points it seems to me is, as we're talking is, one question is does the drug work? And you need a trial that's reasonably rigorous to do that. A completely different question is what is compliance like in the real world? Will people bother to do this? That's a very important question, um, but it's a different question. I mean, one of my major obsessions is that uh, current figures are that something like 50% of people put on antihypertensives aren't on them at the end of a year. How to change that is an unbelievably important question. It's not whether the drug works or not, it's a different question. But knowing how to intervene in the system to get people to stay on their lipid-lowering drugs and their, and their antihypertensives is probably the most important single health care problem we have. Um, and it needs to be studied, and the only way to study it probably is in a real-world environment. So. That's a somewhat different question from does the drug work, but very important and very, and very interesting. And that, that's, what, uh, that's what the adaptable one is doing. It's how to, get how to get the large number of people who have AF and aren't being treated right into treatment. Um, that's not whether NOACs work, it's whether you can get people to use them. So they are, you gotta keep the different questions in mind. And real world data for, for, the, for the compliance issues like that makes total sense. I don't know if that quite answers your question. Well, it gives me a little hope because just thinking about adaptable, you know, there are 15,000 participants, 40 sites. So the, the top enrolling sites, uh, the so-called investigator enrolled over 1,000 and 2,000 participants. It actually was the system that did it. Uh, on a name, and so those are the models that we could move towards. Uh, Sean? Yeah, hi, uh, Sean Tunis with Center for Medical Technology Policy and Rubik's Health. Um, always nice to tangle with Bob again, but I had a question for uh, Leslie. Um, uh, so I'm just curious, so you know, you laid out a, quite a number of learnings and challenges. I'm, I'm curious, is there anything that you see sort of emerging technologically or organizationally or policy-wise that, you know, holds promise for making any of these things, you know, easier going forward? And what are some specific things that look like, you know, they're coming together that might enhance the ability to do the collaborative type work more effectively in the future? Yeah, no, it, it, great, great question. I see, a, I, I see a lot of promise on the, on the horizon and even in the, in the near term. Actually, the word that I would go back to, I think, is a word that, that Bob used, which is hybrid, right? So making sure that we leverage, whether it is, whether it is technologies, digital, plat there's so, digital platforms, there's so many different opportunities we have. And I think the question for us all is not to do the thing that is use the, use the thing that is most um, interesting, sexy, new, but to make sure that we're choosing from the toolbox those tools that help us answer the question in the best way that we can. So I think as we move forward, maybe the, the <coughs> biggest learning, maybe I should have started with this, is that we'll, hybrid will be the way that we continue to evolve this, where we pull 
the the best from from what is and not you know try to go too far in any one direction. Uh, Jesse. Yeah. Thanks, Jesse Berlin from Johnson and Johnson. So e easy, pra pragmatic question, not philosophical. Um, for impact AF and for adaptable, um, their cardiovascular outcomes. How are they being assessed, determined, ascertained? I'll, I'll start with adaptable. Um, we're using a variety of, of sources on the to, to identify cardiovascular events. Um, we use data from the health system, so that's reliance on the real world data, the electronic health record data that are in a common format. Um, we use that. We have a patient portal, so patient reports events that we then go and look for evidence from data that we have. We're, re we're pulling in Medicare claims data as well for those events and really drawing in other, those kinds of sources that we can. On a subset, we are doing an adjudication, a validation of those, those events. Can, can I ask, is adaptable design is a non-inferiority study? What, how's it done? Um, it's, a, it's an effectiveness study. I mean, it's looking at the, it's a comparison of high dose versus low dose. I don't, I actually don't remember. I don't think it's, it's not powered as non-inferior. I'm looking at our, one of our PIs there. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so it detects a, a difference between the two doses of aspirin. So. Yeah. so suppose you don't see a difference. How will you know what that means? Well, if uh, we don't see a difference? Yeah. You got to know what the effect size would have been. I mean, this is non-inferiority design. It's what's well, it's in a, a two comparisons. So it's, yeah, it's not it's so like in terms of non-inferiority design, it's not a classic non-inferiority design. It's actually detecting power to detect a uh, fifteen to twenty percent difference between the two doses. Need, needs could could use more discussion anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, so and what about for impact AF? The, the question has, really has to do with uh, whether there's adjudication, because I, I know if we tried to do something, we'd be asked to adjudicate. So. Right. So we're not doing, uh, there's a validation piece yeah, of it, yeah. but we're not adjudicating events okay. in, in I'll, that. I'll be back example. later this morning. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So we are running out of time uh, for the session, so we'll go, we'll go to these last two uh, quick questions, and uh, over to you. Hi, uh, my name is Mark and Luke. I'm uh, the Director of Therapeutic Performance in the Office of Generic Drugs. Uh, we're specifically interested in a generic drug adaptation and uh, when a generic drug comes on the market, there's greater accessibility to a product potentially and how that changes prescribing uh, habits and as well as uh, patient outcomes of using that, uh, that specific drug. Does it change the patient population of use for, for that drug as a generic comes on the market? Um, and there, there are lots of questions. And Bob, I want to thank you for recently serving on the uh, generic drug research panel that we had recently, a pub, another public meeting. So I know you're, you're very interested in this as well. Uh, the, the context of drug accessibility and drug pricing as, as, drugs, uh, as, the, as drugs become more difficult to access as prices go up, uh, and then uh, the uh, curve as they become more accessible as, uh, as the generic comes onto market. Uh, what kind of tools uh, uh, does real-world evidence allow us to use in that context? I know we, we have a couple of ongoing studies that we're looking at generic drug adaptation, mm -hmm. but I'm really interested in partnering with others who might have similar interests. And so please come and reach out, um, and um, I'm happy to work with anybody who might have a similar interest in this, in this arena. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the comment. Uh, okay, last question. Yeah. Magnus Peterson, uh, cardiologist at AstraZeneca. So I will leave my questions uh, for sake of time, but just say shortly that I'm very grateful that the FDA mm -hmm. and Duke brings up this very important discussion. And one thought that I think we should consider is, given that perhaps 2% of US physicians have time for clinical research, we see similar numbers in Scandinavia and in other regions. How applicable are RCT results for their populations? TASTE is an example where of, uh, all patients with ACS in Scandinavia, 70% were randomized in the trial. So taking pieces from those studies, 
in a modular approach, I think could greatly enhance the representativeness of the studies we are performing. And it's very clear that the more data we collect directly by CRFs from investigators, the more burdensome it gets for science. So the more data we could introduce by using screening ETR systems or other data sources would lower that burden and hopefully increase interest in clinical research. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, and thanks to Leslie and Bob for this, uh, these great presentations. Um, okay. We're going to um, roll right into our next session. We'll, we'll be discussing the selection of appropriate interventions and study designs for randomized trials embedded into clinical settings. We'll have a couple of opening presentation that, presentations that will provide some examples of key issues specifically with uh, uh, intervention selection that need to be considered up front uh, within the study design. These uh, presentations will be followed by a few uh, reactions and comments from uh, panelists. Um, I would like to note that uh, one of our panelists, Lou Fiore, unfortunately was un unable to make it today due to a um, family emergency, um, but we do have uh, uh, spe uh, also speakers joining us remotely um, as they were unable to travel as well. Um, so um, as we get started, I'll ask the, um, the you know, any of the pre presenters or panelists in the room to um, please join me up on the stage. Thank you. Um, our first presentation will be dialing in. Uh, Martin Landry is Deputy Director of Big Data Institute and Director of Health Data Research at um, UK Oxford. Following Martin's presentation, uh, Elaine uh, Irving joining us here on the stage is Senior Director and Head of Real World Study Delivery at uh, GlaxoSmithKline. After those opening presentations, we'll turn to um, uh, Iris uh, Getz, uh, who's dialing in as a medical epidemiologist, global health outcomes at Eli Lilly and Company, and then, um, and then also uh, uh, a panelist, uh, Stephen Piantadasi, uh, Associate Senior Biostatistician, D Division of Surgical Oncology at, the, um, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So with that, uh, Martin, if you're, if you're on the line, uh, um, let us know and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. And this is going to be difficult because there's a huge amount of echo. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm sorry not to be there in person, but it's my daughter's uh, graduation tomorrow. She'll be the third generation of people to graduate from Birmingham, uh, UK, and my family, so I'm looking forward to that. My background, as many of you will know, is really in clinical trials, but over the last uh, five or so, or so years, I've been increasingly involved in the data world. Uh, and I think what I want to uh, illustrate in the talk over the next 10 or 15 minutes is how those two worlds to come together. So if we can go to slide two. Uh, clearly what we're aiming to do is to provide a robust assessment of health interventions. I think sometimes in, uh, in, in considering this in trials, uh, and in particular uh, about our sort of uh, framework, and that starts with a recognition that most of the treatments we have, or that most of the treatments we will have, are not stunningly good. In fact, they have at best moderate effects. And that's no surprise because diseases of uh, middle and late age uh, have developed over many decades, have multiple causes, and short-term treatment for, let's say, five years on only one pathway is not likely to uh, have a substantial impact. And our challenge is distinguishing those moderate effects, which in turn out to be incredibly useful, whether used in combination or in very large numbers of people, distinguishing those moderate effects from no effect at all. And really to do that, we require both randomization uh, to avoid bias uh, and uh, scale to avoid the play of chance. Next, uh, next slide. This is all in the context of, of course, clinical trials are in something of a crisis. 
Uh, and I realised that it's um, not always uh, uh, considered polite to talk about money so early in the morning. Uh, but I think we do need to, because I think it's a major driver of scientific constraint. And when one considers that recent trials, for example, CCSK9 inhibitors in cardiovascular disease uh, are said to have cost in excess of $1 billion, uh, that uh, commercial research organizations say that over 85% of commercial trials fail to recruit on time and target, there's really a temptation to abandon randomization for the, the lure of observational methods. In other words, to do the wrong experiments because it's easier rather than to do the right experiment in a way that is more feasible. And this is really distorting our treatment development priorities. Early decisions about uh, which treatments to take forward, moving away from preventive and long-term treatments for common disease, and instead focus on very expensive, important, but drugs for uh, rare conditions. And it seems to me, next slide, that uh, we have an opportunity, a huge opportunity just now. And the challenge is how do we take advantage of all those technological advances in healthcare, in engineering, in communications to facilitate those randomized trials and get good assessments of efficacy and safety. Rather than being harder than ever before, more expensive than ever before, actually randomized trials really should be easier than ever before. Data collection and communication have never been easier than they are at the moment. Next slide. And so I think it's useful to think of the opportunities in four particular areas. <laughs> One is around efficient recruitment, and I'm going to come back to that. The second is around assessment of safety and efficacy, and I'm going to come back to that. And I'm not going to touch particularly on the last two, which are around thinking about study quality. That certainly starts with protocol design, and I, I agree with some of the earlier comments that actually one has to rethink and go back to basics when it comes back to protocol design. Until it considers the, is the issues of software engineering and statistical monitoring, tools that we didn't have 20 years ago, let alone 40 or 50 years ago when those beautiful ISIS and DC studies were done. And finally, there are huge opportunities to enhance uh, engagement, not only for collecting information, if you like, for our benefit, but actually for making sure there's proper information sharing, that consensus is an ongoing basis, and that one can actually communicate emerging information about safety or progress of the trial all the way through the trial and well beyond. To give you just one example of that, in our last trial, because we had held centrally the names and addresses of the 7,000 surviving participants, we were able to mail the results direct to those 7,000 participants and all their doctors within one week of trial completion and the announcement of the results. So that's the sort of opportunity we have to modern communications. If only we dro drop some of our preconceptions about some of the uh, barriers. Next slide. If we think about uh, the recruitment pathway specifically, the line in the middle, the, square, the circles at either end and the squares in the middle, uh, take us through a typical journey thinking of a research question, think hard about that research question, about protocol design, feasibility, finding the right patients, inviting them, perhaps pre-screening them and consenting them. And all of those things, of course, could be done on paper and uh, could be done manually and typically are. But actually, there are opportunities highlighted in, the, in uh, where the arrows are uh, to uh, really uh, uh, streamline this process and get huge value from the tools that are available to us. And I want to just give one example of that and focus in on the feasibility piece. Because clearly, when one's planning a trial, the very first question really should be, and given I'm interested in, in this research question, do these patients really exist? And are, and are they in sufficient numbers, and where are they? And they sound like simple questions, but it's remarkable how often they're ignored and how often people's trials fail because they've ignored them. So we get to the next slide. This is an example from an ongoing phase three pivotal trial of Inclisiran versus placebo, which is aiming to recruit 15,000 people, uh, of whom 12,000 will be recruited in the UK with the remaining 3,000 in the US. Everything on this slide is in the public domain. Uh, this is a trial 
uh, that will involve people who've had a prior uh, myocardial infarction, stroke or peripheral vascular disease. And using the English version of Medicare data, of claims data, in this case, simply using diagnostic codes and procedural codes, one's able to convert those simple eligibility criteria into a set of diagnostic criteria. Now, those eligibility criteria are simple, not by chance, but because we spent the time stripping away the four pages of detailed eligibility criteria that uh, were previously considered to be best or standard uh, uh, practice. Identifying patients who are highly likely to get the events, cardiovascular events, we're trying to uh, uh, prevent with this new treatment. So taking those codes and providing them to the national data system, uh, uh, the equivalent of the NHS's uh, All England IT Support Department, uh, we, are, we are able within a matter of uh, days to come up with the uh, information on the next slide. And on the left-hand side, you can see uh, that uh, the top uh, 26 hospitals each had over 20,000 patients with cardiovascular disease, totaling about half a million patients in total. So cardiovascular disease is not a rare disease. We all know that. Why do we approach the treatment as if it's going to be uh, a, a rare uh, ma a disease problem and in a manual way? Let's think big, let's aim big, big and let's use the efficiency of the data. And on the right-hand side, in case you can't recognize it, it's a map of at least part of the UK, uh, this is all English data. The dots represent hospitals. The bigger the dots, the, more the, the greater the number of patients. And there's a little bit of information overlaid on that uh, based on our prior experience with those sites or other uh, considerations about whether they were going to proceed. So you can see within a matter of days, we were able to identify uh, hundreds of thousands of potentially eligible patients, identify where in the country they were and how they, and how they could be recruited. And what we're able to do, in fact, is to turn that information, which at this stage is anonymous information, they're simply counts, we're actually able to convert that information into real names and real addresses of real people, and then invite them to join the study. Now, on my next slide, I, I haven't got data uh, to show you, unfortunately, from the Ryan 4 trials. So I've had to go back to a previous study that we've been involved in, uh, where we ran a very similar process. This is UK Biobank which, of course, was an observational cohort study of half a million people. Uh, but the process was exactly the same as I've just shown you. We wrote to 9 million people, middle-aged people in the, in the UK, uh, generated from the NHS register. Half a million of them said yes and volunteered to attend 22 centres in three and a half years. And you, you can see that using these methods can easily recruit very large numbers of patients with, co with common conditions, or indeed, actually, with rare or medium rare conditions, hundreds of thousand people with inflammatory bowel disease, tens of thousand people with ankylosing spondylitis or Parkinson's disease in the UK, which, as you might recognize, is a little smaller than the US. I want to turn from that, which is the beginning of the study, which as I hope as I've illustrated, means that we need to think about scale as our friend, not as our enemy. Uh, and now think about uh, what, what we can do in terms of uh, follow-up. And there's key uh, methodological considerations here. And one of them is that the enemy of high-quality uh, randomized evidence is loss to follow-up, and particularly differential loss to follow-up. And one of the beauties is that actually we, using routine data, one can get efficient, uh, very um, large-scale, real-world information captured in a, uh, uh, a relatively cheap and relatively potentially non-touch uh, 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 approach. It can be comprehensive and it can be durable, providing prolonged information on efficacy and safety, both during the trial and beyond the trial. I think it was Leslie who already highlighted some of the weaknesses. Uh, they're not technical. The technology is easy. Uh, the, the weaknesses are around accessibility uh, of, the, of, of the records, about the information governance and data security challenges. There's a political with a small p and not the technical considerations. There's some issues around accuracy. Not all events are well coded. For example, some events don't go into hospitals so they'll never appear. Uh, and there is a, an issue around confidence. Not all, all audiences and not all regulators are convinced that these are sufficiently robust 
for purpose. And the rest of my talk is really focused on trying to consider some of those weaknesses and persuade you that there's good theoretical and uh, 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 practical uh, evidence that, in fact, this information is robust. Next slide. So turning to the theory, let's imagine we do a trial of 10,000 people versus 10,000 people, active versus control, and that the real picture, the true picture, is 800 events versus 1,000 events, a risk reduction of 22% and a highly significant p-value, a, a success in anybody's books, uh, uh, which changed practice, which changed regulatory li licenses, uh, which changed careers for those who were uh, involved in the study. Let's secondly imagine that actually uh, we could actually get at the truth, uh, and this is not just some abstract concept. Next slide. Let's imagine also now that, I, that the reality is that some of the events we collect are not really those events we were, were interested in. So, for example, we, we included a little bit of uh, angina in amongst the, the events we had hoped to be recording as myocardial infarction, or a little bit of transit ischemic attack amongst events where we really wanted stroke. Well, let's imagine that that gets as bad as 20% of the information we capture. We capture an extra 20% that is not true events. They're, of course, evenly distributed across the two treatment arms because the treatment doesn't affect them. The risk ratio remains basically unchanged. The p-value remains un unchanged. And the in implications for practice uh, remain unchanged. Next slide. Conversely, let's imagine that we miss some events. In an unbiased fashion, this is not in one arm or the other because we've got comprehensive collection of data, but we just happen to miss some events, for example, because not all events get into hospital. And here you can see that if you were to lose, say, 20% of events, this time unevenly distributed, because even the ones you don't know about were also affected by treatment, you again have little impact on the risk reduction, little imp impact on the statistical, clinical or regulatory significance. I want to use that model to really emphasize that in randomized trials at scale, the data needs to be adequate but not perfect. Chasing around after individual precision of individual uh, uh, points in the search of some mystery truth is actually a futile exercise uh, and, uh, and simply not necessary. So that's the theoretical. Let's turn to the practical. Next slide. This addresses the issue about adjudication. This is, this is uh, uh, information from the REVEAL trial, which I ran. This is uh, uh, 30,000 patients randomized to cholesterol lowering or not. Uh, you can see that we collected 159,000 pages of documentation um, on 16,000 uh, events. They were adjudicated by three adjudicators, 17 assistants over three years. And this, by the way, is the streamlined way of doing adjudication. Uh, you just cost. Uh, and the results before we started that process are what's shown. And if we go to the next slide, the results after we finish that uh, detailed adjudication are as shown. And if it's possible to go back and forth between those two slides, you'll see that there is frankly no significant difference. And I mean in this instance, either significant statistically, clinically, or from a regulatory or other, other perspective. Adjudication uh, has, not, has not helped us it simply cost us money and it potentially given us to do a smaller study and potentially miss valuable information on overall efficacy or particularly on safety. Now this is not one unique example. If we go to the very next slide, uh, this is a, a meta-analysis, not mine. This is the Cochrane meta-analysis of the effect of adjudication on the estimate of treatment effect. And all you need to look at is the bottom line, is the bottom uh, dot which you can see is bang on the uh, null effect line. In all of those studies, adjudication made no effect, at all, no impact at all. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying never adjudicate. There are clearly times when you want to distinguish uh, between things that are uh, going to be affected in opposite directions. For example, hemorrhagic versus ischemic stroke in a, in a study of warfarin. Uh, but one needs to be very targeted about when that's the case. Now, that was based on what happens if you do an ordinary study, a sort of standard trial study. What I wanted to look at now is what happens if you do a trial in the, using real-world data. And so if we go to the next slide, which is the Ascend study of uh, aspirin versus placebo and fish oils at a particular dose versus placebo, 
You can see the results in black at the sort of upper lines on each of these are uh, the uh, original trial results. This, by the way, was an incredibly streamlined trial in itself, but the adjudication processes uh, were much as I've just described and much as you'd expect, and those are the full results. In the sort of grayer uh, lines um, just below are actually what happens if you switch out all those adjudicated data and ignore them completely and simply use the uh, English equivalent of Medicare data. And essentially, uh, there is no difference. There's a very minor difference on, uh, uh, on uh, transit ischemic attack, which is one of the components, uh, and that's because transit ischemic attack doesn't get admitted to hospital, uh, re-emphasizing one of my earlier points. But the point is that one can get robust information simply by using randomization in this level of follow-up. Next slide. And one doesn't have to limit oneself to just within the, the within trial period. This is now the 20-year follow-up of the Roscoff study with uh, Prada statin versus placebo. It's actually quite a small study in, 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 initially, and you can see uh, that there, you can uh, uh, identify the prolonged benefits, and not on this slide, but the prolonged safety or, of Prada statin in this group of patients. And there was a lot of work done to make sure uh, that we understood, or that those who did the study understood, um, if you like, the false positive and false negative rates on individual data points. But individual data points don't matter in this context. We're not trying to diagnose myocardial infarction in individual patients. It's not about diagnostic accuracy. It's about our robustness of the treatment effects. And you can see this both during the trial and many years later. And that really changes the uh, clinical interpretation and the cost-effectiveness interpretation uh, of these sorts of results. Next slide. And this is, uh, I think, pretty much my final slide um, prior to summing up. This is to take um, a different setting. Everything I've shown you so far, you may say, well, that's wonderful for large-scale cardiovascular trials, where there's oodles of patients. Uh, but that's a, 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 an English word for lots of patients. Uh, there's oodles of patients, uh, and they've got chronic disease, and that's all straightforward. But what about something more challenging? This is a study of 800 patients with kidney transplantation. It was a, 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 a study that was of two different immunosuppressive uh, strategies at the time someone was transplanted, which of course is essentially an emergency acute or acute event, um, usually driven by the availability of the organ, uh, and uh, then of a chronic immunosuppression. And all the data collection was driven by uh, routine information. Routine information from hospitalization from our equivalents of Medicare. Routine information from the renal registry. Uh, it's effectively uh, the equivalent of uh, the United States Renal Data Systems database. Uh, so that you can't have a, a go on to dialysis in the UK without appearing in that registry. And information from the NHS blood and transplant register. And they're the people who actually manage the availability of organs and transplantation across the, across the UK. And for just using information from those, we were able to identify no significant improvement in kidney function where one was expecting one, greater risk of transplant rejection, which went against uh, prediction, and greater risk of serious infection, which nobody had spotted before. Just using routine data in what is really quite a uh, uh, rareish uh, uh, condition, this was half the patients transplanted in half the centers in the country during the period of enrollment of about two years. So we can get really robust information, even in the context of relatively rare conditions. So final slide, it really seems to me we have to reinvent our concept of randomized trials uh, for the 21st century. And of course, we're well into that 21st century and only just waking up to it. We use the data, the technology to drive the feasibility. We have to stick to the principles of randomized trials and we have to then uh, modify our approaches to regulation and, go and governance to ensure that they deliver the benefits for patient care and public health. That is, after all, what we're all in it for. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thanks, Martin. That was a terrific presentation. We could hear you very well. And uh, congratulations on the graduation and your family. Uh, we'll turn things over to Elaine Irving, Senior Director, um, Head of Real World Study Delivery at GlaxoSmithKline. That's the one. Okay. Um, 
so thank you for the opportunity to uh, join the workshop today. Um, what I'd just like to do is spend a few minutes um, to give you a flavour of when, as a sponsor, we start to consider, um, despite the, the challenges and the complexities that Leslie's already described, we really think there's a, a value and a place for randomised controlled trials in a, in a routine care setting. Um, and using um, an ongoing study as, a, as an example, um, just highlight the importance of really being clear on what the research question is you're trying to answer with that trial and keep focused on that as you go through the complexity and the tough decisions you need to make um, when you're actually designing um, a trial like this. And again, to Leslie's point, not get carried away with, with any new um, fancy technology, but rather leverage that um, where it's appropriate to enhance the trial. I'll then just finish um, really briefly touching on a European initiative that I lead um, called the Get Real Initiative, which is, uh, which is focused on driving the uptake of real-world evidence into decision-making. And my colleague, Eris Goetz, um, will follow uh, with some more detail on the particular task force within that project, which is very much focused in this space of uh, randomised control trials. So as, as we um, I progress toward, or, or once the medicine has been licensed and, and it gets out into the, uh, the routine care setting, there's a number of different factors that we're all aware of that can very much influence how um, that medicine behaves, um, whether that be uh, differences in, in the benefit perceived by patients or uh, indeed in the safety. And so at, at the point that we're trying, starting to approach um, at the, the point of registration, we're starting to think ahead about what are the gaps in our knowledge about how the, the medicine, what are the factors that will really impact um, our medicine as, we, as it enters into the, the routine care setting. And um, if we start to think about the population, for example, that have been used in, in the routine, um, in the randomised controlled trials, as we've already heard, um, due to the stringent inclusion exclusion criteria, very often the, the patient population included in those trials doesn't fully represent the patient population that will eventually receive our medication. The way the intervention perhaps has been given in the trial, again, due to changes in guidelines or, or existing guidelines, may not be, uh, or due to blinding in the trial, may not be the way that the, the intervention is used ultimately in the, in the routine care setting. So it's important for us to work through those, those um, aspects and, and understand the questions that our stakeholders might have. And by stakeholders, I mean regulators who may need uh, further safety information. Um, it may be health technology assessors that may need to be really struggling with trying to identify you know, the value of the new medicine versus what's already existing. Um, or it may be the physician faced with a patient that um, has many comorbidities um, that would have been excluded from a, a randomized controlled trial. And while a lot of these questions traditionally have been answered using um, retrospective studies, for example, or observational studies, we think there's a real opportunity for randomized controlled trials in the routine care setting at this, at this stage um, to provide data um, that's as scientifically robust as we can um, and also gives us the opportunity to bring that um, data collection much earlier in the, the overall development um, journey of the medicine. So if we turn to Intrepid, um, this is, uh, so Trelogy is a once daily um, triple uh, therapy that has just recently been um, approved for the use in uh, patients with moderate to severe COPD that are uncontrolled by dual therapy. And if, if you think to what I've just said um, about uh, the patient population, for example, with CO, in, in COPD, um, it's it's well documented that probably only approximately of 7% of patients that actually suffer with COPD um, would be eligible to be included in clinical trials. So we've got to be aware that when we enter into the, the routine care setting, the, the patient population that's eventually going to receive this medicine is much broader than that that we would have seen in the clinical trials. Um, another major piece here really is around the intervention. When you think about a double-blind a randomized clinical trial with a, a therapy like Trelogy, where it's a once daily, um, once daily administration, single inhaler therapy, um, your comparisons are multiple inhalers. 
So any patient involved in a clinical trial for trilogy, even though they may have been randomized to the trilogy arm, will have had to utilize as well the dummy um, uh, inhalers throughout that study. So any benefit that we think a patient may have through the use of being able to use a single inhaler in a day, we can't really test that in the randomized control setting. And we know that that's a crucial factor in the control of, of um, exacerbations in, in COPD. So it, it seemed very sensible to go ahead and design a, a, a randomized control trial in the routine care setting to test some of these aspects. And that sounds very easy when you say it. And then you start to get into the details, well, how do, how do we do that? And I'm glad that Leslie and, and others have touched on the use of um, real world data to uh, look at uh, feasibility, um, because that, that is also something we built into this trial, but we haven't actually, I haven't uh, gone through it here in detail. Um, but to help identify the patients, to really understand what your patient population is, what their, um, what their um, exacerbation history is. And actually that helped us really narrow down what the countries that we, we needed to, um, to engage to, to run the study in. So once we'd identified those countries through using the, re the real world data, um, we, we then um, did some research around, well, okay, we want to look at effectiveness, but what does effectiveness mean to the stakeholders that will be using the data? So we did some research across um, some of the um, health technology agencies, um, patients, physicians across the different countries to really understand what endpoints they would want to see in a, in a trial like this. And it became very clear that there's no one size fits all. Everybody wants something slightly different. <laughs> so again, as a sponsor, how do you balance that? How do you, how do you um, weigh up all the, the, the opinions of all the different stakeholders that are going to use this data? Um, we did start to narrow it down at that stage that it was clear exacerbations as not, not you know, unexpectedly were, were a key endpoint. Um, they drive healthcare utilization, so that, that um, and obviously from a um, clinical perspective, the key factor in patient care. Um, but also um, more towards the, um, the, the patient reported outcome measures were becoming, are obviously becoming much more um, uh, favored and, and are included now in treatment guidelines, certainly for the, for the treatment of COPD. Um, we then sort of thought about the randomization, then when you come to the sort of randomization, non-randomization design, we, we had entered into this journey thinking we, we wanted to randomize, but actually then when we started to, again, think about, um, uh, and to Martin's point here, it was we, we started to think about the fact that we have a diverse population, there's going to be variability, we're comparing a closed triple um, medicine with a single inhaler to the same medicine but with multiple inhalers, the effect size was likely to be quite small. So again, when you start to think about randomization, the numbers start to get really, really high, and then you become in a position where it's not feasible to run the study. Um, so we were, we were faced with, with um, do we work with um, exacerbation as an endpoint, um, and that way we would have had to go to a pre-post design um, because we were going to have to um, recruit between 30 and 40,000 patients to try and do it in a randomized fashion. Or do we opt towards um, the CAT, the, 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 the um, patient reported outcome measure, um, where we could randomize and, and have all that robustness and control the bias, um, but obviously working with, um, I, I guess, a, a softer endpoint. Um, we then had to consider uh, about open label versus blinding. Again, obviously, gold standard is to blind, but really, as I mentioned previously, one of the biggest um, limitations of the randomized control trials for these types, for this type of asset, is the fact that they are blinded, and you, you're not able to demonstrate any any benefit of that single a daily um, a, a administration, which should be a, ma a major benefit to the patient. Um, obviously, as well, we didn't, I, I know we talked about compliance earlier, but we really didn't want to impact um, a patient behavior through the, the, the study with respect to how they receive and, and go and collect their, their medication. Not because we, we didn't want them to take it properly, but, but really so that we could really tease out the effect of the once daily versus um, with one inhaler versus the multiple inhaler option for the patient. 
Um, so, um, but obviously, because it's a randomized controlled trial, a sponsor, we're obliged to supply the drug. Um, we don't control what the comparator arm is. They, they have any open uh, triple therapy that the physician feels is, is relevant to the patient. So logistically, it would have been probably impossible to supply um, for the study anyway. So what we had to do was we worked with um, commercial supply. So actually, the patients received their, their prescription as they would normally um, from their, their physician and their, uh, this, their medicines dispensed by their routine pharmacy. And it's all dealt with behind the scenes and we reimburse um, for the medication um, using um, all pre-existing um, reimbursement channels. We touched on data quality and consistency. This was where, uh, um, as well, we decided not to utilize real world data for the primary um, and secondary endpoints. We do utilize uh, real world data in this study to look at healthcare utilization and we're partnering with um, the health authorities in the UK in Sweden and in the Netherlands to, to collect that data centrally. Um, and for the, but for the study outcomes, what we actually decided to do was to, um, a, to use centralized spirometry and, and, data and, and um, study visits <coughs> at the beginning and at the end of the study. And we tried to limit the impact of that on the patient's behavior by um, enabling the patients to be cared for by their routine care physician um, in, as they would normally in between um, those two visits. Um, if we'd had to do a longer term study, then um, th that perhaps wouldn't have been an option and we would have had to look to use real world data sources to, to get at that data. So again, there was a bit of a, a balanced uh, a choice to be made there about duration of study versus um, the means of, of collecting the data. So anyway, I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavour for some of the, the challenges and we're going to hear much more about a lot of these topics as we go through um, the, next, the next few days. And so I just really wanted to give a message that comparative effectiveness research is, is hugely valuable for all the stakeholders involved. Um, but designing these types of trials is really complex and I'd, I'm not sure there'll ever be a perfect, um, a perfect design. And, and I think it, it, it's really important that we have events like this that we have today so that we can all come together and really think through some of these challenges and start to give some guidance and best practice around how to approach some of these challenge, challenges. As Martin said, we don't want to talk about cost, but this is a significant um, investment to run a study for, for the sponsors but, and the patients as well and the physicians that get involved. Um, so we need, we need a, a bit of insure, assurance um, that the data that's going to be collected is, a, is actually going to be of value to the stakeholders that, that we, we're doing these studies for in the first place. So just to, just to sum up, um, and a lot of these challenges we will hear and we'll hear uh, through, as we go through the next two days. Um, and I just wanted to flag the, um, the Get Real initiative, which as I mentioned at the beginning is, is really focused on driving the use of real world evidence in healthcare decision making. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder um, consortium. We have representation from the HTAs, from regulators, uh, we did have regulators, sorry, in the previous project, um, industry and, and academia. And the way it's set up is really um, to uh, use the Get Real in a platform and, and the ability f to bring stakeholders together in a very open forum, a bit like we have today, to really try and focus on what are the key priorities um, uh, for um, the challenges that are, are in the way of using real world evidence, but also the opportunities that we have to use real world evidence in decision making. And once we've identified those priorities, to translate those down into task forces, which will um, take on those challenges and, and create tangible solutions um, that will hopefully then not only provide tools and, and, and um, education for individuals to use them, um, but through the think tank as well to, to translate those um, back through into policy changes and legislation changes as required. And Eris, who's going to speak next, is going to really go into a bit more detail about the um, pragmatic trial task force that we have, which both tackles some of the statistical um, challenges we have with respect to managing bias and switching of medication, for example. Um, but also, um, we've created a tool that uh, helps individuals walk through some of these very complex uh, design challenges that we, we're all discussing today. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Elaine. Uh
Um, so, Iris, if you're on, uh, let us know. We'll turn to you from Eli Lilly for the, um, I guess you'll be kicking off the reactions to the opening presentation. So, I Iris, are you on? I'm on, if you can hear me. Excellent. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Um, do you put my slides on? Because I don't know when you're ready with the slides. Yeah, there, um, your title slide is on, and I think we've got somebody that's um, advancing them when you, when you say to. Okay. All right, brilliant. So thank you very much, Elaine, for giving this introduction. And just to clarify, um, um, due to the lack in time, I'm not going to um, kind of cover the entire pragmatic trial work um, package that I was, I was and am co-leading with my colleague Mira Sutkes from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. I'm just going to concentrate on one of the um, things we've done, which is uh, the creation of a tool that helps trial designers um, through the kind of maze of um, um, thinking through a pragmatic trial. But um, if you have further questions um, um, regarding the work package itself and all the other elements we are covering there, uh, I encourage you to contact me or mirror suitcase, and um, we are very happy to set up separate um, calls or meetings if, if that's of interest. So in terms of um, the um, tool, which we have called Pragmatic Tool um, as part of the Get Real Work Package, um, can I have the next slide, please? We have identified that um, the majority of stakeholders as Elaine uh, mentioned before, be it healthcare providers or patients, payers, and increasingly also regulators, as we can see today with the workshop, are interested in um, looking into generating real world evidence data earlier um, of good quality um, in their drug development. Throughout the talk today, we call them pragmatic trials. I know that um, this is, um, you know, a controversial term, um, but um, I just make the assumption that we kind of are thinking about the same design in terms of randomized trials in a real-world evidence setting. So um, the data that um, we're interested in um, is um, um, real-world evidence data in the early stages of a drug development, but it turns out that um, as it is not the standard study design that has been used over the last decade, that the experience um, of both people doing these trials as well as those looking at these trials is very limited. So particularly trialists often face very unexpected challenges, um, both in the planning phase and the setting up phase of these trials that are concerning the methodology and feasibility of pragmatic trials. We have performed as part of the um, I Might Get Real initiative a survey um, under um, a targeting um, trial list that indicated that um, up to 82% of the respondents um, who were involved in either the planning or conduct of a pragmatic trial experienced um, major challenges, um, both in their planning and the conduct or the evaluation of pragmatic trials. And this led to um, the abandoning of the planned pragmatic trials in almost a third of the cases. What is also important to um, in emphasize is that various stakeholders as well um, uh, struggle with the accessibility, acceptability of these data, which makes it sometimes a kind of um, vicious circle that people don't want to do a trial where they don't know the data are acceptable. Can I have the next slide, please? So their pragmatic tool, and you see on the slide also a link that you can um, use to um, have a further look or register to the tool. Um, it, this is a tool that we created over the last three years um, to help people in their kind of preparing for these challenges. Um, 
And it is important to emphasize here, this is not a kind of one-time access and you get a ready trial out. This is much more a discussion tool or a decision support tool um, that kind of helps you as a team to go through all the challenges that you may face. The next slide, please. So what can this tool um, do for you? It's an online tool that is you, it, it's free um, um, for access. You just need to register with an um, email address um, that is not used otherwise. What it does, it helps you to facilitate um, uh, and consider the planning of pragmatic trials. It can help you to inform um, in, as part of a teamwork where pragmatic choices could be made if you're, for example, deciding within a more um, um, conventional RCT or a more pragmatic trial. It kind of give you, can give you hints what it means to be more pragmatic or less pragmatic. It can also make you aware of um, the possible operational challenges that you may face. Obviously, it's a generic um, tools, so we're not giving specific information that are um, connected to specific um, disease areas, but it's a generic um, um, awareness of operational challenges that you could be facing. Um, we would like, as part of this tool, to help you to assess what the expected generalizability of the results of this trial could be, because most of the research questions you are trying to tackle when doing a pragmatic trial is concerning data that are um, generalizable to the maximum extent. It can also, and that's almost kind of a side um, um, kick, used to be um, a educational, it can be used for educational purposes. So. Um, Trialists who haven't been dealing with pragmatic trial can use it as a learning tool to understand what are the differences between a pragmatic trial and a classic RCT and where um, you can make trials in, into something that is more pragmatic um, compared to a conventional trial. Next slide, please. So this picture is just a screen dump um, to show you um, what you could potentially expect when you um, register for this tool. On the upper right-hand corner, there is a dial that is um, um, trying to um, make choices between six domains. The domains are generalizability, bias, precision, stakeholders, uh, cost and duration of, of, of a um, trial, and it shows you in, in these kind of um, uh, implications what are in, in each domain of participants, um, um, outcome, comparator, uh, data, safety, um, what the um, um, issues could be um, evolving when you do a pragmatic trial. So here is a, is a example, we use participants. In participants, you go, you select this domain, um, and you were, uh, you're, uh, you're going to see several questions in this domain. For example, um, what the eligibility criteria are for uh, the participants, whether you involve vulnerable patients or not, and so on. So it gives you several questions and your answers will then um, guide you through the implications you have um, on generalizability, bias, precision, stakeholder, cost and duration. And it kind of forms a grid that is um, using a color scheme, almost like a traffic light. So something that is green is kind of on the more pragmatic side, something that is Red is more on the classic RCT side. What we are not trying to do at all is to judge whether a decision is better or worse. We are not trying to encourage 
a trial is to be more pragmatic or not. It depends on the research question whether you choose to be more pragmatic or not. It's just trying to help you um, think to think through the, um, the questions that are important when setting up the trial. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is just our um, screen dump of um, possible outputs. You could see um, you, we um, can develop a um, fingerprint um, on the right side that just gives you the kind of color-coded um, um, overview of what the decisions you made for this specific trial um, um, have in terms of impact on the um, different domains. On the left side, you see um, another possibility, which is simply an Excel spreadsheet that you could download and um, you can work on it um, um, in a team to kind of improve um, um, certain um, um, domains if you can change them um, afterwards. So there are different ways of using the tool in terms of output. So next slide, please. Just to recap, so the aim of this specific pragmatic tool is to facilitate the design and planning of trials that are more on the pragmatic um, side. And the way we do it is trying to get insight into the impact or the, the consequences of the various design choices and the operational challenges on specific domains. Um, the aim is really to to ensure that the data that you generate with this trial have maximum generalizability um, and while we try to ensure the validity and the feasibility of, of um, the trial design. The focus of this specific tool is on randomized pragmatic trials with a drug component. Obviously, um, a lot of their um, um, support is also true for other um, um, interventions like devices or um, um, healthcare interventions that are not drug related, but we kind of concentrated on the drug component. What it is not, it's not making the decision for a trialist, it's just supporting a thought process to make a decision. It's also not a checklist to ensure compliance that is um, obviously relevant in an interventional trial. And it's also not a quality tool that kind of um, ticks you off on the quality side. On the next slide, please. It just shows you the link once more and also the email address um, of my colleague, Mira Suitcase. And we would be very happy to um, inform you more if you're interested in that specific tool, but also um, other things we've done as part of Get Real. And we are very keen also to get feedback. This is the first version of the tool, so there is obviously room for a lot of improvement, and we would be very keen to hear from anyone who is interested. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, Iris. Uh, <laughs> um, so we're going to go to our last, we are running out of time for this session. That's okay. We you got uh, um, a few minutes for your, um, your comments, and then we'll go to um, we'll, we'll still have time for a few uh, comments and questions. We've got a list of questions on my side. I'll probably skip those and turn to the audience if there are, if there are folks that want to line up at the mics. Uh, but go ahead, Stephen. Thank you. Is it okay to speak from here? Or yes, no, it's fine. Yeah. Sure. I, um, I don't think these are my slides. Um, uh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I want to uh, describe a couple of tools that are being developed and coming online that I think might be quite useful in solving some of the problems that have been alluded to by previous speakers. Um, and it, it, except for a name that I inherited that I'll describe in a moment, I won't use the term real world. Uh, Bob Temple has told us that it's ill-defined. Um, I actually think it's worse than ill-defined, but I will use the term point of care. Uh, and this is sort of a, uh, a paradigm for what takes place in a conventional uh, clinical trial, randomized trial, if you will, where we take individuals from the point of care, pass through several filters 
that include eligibility and exclusions, access to care, uh, and so on. And uh, using those filters, we define a trial population. Then in that trial population, there's a data model that's either explicit or implicit that helps us to define our case report forms. These need human curation. Uh, those case report forms then form the database for our trial and eventually through some analyses and other machinations we get our uh, trial results. Um, it's important to recognize that there's no set of filters that one can place between the point of care and the trial population that will uh, expand the population, that will make it more like the real world, if that's your preferred term. These are filters, they reduce the population, and for example, we heard earlier in the adaptable trial, um, the, the fabulous numbers in terms of sample size, but if I understood the slide correctly, it was still one out of 40 who were approached for entry into the trial. There's plenty of opportunity in that kind of a filter for various selection biases that plague us. We also know that this mechanism works extremely well, despite the limitations that we can all see. We have scads of new drugs being developed. It's been serviceable for 75 or 80 years. It's advanced therapeutics. It's uh, been amenable to testing uh, uh, many important questions, eliminating losers and selecting uh, good therapies. However, there are important questions that this kind of paradigm um, uh, does not very wor work very well with. So here's an alternative. Um, and in the alternative, we're going to take our data model and place it inside the point of care, and, uh, and we're also going to take um, the, the uh, other components that we need uh, to add structure inside the point of care so that we can eliminate the pathway that goes through the filter. And by converting uh, the EHR in particular into structured computable data, we then have a way to produce trial results um, directly without going through the filter. Now, we still have issues around consent and some other problems, but I want you to be able to see what the two tools that I'm going to describe uh, very briefly are intended to do. The first one is called Minimal Common Oncology Data Elements. This is the most highly developed at the moment. It's uh, in version 0.9. It's a collaboration with some major entities I'll describe in a moment, and it's an attempt to describe that data model not in the CRFs but in the electronic health record. Uh, the second uh, tool is called iCare. This is where I'm left over with the integrating clinical trials and real world evidence name. But these are questions that uh, attempt to capture data at the point of care that is otherwise rather ambiguously um, uh, placed or recorded in the EHR and I'll show you two such data elements that we are intending uh, to clean up with tests of um, eye care data. Here's the M code. Uh, this doesn't look very minimal, but it is. Um, <laughs> this is the result uh, of um, a group discussion with about uh, 60 to 70 data elements that come from a single use case. There may be, will be additional use cases that are developed, and so the minimal set will expand, but hopefully not too dramatically. And you can see on here there are elements of various uh, components, uh, patient characteristics, uh, care rendered, genomics, and so on, in the cancer context. Uh, and, and so this um, M code set uh, we expect will be widely adopted as a data model uh, going uh, forward in oncology and uh, hopefully uh, will live a life of its own. It's all in the public domain. You can Google this up in, uh, and read about it. The eye care uh, mechanism is a way to sharpen up or create structured data inside the EHR. Here are two examples of eye care questions around 
uh, data elements that we think are documented to be very poorly captured and structured in the EHR, particularly in the physician note. One is around disease status in cancer. It basically creates uh, a structured answer to uh, a sharp question about disease status. And then this structured data can be plucked out of the EHR using very simple technology, much less sophisticated than natural language processing. And then treatment change, another point uh, that's poorly captured. Has the treatment changed uh, with this visit? If so, what's the basis for it? And you can see some of the structure that's uh, offered there around that. At the bottom of this slide, you can see some of the collaborators that we've kept informed and have given us feedback on the uh, creation of, uh, of those questions. So time is short, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about those tools, and I'd be happy to speak with people individually if there are additional questions or comments. Yeah, great. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, we'll take a few more minutes for um, questions and comments from the audience. I'll go to Naomi at the microphone. Thank you. My question is on adjudication. And, uh, uh, that was very interesting, but I'm wondering if that idea that adjudication doesn't make a difference applies to a setting we often see in uh, evidence that health plans review, which is, I'm taking for an example, say an orthopedic procedure where one part, of, one of the outcomes, maybe it's a composite, is a, you know, a reoperation, maybe for pain or for function, and it's the treating surgeon who actually decides on the necessity. And when we ask about that, we're told, well, that's the treating surgeon. So this is a real world problem. And yet it seems to me that adjudication would make a difference in those situations because the, there is no blinding yeah. to, the, to the intervention. I'm interested in the thoughts. Yeah, and, and then you're, uh, so just for the record, uh, Naomi Aronson, the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield tech Yes, okay. we're, we're now evidence street. But yes. Um, so good question, though, and, and uh, around the necessity of adjudication and impact. Um, I think we still have Martin and um, uh, Aris still on the line as well. Uh, anybody here that want to sort of tackle that? Uh, they're deferring <laughs> to the two that are online uh, or on the phone. Um, Martin or uh, Iris, do you want to? And, and I think you brought this up too, Martin. So any comments on this question? You're happy to tackle that. I mean, I think that what one has to think about is, is what are the sources of error and are they likely to be biased with respect to the treatment allocation? Now, if the treatment uh, uh, is open label uh, and the decision about uh, operate or not operate with some specific operation, for example, uh, is made by somebody who's aware of the treatment allocation, then there is the potential for, to introduce bias in those circumstances. Whether one adjudicates that or not actually won't get rid of the bias. The bias will still exist. There's a different issue, uh, which is in the, in the context where uh, the uh, treatment is, um, uh, the treatment allocation is concealed and continues to be concealed. Uh, and that the person making the decision about doing this particular operation doesn't know which treatment arm the person's in. And, it, and in, those, in those circumstances, uh, even if you have some operators who are more likely, for example, to code something with a particular more specialist or perhaps better reimbursed code than others would, that will still just be noise. And then if it's just noise, the question is, is your child going to be large enough to overcome that noise? Uh, and that's something that one needs to consider prospectively and make sure that the answer ends up being yes, your child will, will, over, will be large enough to overcome that noise. So it's the tension between scale and precision. It's not, that it's not uh, a, 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 that's the tension that adjudication versus large scale addresses. Adjudication does not address issues of bias in one treatment or the other. I hope I've put that right, and if I haven't, I'm sure Bob Temple will put me, will, will, will put me right for me. 
Okay. Th oh. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, question over here. Uh, Dana. I may have broken this. Okay, uh, Dana Connors from the Biomarkers Consortium at FNIH. Um, so I have a couple questions, and I'm not sure who there are two, but maybe um, maybe prioritize the okay. one or two. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So the first one, um, I was thinking back to one of the first presenters. They talked about the adaptable trial, and I noted that the intervention was intended for within 24 hours of the event, and it made me think about how incredibly inaccessible my EHR is and how someone would be able to identify an event uh, in my experience uh, within 24 hours and then get me on trial. And so um, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but that seems like a logistical issue that would need to be addressed. And so I was wondering how we would establish that uh, searching an EHR is one thing, right? Making, pulling information is one thing, but pushing that information to uh, a trialist is something else entirely. And that made me think about a second question, which is should we be discussing um, post-market trials as a way to give ourselves the opportunity to explore uh, a larger um, patient set but with, with more time in order to do that. And then the third uh, question or point is um, to Dr. Piantidosi, uh, I, I really like the idea of being able to pull out those filters early on, but does that not just then kick those filters down the road to, to later establishment um, once they're actually on trial? Do you want to take the latter one? I don't. Uh, sure, I think the answer to that is pretty straightforward. Uh, there are uh, filters such as consent that would need to be applied after the fact, uh, even if we induce the electronic health record to contain essentially perfectly structured data like a case report form. However, there are types of research that could support the results of the clinical trial that could be done without consent, such as. Uh, using anonymized records, and there you would have the confidence that the methods of data capture and quality of the data in the EHR was identical for the trial participants as for those who didn't participate. So I do think that, uh, that the eye care method uh, would help to solve some very important questions. Thank you for that question. Okay, um, next comment over here. Hi, uh, Rahul Shunaligar, AstraZeneca. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for Elaine. Uh, I want to ask if, the, if there's a plan to do the intrepid trial in the U.S. setting. So that's question number one. And do you think it's uh, easier or more feasible to do a trial like intrepid in, in European countries uh, because of maybe relatively less fragmented healthcare system compared to the U.S.? Good yeah, question. Yeah, sure. So, um, so that was a very good question. So we do actually have a sister trial to Intrepid that is running in the, in the US. Um, it is a different design. It's, it, we went for the pre-post option in the US, um, and that was driven by the feedback that we had that exacerbation was really the, the critical, um, the critical endpoint um, for, the, for the US. So I think that's, you know, for me, it's, it's really, designing the studies to the questions that you're, that you're trying to answer. Um, and um, to, to your question about whether it's easier, I think um, that study actually is being um, run in partnership with um, two of the major health plans in the US. And so the switching of the medication is the only intervention for that study. And then the data for that study is being pulled uh, entirely from the the claims databases, apart from some safety, additional safety information. But the identification of the patients and the recruitment of the sites, that's all been done in partnership with the, with the health plans. So I think from that perspective, you can run these studies in the, in the US as well. Um, I think in the EU, we've, we've struggled a little. Um, I, I, you know, um, we've already heard from Leslie that you're know, accessing data regardless of which country you go into is is challenging um so if you want to run a, a real world study where you want to access real world data um at the moment we find we can do that in the uk we can do that in the netherlands and um, we can do it in sweden but there's really not that many countries that that it's possible to to do it in at the moment well, since we're over time already, I'm just going to piggyback one additional question um, onto that specifically because it's around the Intrepid study. And you know, one of the things that you mentioned in there was sort of 
um, like the idea of balancing the patient out-of-pocket costs from the intervention drug which you could supply versus the combination of all of the different usual care things that the patients could be taking. Um, that might also be a more complicating factor in, in the U.S. Like how, you know, what, what are, um, do you work with the payer? Do you work with the distributor? Do you work with the dispensing pharmacy? Does the patient have, like, they're instructed not to use their uh, normal insurance card? Do they use a special card? Like, how did you guys work that out? Yeah, so actually in the U.S. is the more, is, is, is I think, the, the more straightforward solution. So in the, U, in the EU, every country has a different solution because we had to adapt to the different reimbursement channels that we had in each country. Um, in the US, what we've actually done is, is um, employ a voucher scheme sure. that, um, that the patients, so the patients um, go to their physicians as normal, they get a, vo a voucher given to them, which I believe is a little credit card, um, and they, they take that to their normal pharmacy, and, and then that triggers the reimbursement of the medication, um, again, through the, the usual channels. Okay, excellent. Okay, wonderful panel. Thanks to um, uh, uh, everyone for being on the, uh, the session and, and certainly those of you who have dialed in. We're going to go ahead and take a break. We're about 10 minutes over. So what I'm going to do is say, um, take a break now. Uh, I'll still give you 15 minutes because that, you know, everybody likes that. Uh, and then we'll come back at uh, 1125 and we'll go from 1125 to 1230 for this next session. Thank you. Okay, um, welcome back. In this next session, we're going to hear uh, about the challenges and opportunities for reliably capturing outcomes in the clinical practice setting using real world data sources. Uh, building on our last session, we'll dive deeper into how these underlying data sources are critical for designing and implementing the trial and some of the unique considerations entailed with using real world data for um, ascertaining study outcomes. I'll introduce our um, list of panelists and speakers. Uh, Elizabeth Sugar is uh, Associate Scientist, Department of Biostatistics at Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. Sean, Tonnet, uh, Sean Tunis is uh, Principal at Rubix Health and Founder and Senior Strategic Advisor for CMTP, Center for Medical Technology and Policy. Um, joining us on uh, via the phone, who's unable to travel with, to meet, be with us today, is Atul Butte. Um, uh, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg, Distinguished Professor and Director of the uh, Bakar Computational Health Sciences Institute, University of California, San Francisco, and uh, Chief Data Scientist at University of, uh, uh, of California. Um, uh, David Madigan is Professor of Statistics at Columbia University. Um, uh, Bill Crown is Chief Scientific Officer at Optum Labs. And Kathy Critchlow is Vice President, Center for Observational Research at Amgen. Um, with that, I'll turn things over to Elizabeth for her uh, opening presentation. Okay, good morning. Just waiting for the slides. Just go next. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a case study of um, using real world data in an actual clinical trial. And this is the Reliance trial, the, which is comparing reflumilast versus azithromycin for therapy to prevent COPD exacerbations. And just to start, I'm going to give you a brief background on the actual trial itself. Um, it is a PCORI funded multi center randomized parallel non inferiority trial. We are, as I mentioned, comparing reflumilast, which is FDA approved for treatment in COPD, with azithromycin. We plan to enroll 3,200 participants with COPD that were hospitalized within the last 12 months. Um, the follow-up will be at baseline, which will actually be our only in-person visit. And then at, um, actually there's going to be a one-week touch-up just to make sure they got their prescriptions, then three months, six months, and every six months thereafter until they either have an event or until the end of the trial occurs. Our primary outcome is all-cause rehospitalization or death. Um, the secondary outcomes are medication adherence, crossover, treatment discontinuation, emergency department or urgent care use, a bit less severe than hospitalization, the NIH promise measurements, some PRO outcomes, 
out-of-pocket expenses, since some of these drugs are quite expensive, as well as weight. Um, we are also, of course, interested in the adverse events that are known to occur with these two treatments, namely hearing detriment, diarrhea, nausea, and suicidal ideation. Now, you'll notice I've highlighted some of the different outcome measurements that we have here in bold, and some of them not. And, and that's sort of a little hint at coming up of what we will actually be using our real world information on. The highlighted ones, we can use it. The non-highlighted ones, we can't. So the trial actually has a large number of different data sources um, that all go into making up the Reliance database. As I mentioned, the only in-person visit will be that first baseline visit. All of the follow-up visits will be remote, and we'll be collecting data either through a patient portal, um, through an investigator portal, where an investigator might look into you know, they actually had the patient in the clinic and they find out about a hospitalization, and also a call center portal. You know, these are COPD patients, they're older, they may be less technology savvy, and so they may not be comfortable completing their visits, their forms, everything online, and so we will have also a call center that will call them at regular intervals to make sure that we collect that data. Now, we will be supplementing this by external data, and some of that will be EMR from the site, that the coordinators at the sites will actually review the EMR to see if there are any reported um, hospitalizations. Uh, we do realize this has the issue that if they go to an EMR that is not at the same hospital that they're being treated at, that would be out of system and it could be missed. Uh, we will also be using the National Death Index to try to monitor any deaths that were not reported, although we are collecting extensive contact information from these patients. Now, the National Death Index has a problem that we'll also discuss when I talk about the CMS administrative portal, and that is a delay in reporting between the timing, and so that may mean we can only use that information for part of the follow-up period. Now, what we are very excited about and what I want to sort of focus on a little bit at the end here is the FDA Sentinel collaboration. And we really had two goals here, one for us, one for them, um, you know, share and share alike. So we want to validate and supplement the trial data. And so we are going to use their databases, mostly inpatient claims files, enrollment and death files, and as well as the prescription drug dispensing trials to really help validate and see whether or not we are capturing all of the information for our primary outcome as well as information about Medicare adherence, urgent care vi visits, um, emergency department visits. And so that is data that we think we can really capture well in the subset of, population, of the population that will have Medicare information. On the other side, we are going to help them with their proof of concept of the distributed regression models to see if you could run these trials remotely just using those database systems. So we are going to get two downloads of the Medicare data. The first linkage will be in 2022, which we have roughly lined up with our interim analysis. For that data, we will be collecting the annual 2019 and 20 data, um, and I mentioned before all of the components. The second one, we will complete the annual information that we have for 2021 and then gain the quarterly access for the first three quarters. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference. Now, the benefit is off, obviously that we have a check, a validation of our primary outcome. We have a lot of additional information on adherence, which is always something that's hard to capture, although with the caveat that this will be whether or not they filled their prescriptions, not necessarily whether or not they took them. And then the proof of concept, as I mentioned. Now, there are a number of challenges here. We have annual and quarterly files that we can gather. The annual has the advantage that it's 99% complete. We can get the drug information from that. But it has a 13 to 15 month lag. So we have to wait a great deal of time for that information. 
Um, the second, the quarterly, comes in much quicker. It still has very good completeness, um, but it doesn't have part D. And so for the end portion of our trial, we'll be relying on the quarterly information as opposed to the more complete annual. And so that will limit what we can validate. Secondly, we can only validate for the subset who are part of Medicare. And that will only be a fraction of our population. So we'll have to think about you know, measurement error, other techniques that we can use to try to extrapolate this to the whole population. And then finally, as I mentioned, you know, we, we can only use this for a limited subset of outcomes. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we'll turn things over to Sean Tunis. Great. Um, yeah, so as usual for people who have seen me talk before, I'm going to be making an overly zealous case just to try to be provocative, but, um, uh, and uh, I'm most interested in provoking Bob Temple, but others are, are welcome. <laughs> um, so I mean my, well, let me just get, 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 get the, here's the take home messages uh, in case you have email to do. So measuring outcomes that matter most to decision makers, patients, clinicians, regulars, payers, et cetera, has emerged as a primary focus for evidence generation, right? Patient-focused, drug development, patient-centered outcomes, that's, that's all the rage, right? What matters to patients, that's what you got to measure. No matter what type of study we're designing, we need to start with a clear understanding of which outcomes matter most. If we get the outcomes wrong, there's no point in doing anything else. That's what I would argue. So once we know which are the most meaningful outcomes, we can figure out which RWD elements are valid reflections of those outcomes or figure out how we're going to add missing but meaningful outcomes data. But you know, as complicated as all this, if we don't get the outcomes that actually matter to decision makers and measure them consistently and reliably, then everything else is wasted, is wasted time and energy. So, and going back to what we used to call pragmatic clinical trials, or I, I called them practical clinical trials, because um, I forgot to read the Schwartz and Lelouch paper when I was writing my paper. Um, so Peter Tugwell, I like his uh, phrase, clinical trials are only as credible as their outcomes. In, in our JAMA paper in 2003, measure uh, about practical trials, measure outcomes of greatest relevance to decision makers, the PCORI methodology committee, Identify and include outcomes the population of interest notices and cares about, and Califf and Sugarman in their clinical trials paper were focused on outcomes directly relevant to participants, funders. So everybody agrees the outcomes have to be meaningful. And the, 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 the fear and the challenge and the risk, I think, is to prioritize feasibility over relevance. And if we do that, I think the whole enterprise is bound to fail. So here's probably the most important slide. Oh, oh, and that's the other thing is, so what about you know value? We're, everything's about value-based pricing, value-based healthcare. Value like value is gonna you know save the healthcare system. If we don't do value, we're 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 met. We're something. But <laughs> <laughs> so and what's value? Well, value is health outcomes achieved for dollar spent. So again, if we don't get the right outcomes, we got nothing. We don't have, you know, we don't have value. We don't have value-based pricing. We don't have value-based anything. And then Michael Porter says health outcomes are inherently condition-specific and multiple-dimensional, meaning the, me the most meaningful outcomes for diabetes aren't the same as COPD, aren't the same for hypertension, and there's not usually one single outcome that's most important. Okay, so this is a slide you need to pay attention to. So this is a consumer reports table for electric screwdrivers. So. There's a bunch of brands on the, in the left-hand column, and then on the top are, you could say, the performance measures, or we'll call them you know, the equivalent of outcome measures, right? So every consumer reports table, they do a bunch of focus groups, and they say, well, what matters to you when you want to buy an electric screwdriver? And I want it to be fast. I want it to be powerful. I want it to run for a long time on a charge. I want it to charge fast. And they, they come up with about a half dozen of things that consumers care most about. Right? And then they measure those in a standard way. So you start with, what, is everybody, what, what does everybody agree? I mean, people care about lots of other things, but you need, you know, you need a kind of a, a limited list of things to make sure, you know, that matter to most people, right? So and then you have to consistently measure all those things so that if someone wants to buy one of these things, they know, okay, well, 
you know, I want the best balance of power and charge time, or I really want a powerful tool, I don't care how long it takes to charge, but, you know, people can decide that. If, if Consumer Reports published tables like this, nobody would buy this magazine, right? All, it's, it's like, okay, we know the speed for three of these, and we know the power for two of these, and we know the charge time for three of these. That is worthless, yeah. right? Um, you just can't make a, any kind of a value-based comparative decision. And we have to remember, if, obviously, this is, I don't know if people notice this is an analogy to clinical research. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's what, you know, that's what evidence tables usually look like, right? Systematic reviews, that's what they look like. That's what we do. So, you know, any, so you have to remember that any individual study you're doing, people aren't making a decision based on that study. They're basing the decisions on lots and lots of studies. And if every study is measuring different outcomes, different ways, then, um, you know, you, you basically have nothing worthwhile. Or, well, that's a little extreme, but let's leave it at that. You can quote me on that. Um, it's, it's, it's less useful than it could be. So, um, there, is a, there actually is a solution to this. Um, there is something that people have been working on all over the world called core outcome sets, an agreed standardized set of outcomes that should be measured and reported as a minimum in all clinical research in specific areas of health or healthcare. Go on the Comet Initiative website, um, and they have a database of hundreds of core outcome sets that have been developed for many different therapeutic conditions. So the work has been done, and, they, and these are developed with patients and clinicians and payers and regulators so that you have everybody's uh, input. And then, you know, we've done some of this work at Center for Medical Technology Policy. We partnered with National Hemophilia Foundation, McMaster, to come up with a core outcome set for gene therapy and hemophilia. It's an area of active drug development, as you know. So we got, you know, a group of 65 stakeholders from U.S. payers, international payers, regulators, patient advocates, industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We went through this three-stage, kind of nine-month, structured, modified Delphi process. And, you know, one of the outcomes with, you know, no surprise, frequency of bleeds, you know, all of the stakeholders, uh, you know, rated that seven to nine as essential. Um, there was some variability uh, on the mental health, anxiety, depression outcome, but the patients all rated this seven to nine. So, you know, so this was one of the six core outcomes out of 90 that we started with that, that all the stakeholders agreed, you know, should be measured in every trial. And I would say, you've got to start there and say, that's, once we, when we start to approach figuring out whether we can do a real world study that's going to be of any value, I don't think it makes sense to forget about the critical outcomes that everybody agrees are important. And then we start dealing with the issues of uh, feasibility. So no matter what type of study we're designing, start with a clear understanding of which outcomes matter most and suggest caution in moving too far from outcome relevance in service of feasibility. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank Thanks, Sean. Um, so our next speaker is joining us um, from the phone. Atul, can you, are you with us? Can you uh, um, let us know if you're there? You might be on mute. I'm going to say Try to unmute your phone and see if that works. Um, if not, maybe we'll go to the... I'm here. Okay, there you me? go. I was almost going to go to the next can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Excellent. And I'm going to guess my slides are up? <laughs> yes, they are. Your title slide is up. Okay, great. So uh, I guess I have permission from Sean to be uh, both provocative and present with zeal. So uh, I'm, going to take, I'm going to take a different uh, angle and talk about real world data from the clinical side and just uh, maybe talk a little bit about potential, what we're doing. So if you go to the next slide, I want to reintroduce the University of California to you. And by the way, thank you for letting me uh, uh, participate remotely here. Uh, just too much travel nowadays. But uh, I'm representing the University of California here, and uh, if you haven't realized the scope of the University of California, uh, we got 10 campuses, uh, five, uh, three national labs, 200,000 employees, so we're actually one of the larger employers in the United States, and that'll come up in a moment, and a quarter million students per year. 
We have uh, 18 health professional schools, which include six medical schools. And you can see all the funding, uh, 12 plus billion in clinical revenue. 5,000 doctors get a paycheck from us, but 100,000 doctors write orders on our patients every year. And of course, we're not just random centers. Uh, we tend to think of ourselves as doing well uh, compared to others, let's say, with these lists and top tens. So what we decided two and a half years ago, at least publicly announced, was that the entirety of the University of California is aspirationally going to make a single accountable care organization. Aspirationally means within five to ten years, and uh, that will be called UC Health. And the minute you make a decision to do that, you're going to need to put all that data, clinical data, in one place to most importantly look at the cost of the care we're delivering, and even more importantly, the variation in care practices. So if you go to the next slide, you can just see uh, uh, the usual kind of IT slide. I wouldn't be an IT person if I couldn't make boxes point to boxes. So here's the one slide like that. And you can see these are the six uh, medical schools, five are major medical centers, so UCSF, UCLA, Irvine, Davis, San Diego, and then Riverside is our newest medical school. They're extremely tiny, a couple thousand patients, but it's, uh, it's uh, listed there just like all the rest there. And all the clinical data is in one place. Now, lucky for us, we're all on Epic, for better or for worse. It wasn't always like that, but we do have that uh, one benefit. And we're now moving all that data into one place. And here I'll talk about what we can do with this. So if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, the kind of statistics. And then I'll go into what it means for clinical trials. So again, it's UCSF, UCLA, Irvine, Davis, San Diego, and Riverside. The number we like to start with is 15 million patients because we have, the University of California has treated 15 million patients over the last 15 years. And we like this number because it's 5% uh, of the U.S. population. Now, if you look at the modern era, so that's data with, that's kind of claims data like. So diagnostic data, uh, MRN, uh, the medication data. If you look at the modern era, and I hesitate to put modern and epic in the same sentence, but when we rolled out Epic in 2012, so seven years ago to the present day, we've treated between five and six million patients. You can see all the numbers there, 125 million encounters. Uh, my favorite is 626 million uh, prescriptions or medication orders and 1.3 uh, billion lab tests and vital signs. Now, more importantly, that's the, that's the legal record. So this is the data from Epic. So I know outcomes are hard, deciding on the outcomes are hard, but this is the legal record of these patients, uh, and everything the care providers need to deliver care now is in one place. We've mashed that up with OSHPA data, which is California State Regulatory data. We have the text elements, especially pathology and radiology that we're parsing now. I think the first speaker mentioned the death index. Uh, conveniently, the University of California runs the death index for the state of California, so everyone who dies in California, we also keep tabs on, and we also match that up with this database as well. So even if they die outside of our facility, we know that they died in the state of California. Now, we also have our own self-funded plans, and this is where it gets very interesting. Uh, we have uh, over 100,000 covered lives just in our own employees uh, and their dependents. And so we have the claims data there too, which means we're also the payer, right? We're a self-funded payer. So that's the rarest of sets where we have the EHR data and the claims data at the same time. And that creates an incredible financial incentive for us to figure out what exactly are all of these medications doing and are we getting uh, the value word out of it, right, uh, as you just heard from the previous speaker. We're continually harmonizing elements because the pharma and biotech industry introduce a new drug every week and we built a whole bunch of dashboards. All right, so if you go to the next slide, you can kind of get an idea of what that means. This is a very simple bar graph. I just picked one arbitrary blood test. Uh, there, there you'll see 2.2 million LDL measurements. This is just proof that it's not claims data uh, because obviously you can't get to the blood test results in general with claims data. Uh, you can see, lucky for us, we have a million blood tests under 200, and then sadly we have a million over 200. And we should make sure these folks are on the right therapy, but of course now we can uh, because we have all the care data here as well. Let's go to the next slide. You'll see where it starts to get provocative. So here, this slide is blurry. Now, this is a cross between a Mondrian painting and a Monet. So you <laughs> see the colors, and it's all blurry. Uh, and it's deliberately blurry, because I'm not going to show you guys the drugs, of course. Uh, it's kind of sensitive. But to give you an idea, each little box here is a separate drug, and each color is a different campus, one of the main uh, UC campuses. So to give you a rough idea, the bottom left box in blue is UC Irvine, 
and uh, they use bevacizumab. That's their number two drug. And they, uh, the charge data there is $42 million. So this is just 2018. So what you're seeing in this, so the entire blurry rectangle represents $1.5 billion. So I'm showing you $1.5 billion in one slide. This is our top 10 drugs that we've charged for in the, in the year of 2018. Now, as you can guess, many of these are biologics. Amazingly, they're not the same biologics because UCLA uses one and UCSF uses the other. And you can guess, of course, we're going to do the comparative effectiveness now to figure out what is the right UC way to treat anything. Now, this makes a difference for trials, as you'll see on the next slide. And I apologize for the typos here. I was doing this all at the last minute last night. So here you can get an idea what real-world data looks like with actual pivotal studies. So I just picked a couple random drugs uh, based on a workshop we had recently here. So if you look at like AbbVie's Humira, which is well known, what I can see on the website were that there were four pivotal studies, two for RA, two for inflammatory bowel disease, totaling about one to 2,000 patients. And then you can see in the University of California, we've treated just shy of 11,000 patients with uh, Humira, with 59,000 prescriptions or orders. If you look at Celgene, uh, Revlimid, Revlimid, the randomized multicenter open label trial had 1,600 patients. Again, I'm getting this from their website. So far in the University of California, we treated 5,000 patients with this drug. Uh, Regeneron's uh, Praluent, uh, if you look uh, at the Odyssey long-term study, it's one of several pivotal studies. They had 2,300 patients. So far, we've treated 1,300 patients. So this is a newer drug. But of course, our numbers keep growing every single day here. So this gives you a rough idea uh, remember, everything we do here is multi-center because we have the five major academic medical centers working together here. This just adds up like crazy. And now we're incentivized to figure out, do we get the bang for the buck for these patients with ACOs and our self-funded plans here? Let me run through one more example here, uh, and it's on diabetes. I think one of the other speakers mentioned diabetes so far. If you go to the next slide, you see this uh, pastel kind of diagram. This is the American Diabetes Association guidelines from 2016 on how we're supposed to treat type 2 diabetes. I think this is well known and loved by primary care docs and uh, diabetes specialists. And you can see why, you know, this, it's great we have a guideline like this. That's wonderful. Many diseases we don't. But you can also see the kind of confusion in the middle. So what this says is after you try to get your patient to lose weight and exercise, you start metformin at the top. And then when that fails, you try one of the six categories in the middle. And then you add in the other five categories. And then if everything fails, you go to metformin and insulin at the bottom there. But there's not a lot of guidance there in the middle, right? So which one do you use? Do you use sulfonylurea? Do you use DPP-4 inhibitors? And obviously, it's a $200 price difference, uh, 200x price difference if you choose one box versus the other box. So what we start to do is just what is our real-world practice pattern uh, in the University of California? Uh, so the way I think of guidelines like this, uh, you might have ever seen, have you ever seen a pachinko machine? You know in Japan, these pachinko machines, you drop a ball at the top, and then you're kind of making a bet, like which way does the ball fall in the machine? That, that is this guideline, right? So the patient starts at the top, <laughs> you're trying to figure out which box do they go to next here, right? It's literally a pachinko machine. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, this is us kind of de like figuring out the, uh, the pachinko machine. So here we're starting with, uh, uh, you see the circle, and uh, you see UCS up in the middle, so I'm guessing you're on that slide. So we used to call these diabetes donuts, and then we realized donuts are inappropriate for diabetes, so we call these lifesavers now. So this is literally how we started 26,822 patients at UCSF with type 2 diabetes. And a third of them start on metformin, the yellow, which is great. A third start on insulin, which is kind of interesting. And you can see all the other ways we start patients on, including the pink uh, is DPP-4 inhibitors, very expensive ways to start patients. Now, we start a patient on this, and what do we do next, right? We send the patient home, we ask them, we might get a hemoglobin A1C, we send them home, we say come back to clinic in 90 days, if we're lucky they come back, and then we make another decision. So hit the next slide, and you can see this is the next thing we did to each patient. So the rings are gonna keep building like this. So the yellow by itself, you see a half of the first set of yellows, they don't have another ring. That means 
Uh, that yellow means that those patients who are in metformin, we've never changed their dose again. Yellow changing the yellow means we had, we're still on metformin, but we had to change the dose. And any other color change means we added a drug, subtracted a drug, changed the drug. Okay, we send them home, they come back to clinic, go to the next slide. This is the next move. We send them home, they come back to clinic, and hit the next slide, and that's the fourth move. So now in this weird kind of chess game of sorts, or pachinko machine, these are the first four moves we're making on the patient and the disease. And if you count them up, actually, we have 1,600 different ways to play the first four moves of this weird game of type 2 diabetes. Probably too many. Probably <laughs> unnecessary care practice variation. And remember, we got the A1Cs up and down the graph. Now, with one button, you hit the next slide, and now we can scale to the entirety of the University of California, and you can see 159,000 patients with type 2 diabetes there with 728,000 medication orders. And you can see how many ways we have across the entire University of California to actually play this game against type 2 diabetes. Probably too many, and now we are incentivized to figure out which, what is the efficacy, not just side effects, what is the actual efficacy of all these drugs that we're paying for. You hit the next slide, you can see we're actually getting pretty good at using machine learning to do this. This is just a very simple graphic of can we predict where a patient's A1C is gonna be in 90 days, and, uh, and, uh, and where are they are, uh, what we actually observe, so the observe versus predicted. And you can see we're pretty good now. We can machine learn what the A1C is going to be in the future. If you hit the next slide again, you can see with a, even a simple decision tree, we can start to make our own kind of guidelines. When should we use metformin? When should we skip ahead a couple steps? <laughs> it turns out that if your patient uh, has a very high hemoglobin A1C or fasting glucose, you know, you should probably just step, skip the metformin. In our hands, it doesn't seem to work. You're going to make a move anyway, so just make that next move faster. And on the final slide, to be the most provocative, I'll just say that we now have up to seven years of follow-up data on many of our patients. UCSF and UCLA put in EPIC seven years ago, and now we are starting to look at MACE, kidney health, eye health, and we will do the multicenter long-term comparative effectiveness studies including cost data on type 2 diabetes, hypertension, lipids, and everything else. And what's amazing is this entire database is paid out of operational dollars, so we don't need a single grant to get this database launched because the operational side of the business now sees that much value from having this database. So let me just stop there. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Atul. We'll turn things to uh, David Madigan. Thank you very much. My remarks are going to be a little bit more kind of wonkish. Um, so I, I basically, the basic point I want to make is, you know, in classical RCTs, we proceed as if we measure outcomes without error, for better or for worse. We could talk about that. Um, that doesn't fly in real-world data. So it, it, it's inevitable that when we measure outcomes, there is going to be measurement error. And my basic point is we need to measure that and account for it. Um, this is the, the wonkish part. Um, just, I'm going to throw around terms like, like uh, sensitivity and positive predictive value, just so we're all on this, the same page. Um, everyone's probably seen this before. Um, I, if for binary outcomes, it's obviously a different story for, for continuous outcomes, but for binary outcomes, there's the predicted outcome, what, what you measure in your database, and then there's the actual outcome, the ground truth. Um, and there are many metrics you can look at in this context, two in particular. One is sensitivity, which is of those people who have the outcome, how many do you detect? Um, and another one is positive predictive value of those where you say they have the outcome, what fraction of those actually do. So you, you know, any, any one metric doesn't capture the whole story. You need at least two in order to correct for measurement error in any analysis you do. So that's my basic point. Two, other, two things I'd just like to touch on. Uh, one is um, there was a project which many of you are familiar with called OMOP, which was a public-private partnership between the FDA and, and Pharma led by the FDA that con concluded five or six years ago. What OMOP did was a big kind of bake-off, an empirical evaluation of methods for causal inference in a bunch of databases against a ground truth, a bunch of positive controls and negative controls. Um, so the, here the, 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 the colors indicate the blues are negative controls, the reds are positive controls, there are outcomes on the, on the vertical axis and drugs on the, on the horizontal axis. So one of the things we did extensively in OMOP, and it's, it's published in several papers, 
is look at, at a variety of definitions of outcomes, which w went from things that were very sensitive to things that were very specific. So for example, for acute liver injury, one of our outcomes, outcome definitions was the occurrence of at least one broad diagnostic code, right? So very sensitive, not very specific. All the way down to, if you look at number four there, it involves lab values and diagnostic tests and, and so on and so forth. The take-home message from OMOP, the, this slide is incomprehensible. The take-home message from, from OMOP was there isn't a winner. So it was not the case that for causal inference, you're better using the most sensitive outcome or the, or the most specific outcome. It all depends. It depended on the outcome. It depended on the method. It depended on the particular context. So there's a complex interplay between the operating characteristics of your uh, outcome um, and uh, causal inference. Message number one. The second thing I wanted to highlight was most people in the room are probably aware of Odyssey. So Odyssey is a collaboration of researchers around the world, several hundred researchers around the world, studying observational data, studying real-world data. Um, uh, the union of the data that, that's mapped the OMOP common data model in the Odyssey network is, has about 700 million patients. There are several activities going on in Odyssey that I think are of relevance to this discussion. Um, there is an effort to build a phenotype library uh, within, within Odyssey. Um, it, it's not unrelated to the Comet uh, uh, project that we, we heard about. Um, there's a shiny app viewer that you can view the phenotype library. It's very nascent right now. There's a lot, lot of work uh, to come. There's very interesting work uh, going on on creating phenotypes probabilistically. So the basic idea is that you start with a set of noisy uh, um, outcome data, um, you know, um, records where you believe there's a, there's a, uh, it's positive, records where you believe it's negative. Then use machine learning techniques. You're, 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 you're the standard library of machine learning and AI tools to, to build a model to discriminate between the positives and the negatives, and then use that to create a, a, a phenotype definition. And you can read about that at that, uh, at that web page. There's also a very interesting project on, called the fee, fee Evaluator, led by Joel Swirtle, um, which is to do with evaluating phenotypes. And the basic idea here is that you, you take a set of patients where, where you're very confident that they really do have the outcome. You take a set of patients where you're very confident that the patients do not have the outcome, typically small numbers of patients and then use that to evaluate um, the, whatever phenotype algorithm was developed, say, externally or using the, uh, the project on, on the previous page. So I, I just, I'm just drawing your attention to the, you know, there's a lot of activity within the Odyssey community directly related to, uh, um, to outcomes and measurement of, of uh, characteristics of outcomes. Um, so in, in conclusion, um, Estimating sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value you know, is, is a good thing. It is more than a good thing. It is a necessary thing because it allows you to account for the, the resultant uncertainty you know, in your analysis. Um, it, it's, um, estimating PPV alone is insufficient. So the next time you, you, know, you see a paper where somebody lists you know, their, their, their measurement of MI or whatever it is, their way of assessing it, and they give you the PPV, you should howl. Right? That's not enough. It's not enough to then, uh, you know, to back into, uh, to, to adjust your analysis, your inferences, uh, for, you know, for the uncertainty. Um, one thing as well is this, this whole game of, of causal inference in, be it in, in, in uh, randomized studies or observational studies, is not about thumbs up or thumbs down. We're trying to have this mindset. Um, and, you know, from a regulator, from, from the point of view of the regulator, it's perhaps necessary. But from the point of view of care, this is all about characterizing uncertainty and quantifying uncertainty you know, about the effects of, of interventions. So ignoring measurement error simply is bad practice. We're deluding ourselves. So we need to account for measurement error in the inferences and predictions we make. Technically, it's fairly straightforward. You know, the, the, the challenge is characterizing the uncertainty is, is not such a, such a simple thing, but it's, it's, yeah, you know, I, I strongly believe we're deluding ourselves if we proceed as if the outcomes we're measuring in real world data are known with, uh, with certainty. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David. Next will be uh, Bill Crown. Hi, everyone. I am I'm primarily an observational research guy, but I have some friends that do trials. Uh, so I'm going to mainly talk about the data-related issues of these kind of hybrid studies. Um, one of the things, I think there are, it isn't all problematic. There's uh, some tremendous uh, benefits uh, to the randomization, obviously. And in particular, one of them is that in purely observational data, you've got um, both 
the actions of the provider and the actions of the patient that are confounding. And one of the great things that the randomization does is solve the, uh, the balancing issue with respect to the provider uh, and takes that out. Uh, but we still need to be worried about uh, subsequent issues of non-random sampling uh, uh, attrition in the different treatment arms, um, medication adherence, uh, you know, is typically measured in, with medication possession ratios that are measured over the same time frame as the outcomes, and that creates a confounding uh, problem that needs to be carefully thought about and dealt with. Uh, and, um, but we do have this opportunity to kind of bring together uh, prospectively collected data with data that would be very difficult to collect. We know that uh, even getting information from patients uh, on their history of hospitalizations is very, very highly uh, measurement prone, uh, so they error prone. So the ability to be able to capture that kind of healthcare utilization and encounters with the healthcare system in the detail there is the kind of stuff that administrative systems do really well. And when you can combine that with primary data collection on the outcomes of interest and uh, really important confounders of interest, then it really strengthens the research design. Uh, so I'm going to uh, mainly just talk about a, um, a couple of um, uh, data issues. We've got a bunch of guidance documents that are out in doing real world uh, studies. And I think these, uh, even though they're not necessarily focused on randomized trials, they're randomized on, they're uh, focused on these data issues that I'm uh, talking about. So uh, these are great resources for thinking about uh, the measurement issues and a lot of the analytic issues that come downstream from initial randomization and which uh, the methods issues we'll be talking about later this afternoon. So uh, three big issues are um, leakage and electronic medical record uh, systems. Uh, and this is basically the problem that uh, you don't really know what you've got in a medical record system until you can link it uh, with external information, claims data in particular, that captures broader measures of healthcare utilization. You may be just getting a feed from a hospital. You may be getting a feed from an oncology cl clinic. You don't really know until you can do that linkage. Um, a second major challenge with conducting research in elect with electronic health record data is that most of the contents in unstructured notes. Uh, so being able to pull that out effectively is a real challenge with natural language processing. Um, and so I'll have a couple words to say about that. And then the third is mortality data. Unfortunately, we're not all like the University of California system. And there's, uh, that's a real challenge uh, with mortality information. So this just gives you a sense of the leakage. These uh, on the um, column to the left are uh, specific uh, source IDs. These are provider groups that are providing data. And this is just measuring uh, for an AMI um, popu uh, population um, the number of AMIs that we saw, hospitalizations that we saw by provider group, and then uh, whether there was any evidence of medications being administered. And then um, this issue of the aspirin use, um, which tends to be captured often in um, the uh, ambulatory settings and with primary care. And so you see there's this one really weird uh, provider that had just one hospitalization that's probably a data error of some sort. There's another, um, another two that have really low um, uh, medication administration. So these are probably lacking um, the, uh, the outpatient um, uh, experience. So uh, the idea of integrated delivery networks and understanding what you have for data in terms of being able to measure safety events that are happening in settings outside of the setting that's being captured by electronic health record data, and also the ability to be able to control uh, for um, issues like non-random selection, uh, attrition, and so forth um, uh, is really, really important. Uh, understanding your data is important. Uh, there is a, another issue in electronic health record data and administrative data in general in terms of not in uh, capturing patient reported outcomes. So this is one of the great benefits of setting up research networks like PCORnet and the NIH collaboratory. Um, Interestingly, a lot of patient reported outcomes instruments show up in uh, medical record data with regularity, and these are some of them that do. Uh, but um, they, 
they show up in a very sort of haphazard fashion. So it's very difficult to create, you know, balanced control groups um, by finding these measures that just happen to show up in the electronic health record data. Um, the other issue is the data quality associated with them. So this is um, uh, many mental health uh, status uh, um, evaluations. And um, you see that we've got uh, out of 46 million patients um, initially, uh, we saw uh, 179, about 180,000 that had a uh, many mental state evaluation at any point in time. Uh, within a particular um, more recent time frame, there's 126,000. This is 0.39 of 1%. So it's, it's, it's a big population to begin with. It's not relevant for a lot of people, uh, but um, still it's a very small percentage. It's not likely to be representative or generalizable in, a, in any way. Um, but uh, there's, um, there is interesting content there. Um, a tool was involved in a study that had to do with um, using uh, machine learning methods, deep learning methods in particular, on unstructured data and medical record data. So one of the challenges that we face is we have to map all this data, get it into structured form, and, and clean it up and so forth in order to be analyzed. It. What if you just did uh, deep learning on the, the, the raw data, on the raw notes? Um, and so this was a collaboration with the um, uh, University of California system and, um, and University of Chicago and Google, uh, where they applied deep learning just to the raw data. And the, the hospitalization, rehospitalization models that they estimated, uh, mortality models, actually outperformed any that had been previously estimated. But it took hundreds of thousands of hours of um, computational time uh, to be able to do it. So you need a lot of infrastructure. And a tool could uh, answer questions on this much better than I could. Um, mortality data, uh, we have um, real challenges with this with uh, our number one source has been the Social Security death master files due to statutory changes in 2011 around state reporting of um, mortality data. This has dropped uh, by about 40 percent in terms of reported mortality in electronic medical record data. That's a real problem. Um, so um, there's been some analysis of, uh, of these data uh, and um, uh, attempts to create workarounds with composite endpoints. So for example, in health plan data, uh, enrollment often notes whether or not the person died or not. Um, their hospitalization discharge often codes, uh, generally codes um, uh, mortality uh, status at, at discharge. Um, uh, but there's all, and there's, these, but there's these people where you just don't know what the, whether they were, uh, they died or not, uh, and so that's a that's a challenge that we need to be thinking about as important as uh, mortality is. Uh, so um, just to summarize, the um, missing data due to linkage is um, something that we really need to understand, and we can primarily do that through the linkage of uh, claims data and electronic health record data, particularly in terms of just matching the encounters and seeing you know, the percentage of them that we, that we match up. Um, doing that, you can then identify the sites that have the most complete data, and you can conduct the studies in those sites, uh, which gives you uh, um, opportunities to be able to do um, analyses that cut across payers, for example, uh, and um, uh, uh, different parts of populations that are like Medicaid versus commercially insured versus Medicare. Um, and there's a very interesting issue about the distinction between causal inference and prediction. Uh, and um, some of these issues don't matter so much for prediction. So um, there's evidence that the machine learning methods actually work very well on incomplete data if you have a lot of it. So you get a lot of kind of Medicaid data kind of matched with electronic health record data, matched with commercial claims data, and it's pretty, uh, shows promise in terms of signal detection. Um, also, I think um, uh, Bob mentioned the issue about linkage to registries. So this is one way to overcome some of the limitations of electronic health record data is to actually link to highly structured clinical data that's captured in registries. Um, of course, primary data collection. Um, the uh, ability to do natural language processing and deep learning to pull the data out of, um, out of unstructured notes. Uh, and then finally, mortality data has some of the same solutions that um, uh, the limitations of unstructured data do. 
Um, the linkage to registries is uh, one way to get the mortality data, collect it uh, directly with primary data collection. Um, we can all lobby uh, to get the legislation changed um, to allow statutory use of Social Security death master uh, data. Um, and we don't really know, uh, we haven't had done enough research, I don't think, to know whether or not um, the uh, death master reduction, because it was sort of a, you know, across the board issue uh, in terms of um, uh, the states that were doing the reporting, influences relative risk. So it may be that the reduction may still allow, even though there's a dr dramatic drop off in uh, reported mortality, uh, may still be able to do relative uh, risk evaluation with those data. Thank you, Bill. And then we'll now turn things to Kathy Critchlow. So thank you. I'm Kathy Critchlow from Amgen. Let's click. Past I'll click past Bill. this. Yes. Just to the next one. The green. This one. Oh. No, just the big green. Oh, big green. So I took Greg at his word that slides were optional, so I do not have slides. Um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to provide uh, a sponsor per, uh, perspective, but they're really my perspectives on key issues involved in leveraging real world data for uh, outcome measurement. So I'll, I'll talk about three, three main points. One is you know, this effort on uh, using real world data, and a companion trend or effort that's, uh, that's, that's quite prominent now is just the increasing uh, impact or increasing focus on patient focused drug development. And here what's really key is that there's the potential to, to develop, identify, capture endpoints that are relevant to patients. And we've talked about um, you know, using real world data to recruit patients, to capture uh, data from patients at point of care in trials. Uh, but also there's there's increasing efforts on using mobile health apps, on using other kinds of uh, uh, instruments to capture uh, uh, patient data using uh, wearables and that type of thing. So all of this together points to a need to uh, you know, really define uh, endpoints that are important to patients, but also one of the issues is are these endpoints relevant to regulators and other, uh, uh, other stakeholders? So one of the you know, the, the other point that comes along in that is, is again, some of the uh, developing guidance on these endpoints is how do we make sure that these endpoints are relevant to patients but equally relevant to um, regulators and payers so that medicines become um, accessible to patients. One interesting thing from a sponsor perspective is how do we overcome the functional silos attached with doing these studies uh, to the rigor that needs to be done? So for us, it's you know, we think of how do we get the input, and I like Leslie's uh, thing that evidence generation in this sense was a team sport. It really is. And I think the people on the panel all reflect the, the, the various uh, people that contribute to this. But it's, you know, we have our operations colleague, our development colleagues, our biostat colleagues, our epidemiology colleagues. And so it really is, you know, we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how do we bring these people together to develop the capabilities to do these studies well. And it's hard, and I, and I, don't, think, um, I don't think that's specific to us. I think it's also uh, all of the other stakeholders here trying to bring people together with the relevant uh, expertise to do these well is something that I think we all need to be um, working on. So what are some of the issues that we think about when developing, um, using our real world data and outcome ascertainment? So one thing that we've talked about as we think about potential use cases to uh, bring forward is to what extent do outcomes, real world outcomes need to mirror or match or be the same as those that have been used uh, or accepted in clinical trials. So one issue that we've certainly found is that in clinical trials, you have routine assessment and collection of data. So you're capturing data in clinical trials that you might not be capturing in real world data. And one that comes to mind is um, you know, one of our, our uh, drugs is for skeletal related events, for bone metastases in uh, oncology patients. And there in the clinical trial with routine assessment, we're picking up asymptomatic fractures, we're picking up uh, procedures like that are not coded in ICD-9 codes like surgery to bone or radiation to bone. 
So when a real world data endpoint would, would have to be pathologic fracture, for example, something that takes uh, a patient to uh, a healthcare environment to be assessed. So one has to think about, well, what endpoints are, are reliably measured in uh, real world data? And to the extent that, again, if there's an endpoint that is important to patients and whatever, it's if the real world data endpoint is something that we should be focusing on, we really do have to pay attention to, uh, as we think going into the future, of how do we evolve our infrastructure to uh, be able to capture those endpoints in a way that's, that's meaningful. So that just introduces the question of are there different outcomes that, uh, you know, that there may be endpoints that regulatory guidance doesn't exist. So clearly that's going to be part of uh, the framework, but we have to think about, you know, validation of these endpoints. So one area that, um, you know, I, we, we know what's going on, that there's a lot of efforts going on with respect to replicating clinical trials in real world data. So there's, um, you know, efforts going on where we're looking at real world data after the trial's been completed to see what, um, you know, what we can learn from that. And certainly we can learn from the successes and everyone would point to that and say, oh great, real world, you know, observational data or real world data can be used uh, reliably. But we also need to make sure we're learning from the failures to replicate trials. And it's not that, again, that the observational research or, or real world data is, is faulty in some way, but we have to think about, well, what, you know, why didn't they replicate? So, you know, another area that we're thinking about is, well, we're doing a clinical trial. We could also be looking at in real world data uh, you know, patients that meet the entry criteria for uh, uh, a clinical trial, and then looking at um, uh, looking at those endpoints uh, in the in the uh, real world data cohort, and again, and do a real time parallel comparison between what's going on in the clinical trial uh, versus the real world um, setting as well as potentially linking clinical trial patients' records to their electronic health records, and again, doing real-time evaluation of, of, um, of endpoints. So we know that, um, uh, that part of our, our mission here is to inform uh, development of the uh, uh, framework. And again, that's very difficult because there's a catch-22. I think sponsors want some type of, of clarity in terms of what's going to be accepted. On the other hand, we don't want it to be too prescriptive because, again, we want to be able to harness the power of real world evidence without going down that slippery slope of lowering the evidence bar. So again, as we, as we think about how to do this, it's, we have to think about, well, what are the questions that we're really addressing? And that was brought up uh, earlier as well. So to the extent that um, we're addressing the question, we may be addressing the question of, well, how well do drugs work in clinical practice settings, which is a very different question than what is the best estimate of the treatment effect of a particular drug? And we have to be comfortable with knowing what questions we're actually addressing uh, and, and be able to work with that and, and know that we may not be addressing the question that a clinical trial would address, but we're addressing a different question that's equally important. I think for, with that, I'll... Uh, I'll conclude. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kathy, and thanks to all of our uh, presenters. A lot of great um, topics were covered during these presentations. I'm going to ask a, a, a question or two, and then we're going to open it up to the audience again on, at, at your mic. So um, be thinking of, oh, okay, we've got people going already. Um, I'll get to my question really fast. Um, so I really like, uh, Sean, you opened up with this um, you know, sort of a pr process that um, CMTP and Rubix uh, sort of took um, in, in terms of trying to get, like, what are those most meaningful outcomes? And you modified Delphi, all of those kinds of things. Um, and you arrive at, you know, I think that, like, wouldn't the, goal, wouldn't the best case scenario be um, the outcomes that you came to in that process happen to be the most meaningful to patients were really good outcomes from the regulatory context, were really good outcomes or like these are the things that payers are looking for too, and they're outcomes that can be reliably measured in real world data sources. Like that's, well, that, that would be great if we had that, but we don't. So um, 
how do, you know, in terms of that process, like what do you think, uh, or anybody else on the panel, like when we're trying to figure out of those outcomes that are really meaningful according to the stakeholders, how do we know which ones, um, oh, you, re you really should go to real world data sources to measure those, or um, well, you can kind of measure them in real world data, but it's probably better to sort of prospectively measure them for the traditional clinical trial, or like somewhere in the middle where like maybe you do some sort of a hybrid approach where you know you sort of collect some of the information from the trial but then you're also supplementing that with the real world data sources like what's the um, what do you th what do you all think is like the best next steps for a, a process like that of trying to figure out which ones are well, I'll you know. just give a good, kind of a quick first pass is like I just think you know it's useful as a starting point to have a pretty clear awareness of which of the endpoints, which of the outcomes matter most. Before you then go to sort of trying to deal with the tension of how hard it would actually be to get that information. But I would say, for example, from the work we did on gene therapy and hemophilia, where if one of the six outcomes had something to do with, you know, mental health functioning, right, which is, and, and, and universally, you know, endorsed by the patients particularly, but eventually all the stakeholders. Um, you know, you'd be pretty hard pressed to say it would be, you know, useful to not think hard about how you were gonna, you're gonna get some, you know, some reflection of that through, um, you know, whether it's real world data, you know, prescription information or something or something, but just, it, what, what, I, what I'm just really arguing for is like, that's the starting point before you sort of start to whittle down and to say, you know, what's actually, possible, and if you know it's important, I think then, you know, it may be that, well, it's, it's not going to be amenable to a real-world study unless we actually, you know, get that from, you know, get, get that endpoint uh, yeah. somewhere. Uh, any, any other panelists with comments on that? No. Mr. Atul, if I can chime in? Atul, yeah, please. Yeah, so I think there's going to be a certain set of studies that are going to be very amenable to real-world data. Uh, I have this running list of 20 of these, but I'll just mention a few now natural history, synthetic or simulated control groups, studies to get biosimilars up and running, uh, you know, to uh, uh, inform the current development of biosimilars, uh, expanding indications across countries, across age groups, uh, like with uh, Pfizer, Ibrantz, the male breast cancer drug, uh, how to trim the trials, uh, do we need all that CRF data anyway, you know, trials of the future, uh, general efficacy versus the approval of drug trials, uh, efficacy in specific populations. So there'll be a lot of these kinds of studies that are very unique to real world evidence. The hybrid ones are gonna be the harder ones to figure out, but I think uh, there's a whole class of studies that I don't, I don't think we've really been able to do well, uh, but uh, with so much digitization of the clinical data might now be enabled. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, Jesse? Uh, Jesse Berlin, Johnson & Johnson. Um, I, I want to just follow up on something. I'm being disciplined here because I had a whole list of questions, but I'll, I'll focus <laughs> on one for David. And it's kind of a comment that I want you to respond to. Um, you, you, you mentioned this idea that measuring uh, the, the characteristics of an outcome measure and then not doing anything about it is not enough. Uh, and I just want to get back to something Leslie mentioned this morning, which is the validation sub-study they're doing, that the follow-on to that is you then, in principle, need to take the results of that validation study and then apply them to the results of the big study to adjust for whatever misclassification there is. And that has a cost, since you've estimated the error with error, uh, you have to carry that error through and you end up inflating the variance and, and just to be blunt, one of the reasons I mention it is um, it, it's in a little bit different context, but I've, I've seen uh, there's a paper by Martin Schumi in, in my group um, that got criticized for uh, explicitly taking error into account and inflating variance. And the criticism was, oh, you guys are just some bad industry people, and you're inflating the variance to make a signal go away. So th there's some really important implications to all of this that people need to understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's not a technical problem. It's it is more of a cultural problem. So it's it's you know, we're not accustomed to routinely measuring the you know, uh, estimating the measurement error associated with with our outcomes. We do that to some extent, 
but generally we, what we do is we measure it using you know, PPV or something like that and say, gee, look, it's not bad. And, and then we proceed as if it's, as if it's perfect. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's a cultural problem. So there's, there's, there's no particular technical problem you know, with regards to using you know, error rates that were measured on your, on your own data you know, and then using that to account for uncertainty in the inference. I mean, there are all sorts of methods that are, are you know, available for, for, for doing that. But there is a cultural problem that, um, you know, I think that when with Martin Landry earlier talked about, um, essentially, he, he gave an example where he said, essentially, let, let's suppose the sensitivity was around about 80 percent. And, and then he showed, gee, look, it, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, well, that, that's kind of not good enough, right? What if it's 2 percent? You know, you've got to measure it um, in order to, to make statements about how it affects the, you know, how it impacts the, the, the inferences. Yeah, that's a good point about the cultural too. Is, you, know, you were referring to a safety outcome, but if you did the same thing for an effectiveness, it'd be the opposite, you know, criticism. But you know, sort of <laughs> keeping that on balance. Um, okay, uh, next. Uh. Jay Aram, uh, Pfizer. My question is about uh, real-world data and rare disease. Um, I saw Elizabeth's uh, uh, trial and every uh, other trials. Fifty thousand. These are numbers that we dream of. But I work now and concerned with mucormycosis which is a, uh, an infection that is uh, basically a death sentence if you get mucormycosis in, in, in the right setting. You don't worry about the underlying condition, which is a hematologic malignancy. So we're thinking of how to generate real-world data, which is potentially the best promise we have in rare disease to have the more number of patients. On the other hand, it is so rare that we cling to every patient we can have that we are risking getting wrong information just because we can't get hold of them. Just to give you a reference, we ran a five-year study throughout the world uh, in all continents, 37 hematologic malignancy patients from 37 centers were enrolled, and we have 37 patients over a five-year period, so that's one patient per center every five years. So just thinking about how to apply real-world data in such setting. Uh, good, good points. Uh, any comments from the group? Uh, okay. uh, Naomi? Yes, so uh, there was a lot of discussion and every, I think everybody agrees. There are outcomes that are important to patients and outcomes that are important to payers. And probably it's not so hard to agree on what, what all those outcomes are. What's really hard is measuring them. Yeah. Okay? And we are moving more and more carefully, cautiously, thoughtfully to what we're thinking of as preferred outcome measures understand what measures actually capture those outcomes that are of interest. Moreover, what's a clinically meaningful difference? When do you need responder criteria? As opposed to, because generally we tend to uh, compare averages, all right? But those may not really be that informative. So my question is, and this is not a anti-industry question or an anti-real world data or evidence question. It's a question of genuine interest because I see lots of opportunity here. And so how do we bring those thoughts into the real world data sources in terms of what are the measures and what are clinically meaningful differences? Yeah, I think the mortality is a good example of that because, you know, Mortality is such an important endpoint, right? And so in a world where you are just using purely observational data that's coming in from electronic medical records or claims, we know that that is, has really serious problems. And so the thing that I think is so um, promising about these kind of hybrid designs is that you collect it. Uh, you know, ideally, it would be available for everyone in a reliable way and part of the learning healthcare system, we would have this. Um, but um, if we need to do it in a study-specific manner, at least that's a way to get it, you know, for, a, for an individual study. Uh, and um, this is a great, I think it's a great example of what you're talking about. There are, you know, so we'd, we'd need that for whatever the primary or secondary outcomes are of a particular study that we'd want to do. I just, just had one, one more point on this, just sort of triggered me to re reflect that, you know, one of the things that I doesn't, don't think works well, whatever the, you know, decisions about meaningful endpoints are, are for 
individual research teams to try to figure out themselves consulting with stakeholders. It seems to me like, you know, that's what leads you to one of those useless consumer reports tables where everybody's, you know, gone through their own process. So I really think, and I know the, uh, the FDA has put out some, you know, RFPs to do work in terms of harmonizing endpoints, you know, in therapeutic areas. So I think, but it's going to take, you know, some sort of centralization and, and agreement rather than, you know, I think we're, I think we're lost, with, separate from the questions of feasibility if we, you know, if we, if we do this project by project or organization by organization. Well, and I do want to emphasize that in seeking these preferred measures, we're not interested in making them up. We're interested in understanding what's out there and for there to be some kind of universal inventory of it's not just the measures, but what's a clinically meaningful difference. And again, when do you need responder criteria? Uh, but I will also say your point, Sean, is not only important to any particular study, it's important to our ability to you know, accumulate and aggregate over time uh, in order to learn. Thank you. And if I can just add sure. one thing really briefly, I think one of the things is, you know, we as researchers may, as a community, agree on the endpoints. We then have to sell it to the other side to make it part of, you know, the common collected what's done and, and convince them that this is not just a research question, but this will be a care question and will help with the cost and the development of the patients themselves and make that sale so then it would be much more available through EHR and through these other common yeah. elements. And I think that's another bridge we're going to have to pass. Yeah, but hopefully including some of those stakeholders in it, the process exactly, of developing them like, gets like buy-in. the example given yeah. with, UC, yeah. with the UC system. Okay, uh, we have time for one more uh, quick question. Great. Uh, my name is Jerry Krishnan. I'm from Chicago, and uh, I'm responsible for a population health program in, in Chicago, one of the health systems. But I wanted to build on the comments that Sean and Elizabeth just made, actually, which is this concept of which outcome matters. I think Sean showed in one of the slides, it depends on who you ask. Um, uh, there is some variability there um, by stakeholder. And even within a stakeholder, there may be certain cost or timeliness issues that people really you know, are willing to make some trade-offs. Um, I'm reminded of the quote that sometimes we focus so much on rigor that we lead to rigor mortis because we're kind of stuck in this endless loop of trying to get it totally right. So the comment I want to offer, maybe we'd like to hear what the panel would say, is that just as the outcomes people care about might vary, their risk tolerance for measurement error might vary as well if they're, will if they're able to make more timely decisions that are not so costly that they can't make any decision. I don't know who that would be on the panel, but maybe risk tolerance for error might vary by stakeholder. And perhaps we should think about that in establishing standards that we allow the stakeholder to decide. Great, thank you. Okay, okay um, great. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this uh, session. We are going to break for lunch. I'll be starting back here at exactly 1.30, so I apologize, you get a few minutes shy of an hour. Um, it is on your own. There are a, good, a bunch of good restaurants nearby. Also, Sarah at our registration desk has a list of local restaurants. If you're running late on time, you can bring your stuff back into this room uh, just so that you're here at 1.30. That would be great. Uh, thanks and have a great lunch. In this particular session, we're going to focus in on another very unique implementation challenge. It didn't come up this morning, but we're going to zero in on it here. Um, and that's related to blinding. There are many questions about when blinding is necessary and within which component of the trial blinding should occur, if at all. Um, in this session, uh, we'll have a lead-off presentation that will showcase challenges with blinding in the real-world settings. Um, although, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, although this particular trial was not designed to fulfill a regulatory decision, it does provide a really good example of the challenges related to blinding in routine care settings. Um, so uh, that presentation will be followed, followed by panelist comments and we'll hear um, some different ideas and perspectives on why we should or should not blind in these kinds of studies. Um, so now introducing our speakers um, as well as panelists, uh, Simon Skipstead is Director of Clinical Development and Outcomes Research at Novo Nordisk. Um, Rita Redberg, hi, Rita. Um, professor of Medicine, uh, University of uh, California at San Francisco. 
Um, Satrajit uh, Roy Chaudhry is Senior Director and Member of Statistical Research and Innovation Group at Pfizer. Nancy Dreyer is the Chief Scientific Officer and Senior Vice President at IQVIA. And uh, Peter Stein is the Director of the Office of New Drugs at Cedar FDA. Um, so with that, I'll open it to our opening presentation uh, from Simon. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it is truly exciting to be here. I think um, this workshop, uh, at least based on what I've heard um, this morning, um, has been extremely exciting. I've learned a lot, um, so I'm very honored to be here. My name is Simon Skipset. I'm a director for clinical development and outcomes research in Novo Nordisk. Um, and for the last couple of years, I've uh, focused on employing new trial designs into our organization, including uh, pragmatic trials or trials in a healthcare setting with a randomization component. And um, I would like to echo what has already been said. That is truly a, a team effort. It requires a lot of different stakeholders from various skill areas, data management, biostatistics, clinical operations, and so forth. Um, Luckily, that has uh, for us resulted in a couple of, uh, of initiated trials, uh, pragmatic trials in various settings and, and, um, and populations. One of those I will uh, showcase here for you today, the SEPRA trial. Hopefully that will make the discussion today a little bit more concrete, and I'm sure it will be a lively discussion. So before I go into the details of the SEPRA trial, I will just briefly touch upon um, our considerations for why we wanted to go into to, to, um, to this, uh, this trial concept and, and uh, why we believe it's important. Then I will uh, go through the specific trial design aspects of the SEPRA trial. And uh, after that, zooming a little bit in on the blinding aspects of this trial. And lastly, sort of trying to, um, to um, uh, further elaborate on why we, we, we made the decisions that we, we did. Now, one of the reasons for, for doing uh, a trial uh, with a randomization component in a real-world healthcare setting was genuinely because we wanted to understand how our drug worked once it is on the market and once it's being used in the setting and in the population in which it's intended to be used. So truly to understand the effectiveness of, of a drug. In this specific example, it's um, a once-weekly GLP-1 receptor agonist called semaglutide sub-Q for the treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes. And, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to um, uh, assess the effectiveness of such a drug in an externally valid setting of a specific U.S. healthcare system, um, making it as real world as possible, but at the same time maintaining a, a high internal validity, uh, validity that we know from a, a randomized uh, clinical trial. Uh, furthermore, uh, in this setting, uh, we uh, are able to assess more novel endpoints that we don't traditionally look into in our explanatory ICTs, uh, uh, pharmacy patterns, uh, healthcare resource utilization, and so forth. So uh, in many ways, uh, these kind of trials make, make sense uh, to us from an organizational standpoint. Now, the SEPRA trial, before we uh, uh, started the trial, we sat down and looked each other in the eyes and agreed on what kind of key components should be part of this trial. Obviously, we wanted to have a randomization component. Um, to ensure that there was a high internal validity, but we also wanted to increase the external validity as much as possible. And that goes both with regards to the population. We have a very broad uh, eligibility criteria uh, uh, list that I will show you later. Uh, but also in the terms of the setting, we're doing this trial in the patient's own healthcare setting, trying to mimic the real world as, as much as possible. In terms of comparator, uh, we have standard of care as a comparator, which means any other drug for the treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, we did not believe that placebo would be uh, relevant in, in a real-world trial. That's certainly not what the patients go up against uh, in, in the real world. Furthermore, we didn't believe that it would make sense to um, go up against one single drug. Uh, out there in the real world, when you want to assess the value of a drug, it's against what's already out there. Um, so that was, that was one of the decisions for that. I'm sure we'll get back to that discussion later. Uh, furthermore, we wanted to um, uh, have as little intervention as possible. Uh, in Europe, we call these trials low interventional trials. Uh, and and we, we were able to do that because we're, we're partnering with, uh, with APEA, uh, so we can utilize their IT infrastructure. We get readily access to their claims data. Um, and as uh, you will see later in the trial design slide, we have very few trial visits uh, and few assessments. Normally in our standard explanatory ICTs, data collection and monitoring are much more important than 
usual care. Here we wanted data collection and monitoring to reflect usual care as much as, as possible. And then lastly, as has already been alluded to, this is, this is not a trial for regulatory purposes. We made that, uh, we agreed to that upfront uh, for a variety of reasons, um, but I think for the purpose of this workshop, uh, we, can, we can certainly discuss it and, and how this looks from a regulatory perspective. Now, the rationale of the trial, we, want, um, we did this trial to inform clinical practice on the comparative effectiveness of semaglutide sub-Q versus standard of care in a real-world setting in adult patients with uh, type 2 diabetes. And, and what we wanted to do was to investigate this long-term comparative effectiveness uh, on a variety of uh, parameters related to glycemic control, body weight, healthcare resource utilization, and actually the list goes on. This is just a selected uh, list. Uh, but, but for us, the, one of the key things was to, to assess glycemic controlled body weight and healthcare resource utilization in, in a real world setting. So now I'm going to show you the design slide. We have very few inclusion criteria. Uh, patients need to be adult, uh, have type 2 diabetes, and then they need to be inadequately controlled on up to two uh, oral anti-diabetic drugs. Uh, please note that there are no HbA1c cr criteria cutoff or BMI cutoff. Inadequately controlled is defined by the healthcare professional, as it would be in, in a real-world setting. If the patient decides to participate, they will be randomized to either semaglutide sub-Q once weekly or standard of care. And standard of care can mean anything, also other GLP-1 receptor agonists, insulins, SGLT2s, anything except for semaglutide sub-Q. Um, and I hope you can appreciate uh, the fairly low interventional setup. We have a total of three visits in a two-year period, a randomization uh, visit, a one-year visit, and a two-year visit. Since we're doing this trial uh, in the patient's own healthcare uh, setting, a lot of these patients will come in more than that, and we'll capture that as well, but we only have three protocol-mandated uh, visits. Furthermore, as I've alluded to, we also uh, here in this trial have the capability to um, uh, collect um, other kinds of data, including claims data. Now, treatment can be adjusted according to local clinical practice. Uh, switch to, add-on, or discontinuation of anti-diabetic treatment is permitted, as it would be in a real-world setting. The only thing that we do not allow uh, in the protocol is to switch from standard of care to semaglutide sub-Q, as semaglutide is, is the drug that we are investigating. It is a US-only trial. Uh, it's what we would call a phase four trial. It's not for regulatory purposes. It is open label. I'll get back to that uh, in a minute. And we're doing this uh, in collaboration with our partner. And, and within this partner network, it's obviously multi-center across the, the U.S. Now, we have a, a, a long list of endpoints. I'm just um, showing you a selected a list. The primary endpoint is proportion of subjects reaching a specific A1C target at year one. Uh, other selected effectiveness endpoints that I'm sharing with you today is individualized HbA1c targets, healthcare resource utilization, work productivity, medication persistence and, and adherence, as well as number of hypoglycemic episodes leading to um, an inpatient hospitalization or emergency room encounter. Now, the binding setup for the SEPA trial, it's an open label uh, trial. Uh, both the physicians and the patients uh, know what drug they're on. Uh, an important point to make is that all the drugs that we investigate in this trial are all approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. They are on the market. Um, and in order to mimic the real world as much as possible, once a patient is randomized, let's say they're randomized to semaglutide, then they will receive a prescription for semaglutide from their doctor and they will go to their own usual pharmacy to pick up the drug, as they would in, in a real world setting. Another aspect that we've done is that uh, we do realize that there are um, dif differential out-of-pocket costs depending on what kind of a drug you're on. There are various ways you can handle that. You can decide to pay for the drug completely as we do in our normal trials. You could argue that's not very real world. The other uh, end of the spectrum could be to say you do not do anything, you don't pay. The issue with that is due to the ever so complex healthcare system in the US. Uh, where drugs go on and off uh, formal area, we could end up uh, studying the U.S. healthcare system rather than the drug. So what we have uh, done is that we have uh, used to set a max out-of-pocket cost of, of about $40, I believe, and anything above that we will cover. So there is a uh, an, an element of out-of-pocket cost, uh, again, to mimic uh, the real world. Uh, Novo Nordisk personnel is blinded until DBL, uh, database lock. Uh, we have a thorough uh, 
extensive randomization and blinding plan as well as a statistical analysis plan with the predefined uh, endpoints. All of these were developed and signed off on before first patient first visit. Uh, so we have, uh, we have sort of that uh, documented and, and the, the trial team as such are blinded. Now why did we do it like this? Um, uh, we have uh, after my presentation about an hour to, to discuss how to go about this. As, as I see it, there are two key aspects. There are scientific aspects uh, to, to why we did it the way we did it, and there are operational aspects. In terms of the scientific aspects, if we were to introduce blinding, obviously we would compromise the level of pragmatism since blinding is not really real world. Uh, we would deviate from usual clinical practice and we would uh, sort of uh, move away from the uh, original intent of the study, which is to assess how this drug works in, in a real world setting. Uh, furthermore, the majority of our endpoints are objective. They are uh, blood tests, uh, glycemic markers, HbA1c and others. We do have a couple of PROs as well, but for the majority they are uh, what I would call objective endpoints, uh, uh, lab tests. And lastly, I guess that's probably more of a philosophical notion, but if you truly want to assess the effectiveness of a drug, you really want to um, Tinkle as, tinkle, tinkle as little as possible with, with, the, with the setup, and, and the more you sort of measures you employ in a trial, the, the more you risk changing the behavior of, of, of the patient, and we really didn't want to change the behavior of, a, of, of the patient as much as possible. I realize that we have a randomization component, so that is fairly interventional, but other than that, we really wanted it to be uh, um, as low interventional as, as possible. Then there are obviously the operational aspects since the comparator is standard of care and uh, you just saw in one of the previous presentations the, uh, the many different treatment, treatment options for type 2 diabetes. Uh, I'm not sure it's even operationally possible to blind when you have 50 plus drugs out there. Some of them are oral, some of them are injectable. So from an operational standpoint, I think that would be a nightmare um, and probably in, impossible. Um, we're using the uh, United States package insert as the reference safety information. We don't, as such, has, have trial product labeling as we do in our normal trials. Uh, the trial uh, label, as such, is, is what is being used. And as I mentioned, the patient will, will use their own pharmacy um, uh, to mimic the, the real world as possible. So with that, I want to thank you, and I just want to end uh, by saying that, uh, and I'm sure we'll spend the next 60 minutes discussing this, obviously it is important to, to realize that we want to have as high internal validity as possible, uh, but we want to uh, make sure that we don't go so much overboard that we uh, risk the external validity and thereby moving away from the original intent of the trial. So that balancing act, I'm sure we will discuss for the next uh, 60 minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Simon. So we'll turn to our first reactor, um, um, uh, Rita. Thanks. First, I'll just comment my informal index of gender disparities in a field is if I have to wait online at the ladies' room, but that's why it was a little, it doesn't happen at the cardiology meetings, so I'll just say. I'm always on time after the break. Um, so I'm going to talk about key considerations for blinding and randomized real-world studies and just sort of build on um, some of the things we've been hearing today. I'm a professor at UCSF and editor of JAMA Internal Medicine. So, and I'm going to talk a lot about medical devices because it's my um, particular interest. And I do think the considerations for blinding are a little different when we think about it for drugs and devices. Because as Simon was noting, you know, you can blind a drug study and you don't have to have a placebo control because you can have standard of care if as long as it's two pills, people can still be blinded. But that doesn't happen for a device study because people don't get placebo devices. And so you really do have to think about it and do a randomized control trial if you want to um, have a placebo control in device studies. And I want to spend a few minutes telling you why I think it's really important to have placebo control and I'm using the term placebo and not sham because I think sham has this negative connotation of something that is like we're fooling people and where placebo is what we generally accept. And I think of placebo for devices the same way I think about placebo for drugs. And in fact, placebo effect 
is even more powerful for devices because for procedures, you know, because I think because it's a little more invasive, people get a much bigger placebo effect from a procedure or device than they do from taking a drug, although there are powerful effects in both cases. And so while clearly real world evidence has a big role in filling in a lot of information that we've been talking about this morning, I think that first um, the, actual, the safety and effectiveness has to be established in a well done high quality randomized controlled trial before we can move on to, to everything we can learn from adding real world evidence and getting subpopulations and much bigger populations. Um, and so that's why I think that um, as FDA approval, I think most people assume should assure safety and effectiveness, although um, when uh, Sanket Druva, who's sitting right there in the audience, and I like 10 years ago more, started looking at the quality of evidence for medical device approvals for high-risk cardiovascular devices, we were surprised to learn that actually randomized clinical trials are not the norm or, and are actually done in only a small minority of high-risk devices before they get on the market. And of course, you know, there are a lot of different considerations. Devices, if you find out they're not safe, or they're ineffective, they can't easily be removed because generally we're talking about implantable devices and that's risky to remove. Also, you know, there's a move now, um, once FDA approves a device, to have immediate CMS coverage. And once CMS covers, then private insurers tend to cover, and then there, it's very hard to do a randomized trial because there's frankly no incentive. What, Colleagues, for example, who were trying to randomize for a trial of the left atrial occluder device, um, which was going to be a randomized trial but was already getting insurance coverage, they said, investigator, doctor said, why should I randomize when I get, can get paid for every device I put in? So it can be very difficult once coverage becomes an um, established and culture and practice becomes established to then go back and do a randomized trial. Although I'm going to give one prominent example in a few minutes. And so uh, Rob Califf, um, sometimes at Duke, I think, and now at Google in uh, the Bay Area, but when he was FDA commissioner was asked whether sham controls should be required for device approval and he said basically, well, do you want to get the truth or not? And I think that sums it up pretty well. You know, if you want to know whether the device works or whether you're getting a placebo effect, you have to have a placebo um, arm of the trial. So this was the example I referred to a, few, a moment ago of how after 30 years of percutaneous coronary intervention, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with in this, you know, it's uh, stents that we can put inside an arter a coronary artery where there's a narrowing or a blockage in order to uh, widen the artery. And so it actually um, have been around for 30, 40 years. If you go back and look at the original FDA approval for the first percutaneous intervention, um, there was no placebo control. There actually wasn't an active control that was a historical control of a very, in my opinion, mismatched group in a very small study. And as I'm sure everyone knows, we do millions and millions of stents um, every year around the world. And last year, or two years ago, a British group, because I don't think it would happen in the US, did a placebo-controlled study, the first one ever, of stents, where they actually um, took both groups to the cath lab. You had to have chest pain and a blockage in order to um, enter the study. And then both groups thought they got a stent, but only one group actually got a stent. And lo and behold, there were absolutely no difference. It was a negative trial. It was negative on every endpoint. There was no difference in angina, no difference in exercise time. The quality of life indicators were all the same. And so, you know, 40 years after we've started being certain that this idea of opening up the artery was going to be good, it turned out in a placebo-controlled trial that it actually wasn't beneficial. And so, well, some people say, well, they're concerned about the ethics of doing sham placebo procedures. What about the ethics of doing procedures on millions of people with all of the consequent adverse effects when the procedure is, is not actually any different than a placebo? Essentially, 
I would say, ineffective. Um, and you know, then you have a whole, a whole specialty established. People have been trained. I mean, I can just say briefly, the trial was not well received in the interventional community. <laughs> <laughs> Nor was um, my editorial that went with it called Last Nail in the Coffin for PCI. So um, where we called for, I wrote with a colleague, David Brown, and we called for a change in the guidelines at, uh, for implantation of stems based on the evidence. But that's why um, this was an uh, editorial sanket, and I wrote a few years ago in the New York Times around the, just before the century, the 21st Century Cures Act was passed. But I think that with the passage of that act, it makes it even more incumbent to be sure that we're getting good pre-market evidence. And what, to me, good pre-market evidence means blinded um, device trials because we're really shifting the burden to post-marketing in order to get faster approval of innovative devices. And I think it's great for innovative devices, but I don't know how you know a device is innovative unless you've actually done the study to show that it's safe, effective, and beneficial. Um, but unfortunately, post-approval so far I don't think has been all that we hoped it would be because the studies generally have a small sample size, um, they're generally not randomized, they're often a continuation of the pre-market study. Very few of them are actually completed and they take years to be completed. So we're not getting the data that we really need from post-market studies that we're going to be increasingly reliant on. And then finally, this was from the New York Times editors just a month ago, where I think for a number of reasons, uh, the problems with devices, I think the Netflix documentary, The Bleeding Edge, which maybe some of you have seen, um, talked about some of the problems with medical devices and lack of data before they get on the market. But the editorial just said 80,000 deaths, 2 million injuries, time for a reckoning on medical devices. So in um, my opinion, I think the blinding uh, is a really important part of trials before we go on to do the real world um, evidence yeah. gathering. Thank you. Oh, is that right? Is that right? Okay. So next we'll have um, uh, Nancy Dreyer, Chief Scientific Officer and Senior Vice President at IQVIA. I am next. Great. Before, I, before you get into the slides, uh, I, interesting example we've seen and certainly interesting comments about the value of placebos for evaluating whether something works. But I want to shift the focus to specifically blinding of treatment and thinking about real world evidence in the pragmatic trials. Because, so I'm not going to argue against placebos, but most real world trials compare the product of interest to whatever else patients could use. So the idea is they're often standard of care comparators. And what we want to talk about here is, you could say it's what's good enough for government, right? Now that used to be a, a pejorative statement, but I, I only mean it in the best way. And the, really the question comes down to how much measurement error is there going to be if we know what the treatments are and we have preconceptions, and would that be big enough to totally wash out any evidence of truth? So I'm going to use my time to share some examples that my colleagues and I worked up, and I'd like to acknowledge my collaborator, Cindy Gurman, in the audience who was uh, worked with me on this. But we started trying to classify, go back to the outcomes discussion that we were having before, Greg, if you don't mind my covering two topics. But the, the question, it's all about fit for purpose and what's your purpose, what's your outcome? So we start there. So what, what our group did is start to say, well, let's classify the outcomes and, and assume it's not a question of do you blind or not and is not blinding good enough, but what, what's the outcome here? So we started out, and I have two slides here where we tried to classify outcomes. And I think my first example row is probably the most arguable. It's emotional states or health reported by a patient. Now, most of us know that patients can be tremendously influenced by the perception of benefit. Is it an expensive product? Is it a fancy new device? Is it going to work? But I think one of the things you need to take into account here is the durability of effect. So for example, um, 
last time I talked about this in public, somebody showed me a, an article that shows that patients' perception of treatment could actually influence their HbA1c. But the question is how long? I mean, can you really believe, if you believe that this product is going to make you feel better and take away your pain, it might help you through a procedure. We've got some good evidence of that. But long-term chronic pain, I, I find it hard to believe that the power of positive thinking will carry you through. It, to me, the next analogy of that is, you know, um, if you believe you can cure your cancer. And we know that doesn't work. So I think that perceptions can be um, overblown, and we need, to, we need to think about where the potential for bias is. So here we state that the patient's report may be heavily influenced by their treatment. The clinician's less evident, and that's where we do have the tool of a central adjudication committee that you could use or you could have selective blinding if you needed to. But now let's move down the spectrum. Okay, now we have events or signs or outcomes reported by the clinician. Now, if it's something concrete and measurable, there, it's less likely to be influenced by bias. And I do think this is the potential for using a central adjudication committee. So, okay, doc, you've made your decisions. Now let's go send that to, a, to reviewers who are blinded as to the treatment. That's not so hard to do. And you can see based on your notes, without that information of treatment, what would they decide? So much less expensive, um, much allows you to be much more generalizable in terms of your site selection. And uh, Simon, I was so glad you mentioned the practical aspects of blinding and how it reduces your choice of sites and adds operational complexity. Then we were talking about event diaries, which is actually fairly popular. Um, it's, a, it's a good tool for finding out, you know, did you go to hospital? Could you go to work today? Um, how um, a number of events of things that patients can actually count. How many bleeds did you have between this and that and the other? And people are usually pretty reliable about reporting those events. If you give it something that they can understand, that a consumer can understand, they can tell you about it. And they don't know whether what they're reporting is better than the other arm. So I, I think that it's not clear that you have such a big effect that you could get a washout. Now, going down the spectrum, look at this list. So here we have a lot more objective tests and measurements. And I would offer to you that these are essentially blinded by the readers. So when I take, when I don't give my blood at the lab, they're not asking me about my treatments. They're going to take the blood, they're going to spin it and give you the results, and it's, it's essentially blinded already to treatment. You don't need to do something different. Now, we go back to the HbA1c argument, you know, did my belief actually change my lab value? And I've, I've put forth more, more my feelings that I don't think you're going to see those as durable for many endpoints which aren't so susceptible to just believing you're better and getting better. But the imaging, a lot of these issues, what you see here, um, physical tests and measurements, with the extent you, the message here is if you can get objective assessments, particularly ones that can be read by a machine or by a, a a different reader that doesn't know you or your symptoms, you should be able to get a pretty accurate answer to considering how reliable the test is. So I think that the questions we're going to be dealing with here are, um, you know, how, how wrong could this be? What's the potential impact of the bias? And we epidemiologists and statisticians have approaches for quantifying that. We can take you through a whole set of what-if examples of how much bias there would have to be to explain away an effect that you see. My, my last of two points <laughs> is I just wanted to say this is how all around the world people are starting to appreciate the value of these pragmatic trials. You know, we have, um, e we're here because of our regulatory interest of the FDA, but what we see in Europe is a great interest in big data and trying to harness that for a lot of the experiments that we've been talking about. And then we saw this latest guidance, draft guidance coming out of China, where they're talking about the importance of pra practical or pragmatic randomized trials. 
And they've already given the ground in their guidance that they don't expect to have, have blinding. So I think that the point they make about attention should be paid to estimating and adjusting the result of, of, you know, about the detection bias is where we're all going to end up. And this is a movement that you see going around the world. And my last thought I'd like to leave you with is after we settle this blinding issue or understand where it's really important and where it isn't going to make that big a difference, then let's move on to the intent to treat and the as used paradigm. Because what we heard from, from Bob Temple was if they're not taking the drug, it's not gonna work, right? The more practical your trials get, blinding or no blinding, you need to find out if people are actually using the product, how they're using it, because that's often the answer to why something works or doesn't work. Thank you for your time. Great. Um, thanks, Nancy. We'll go to Satraji. Thank you. I do not have any slides. I try to put my... Oh, here. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, Nancy is a very nice stage set up to look into um, basically the analysis aspect. So as a statistician, as my training is in statistics, uh, when I look into this blinding aspect, I try to look into its impact of overall study results. That's one of the key consideration as a statistician, I looked into it. And when we looked into such a thing, of course, as a statistician, I mean, we definitely encourage doing standardization or having blinding if possible. But of course, there are settings when it is not possible because it, it kills the whole pragmatism or whole the appeal of this real world evidence trial. So maybe the question is, can we think of alternatives as well in that setting? Maybe if we think about randomized real world study, we think about alternative randomization like cluster randomization. That's one of the choices where you may reduce this type of bias. Of course, it comes up with another challenge. When we bring into a different aspect of randomization, you need to have your sample size calculation appropriately matched to that. And that means you need to have some sort of intra-class correlation into the consideration of sample size calculation. So the question is, if we can't do the blinding, but if we still need something which is, a, which, which is, which is an evidence that we believe on, and that we, can we do something analytically to handle on that? But of course, not all the biases can, can be removed using analytical, analytical techniques. Uh, the, the other aspect that I, I try to bring in, because especially in recent days, people start to talk about uh, more than a, like an endpoint, they start to put a framework, especially ICH E9 guideline recently, they start to put a framework of S demand, which means you start to think about what are the quantity you are trying to estimate firstly. And I mean, here we are hearing what we call effectiveness. So can we quantify our quantity of interest in a way? And, and then maybe what was happening due to the blinding, what you bring in as a bias, or maybe there are some of the selection problems that coming in due to blinding, maybe thought about the intercurrent event. But of course, this, uh, we, are all on, we are only thinking in randomized settings so far in estimate setting, but I guess having that overall framework may be useful and, and worth a research on that dimension. Now, coming back to this, this problem of, once again, uh, the, the blinding aspect, right? One of the key blinding aspect uh, problems that I used to see often is, I, I mean, in some of the oncology trials that I handle on, is basically uh, the missing, the, the amount of missingness that we see. Uh, and, and the missingness often comes also with the, all the natural processing algorithms that we use. So it's very important how this, to, for, as a statistician, I feel when we do the trial with people, how this searching was done. Because often there is a gap that how this is, is, is this, because the word blinding, if you go into a clinical trial database, it's not always very evident from there. So one extra cautions are maybe useful in order to do that thing. So, and then the question comes in, can we somehow, and I'm sure gonna, in next session is gonna talk about more about it, and how to correct the bias. So basically, once we think about 
a, a data which we have maybe has an effect of knowing the treatment and, uh, and causal effects, it comes into a causal inference problem. And of course, the next session they're going to look into, some, they're going to definitely reflect on a techniques like propensity score marginal models, as well as the, the other techniques that has been advancedly came in, which how good that can work. But when this works to me in a design phase, when I start a trial, I need to make sure that I do have an adequate sample size in order to do such analysis. And one way to do that, for, from, from given the recent computational techniques, would be looking into maybe different scenarios and different extremes and see how my operating characteristics of a trial looks like, how much I stand the validity of the trial in a way, basically. And then definitely uh, looking into the missing value. I mean, one of the major problems that brings in the missing value here, because you have a subjective missing which is running in into this problem. And the issue is when you have subjective missing, uh, there definitely, uh, you cannot do a complete case analysis because that gives you a bias result more often. So it definitely needs much more uh, statistical techniques, in, as I mentioned, some of the causal inference techniques in place in order to make the inference valid. But, but before we make the, the analysis, I think it has to be started to be taken consideration at the design phase in order to handle that. So, so for me, yes, blinding as a statistician, I feel blinding is, is a very important aspect. But if that's absolutely not possible in, and that kills the whole appeal of a real uh, world data, the question is, what can we do analytically and how much we can do to at least get an evidence which is valid and can be used for, to, to see the effectiveness of the drug? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Satrajit. So we'll turn to uh, Peter Stein next. Great. Greg, if it's okay, I'm going to sure. sit here. You already said the lights were hot uh, up there. So yeah, yeah. that would make you sweat. Yeah, I will say that I have the pleasure of sharing a lot of stages with Nancy lately, so I always get to agree and disagree with her. So, this, so I'm, gonna, I'm not a statistician uh, as an acknowledgment. That's my acknowledgment, not a statistician. Um, but I'm, and I'm going to step back and take it from perhaps a bit more of a simplistic viewpoint. As I think about you know, what we are thinking about at the FE, what, what is our concern? Our concern is the believability, the robustness of the data. How believable is the result? That's what we're trying to get. And I look at randomization and blinding, really those are methods to achieve believability. That's what we're using them for, not because we have some requirement for those in statute or regulation. It's because we have those as ways that we can get data that's believable. Randomization is how we assure balance at the start of a study. And blinding is how we assure balance after a study is, is randomized. And if you think about it in that framework, then, and we're not going to talk about randomization today, that I think it's, it's great that we're having a discussion about how do we do randomized trials, because obviously we have had a lot of concerns about the ways we can draw causal inference without randomization. That's a whole other work stream and many other days of conferences. So we'll focus on, on, on blinding. And I will say that this is a bit of a broader issue, because, and this was brought up before, that not all trials can be blinded. And even trials in which we think we're blinding, blinding can be imperfect. So we still have to think about what the influences of unblinding, whether intentional because that's the design, or unintentional because you can't fully blind the, the medication. Uh, what are the influence, what are the outcomes on, on a trial? And that's what we really have to understand. At the end of the day, what we're really trying to do with all of these approaches is to isolate the effect of the drug from all of the other influences that can occur and can confound our ability to, to interpret the results of trials. Well, what are the ways that unblinding can influence, can cause us not to be able to have very clearly interpretable data? And we've heard about some of these already, so I'm not going to say anything that hasn't already been nicely outlined. Obviously, subjective endpoints are of concern. When patients know what they're on, their response to PROs or other such subjective endpoints, or even endpoints like walk tests, it can be very much influenced by their motivation and what they think the results should look like. They, they may well respond in ways that are not just due to the drug. I'm perhaps not as sanguine as Nancy is about these effects being transient, as I think they well could be sustained effects that people have when they understand what drug they're on and they have an expectation for the effect. Certainly, and it's not just what people think about in terms of their 
their, their thinking as it influences their response, but how they behave, their concomitant interventions, what they're taking, uh, what, their, what their diet is, what their activity is. Those are very much influenced by what they've been randomized to if they know what their treatment is. And those differences between the groups can certainly influence outcomes in some settings. In some trials, they may not have a strong influence. It certainly can influence continuation in trials. I mean, the most glaring example is when there's a, a big news story about a particular drug or new medical information that we know patients through social media here within minutes of a publication of the New England Journal or since Rita's here of JAMA Internal Medicine. We know that those can certainly influence behavior and the dropout rates can be dramatic. You may recall a trial with uh, one of the non relative to another where there was a story about one of the, these agents and I think within weeks, 40% of the trial, the patients in the trial had switched therapies. It was an unblinded trial. These kinds of things can have dramatic and devastating effects on our ability to make anything out, out of a trial when we can't protect the trial, the trial's integrity because of uh, the fact that it's, that it's unblinded. I'd also point out that reporting is very much an issue. We're not just looking at effectiveness, we're, we're interested in safety. And when a patient knows what they're on, their reporting, collection of information is going potentially to be different. We'd say, well, you know, we, we're talking about serious adverse events or hospitalizations. Yes, certain types of events will not be differentially collected. But in a real world trial, when there's very intermittent, um, intermittent visits for the patient, Will we collect all of that information? Our healthcare system, particularly in the US, can be somewhat fractionated. So are we sure that we're really actually collecting all of the information, even for serious events, when, we ha when the patient knows what they're on and may report differently uh, in one treatment group versus the, the other? So when can we think about unblinded trials? And again, to be practical, uh, we, we have to be able to accept unblinded trials or there, was, there would be certain drugs that simply couldn't be developed. So without question, we have to deal with unblinding, whether we do it in a real world setting or even in traditional settings. Well, certainly hard outpoints versus subjective outpoints can be very useful. As I pointed out, that may help in termination of the outpoint, of the endpoint, but it doesn't change the fact that concomitant behaviors and other influences can certainly have an effect on the response to the drug. Certainly when there's therapeutic e equipoise, if we're comparing two drugs where there's no expectation of a difference of response or safety, that can be a helpful circumstance where we expect patients and physicians not to behave particularly differently, and so there we might believe that the differences were simply the effect of the drug. Another situation could be where there's really no expectation of benefit. I was talking to someone a couple of years ago who was doing an unblinded trial of allopurinol versus um, versus no therapy in, uh, in looking at outcomes. And while there was a lot of prior data, there was really not much consensus or expectation of a difference of benefit. Perhaps there's a situation where we wouldn't necessarily expect differences in, in behavior in, in the treatment of patients with asymptomatic hyperuricemia. Where there's a large effect size, uh, we certainly might think that it won't be confounded by these behavioral changes or changes in the trial conduct continuation of patients within the trial, well, even that I think is a question. And I guess the where I would, I would come back to is, it really becomes, in my mind, an issue of the believability and the robustness of the data. And I think when you have unblinded trials intentionally or because the, 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 the drug has characteristics that will allow patients and physicians to be aware of what the patient is on, we have to think very carefully and, and very thoroughly about what differences can creep into the trial and in our interpretation really take those into account. We, we heard about adjusted analysis and doing sensitivity analysis. I would ask adjust for what, adjust how, and how much can you, uh, you know, when you're trying to, to take data that is not robust and adjust it to robustness, that's where I think we tend to get a little bit nervous. Uh, and I'm not saying that those aren't appropriate, but I think thinking ahead in the design and trying to minimize differences between groups becomes absolutely essential. But again, I think we do also have to be pragmatic here, uh, again, not with regard to trials, but just in general, um, about how we can analyze data. Uh, and, and so I think unblinded trials can be done. I think we, we would be accepting of those designs, but I think it really has to be very carefully considered and in very specific settings where these influences are not so imbalanced that we can't believe the response at the end of the day. Thank you.
Uh, thanks, Peter, and thanks to all of the uh, panelists for just a, a really good set of um, comments. And I think a lot of uh, strong themes came up. And um, uh, uh, I really appreciate, Rita, your sort of bringing up this power of the placebo effect. And that seems to be very strong. And I think some of the other presenters, and Simon, your study, and some of the other things that um, Nancy and, and, and Peter were talking about are um, not necessarily placebo-controlled studies, but uh, studies in which the intervention is being compared to usual care and have brought up what you know, I heard. Um, one thing that was consistent, I think, among was that this objectivity of the outcome matters. And if it's a more objective outcome, then, um, then you may not be as concerned. Or if you can't do a blinded study, if you have an objective outcome, that's somehow better than a more subjective outcome where, you know, obviously it depends on patient's perceptions. That seemed to be, um, but I'm going to turn it to all of you to see if I'm right, that seemed to be some, there, there seemed to be cons consistency among the panelists that the objectivity of the outcome matters. Um, I also heard this question of durability, and I, you know, I don't know if there's ever been any study to know if like this uh, effect of unblinding, this, um, you know, po power of positive thinking is related to durability of the effect, but Nancy, it made sense what you said, um, but uh, so I'll believe it. I don't know, but uh, um, I'll ask the rest of the panelists to weigh in on that. The objectivity of the outcome, how does that matter, and the durability of effect, and is that should that be looked at? Um, anybody want to jump in on that, Rita? Um, it's interesting you comment on that because I kind of went two ways on that point. Certainly, from a physician adjudication, you know, an objective outcome is much stronger. But from the patient point of view, I think Nancy and both Peter alluded to the fact that, you know, there's such a powerful mind-body interaction. And, you know, I think Nancy's example of how, you know, knowing what group you're in can influence your HbA1c, you know, the um, simplicity trial that studied renal denervation and the endpoint was blood pressure and then there was a placebo arm to the trial. Well, in the placebo, the blood pressure dropped, you know. So I feel, if, if a patient is unblinded to their, that it doesn't matter how objective the outcome is because it could just change their behavior and, and that mind-body interaction that we don't really understand, but we see it a lot. Yeah. And any other? Just uh, thinking about Rita's comment, I wonder if we're getting into the question of, of you know, what's a clinic clinically meaningful difference because we, we, we've been talking about real world outcomes and practical outcomes that matter to patients and to clinicians. And it's always puzzling on the patient side of saying, oh, your blood pressure went down, it went down, you know, four points. So I think we need to keep looking at these, at these endpoints and seeing how much of a difference and is that, is that something that people can interpret? Because it's, as a, we haven't talked much about the patient point of view. And the idea that you come to the doctor and, you know, Dr. Stein tells me, I don't really know, I could give you this or that, there's clinical equipoise. Well, that's not what I want to hear from my doctor. I want to hear, I know what's right for you. I realize that that's naive, but that's what you want. And then the idea that, and then this morning we saw a trial with a 20-year follow-up period. I mean, there are a lot of long-term questions we want. And the idea that and I know this is off point, but that we would spend that much money to um, make a small difference over time in a practical question, I'm not sure that that's worth it. Okay, um, so, the, so the other thing that didn't really come up in, um, you know, in this discussion so far as much is this question of, okay, so you have, you know, tr everything that we talked about kind of applies to traditional randomized controlled trials too, like this effect of blinding and, um, but, you know, specifically when we're in the, um, you know, the, the products are already on the market, so the intervention drug and the usual care, everything's already on the market. Um, we're collecting outcomes. They might be subjective or objective, but they're still outcomes that are coming and measured from real-world data sources. Does that by itself sort of have an impact on, oh, well, you really better blind in this situation versus you probably wouldn't have needed to? So does the, the independent effect of doing like a pragmatic real-world evidence study matter in terms of whether or not you blind? Or, so question to the panelists. 
because, okay, I'll just keep talking. Because I would say that, uh, um, Peter, uh, you went through um, a, a really good list of things, um, you know, related to, um, you know, unblinding, you know, hard end points, therapeutic equipoise, um, no expectation of benefit, large effect size. I mean, those would apply in the traditional uh, clinical trial or in the real world evidence world of things. So is there, is there an issue with, with that? Yeah, I'll even answer your prior question yeah. and then get to that one. Uh, you know, I think the question in, it, c clearly there's a lot of potential value in being able to use real world data in randomized trials. And I think, you know, we'll have a lot more discussion about how that might be done and the ways that we can make this as robust as possible. Um, you know, and, and, and the practical issue is that in, in trying to use real world settings, blinding can be very challenging. I know we'll have more discussions about that, but it obviously adds a lot of cost. It makes it, it potentially um, un infeasible for certain sites to, to even have appropriate control of drug that would allow for a blinded trial. So there are real issues there. I think, again, that's where one has to step back and really think about what the influence w would be if you have an unblinded trial and what kind of data that you're collecting. If we're talking about hard outcomes, so a trial looking at, a, for example, a CV outcome um, endpoints for looking at myocardial infarction or if you have the appropriate ability to pull in data looking at cardiovascular or, or all-cause mortality uh, and stroke, so hard, hard endpoints, there may be ways that that could be a, a, a very robust uh, set of outcomes. Again, you do have to try to work hard to assure that you're not going to get markedly differential treatment because of the unblinded nature of the trial, but I think there are many inter in interventions where that certainly can be done. I mentioned the issue of an allopurinol in, in asymptomatic hyperuricemic patients where there's not really an expectation of differential behavior. People aren't going to run out and try to, to take uh, a, a, an, an uric acid lowering drug necessarily. A large trial, for example, in the VA looking at uh, hydrochlorothiazide versus chlorothalidone where there's not expectations that there'd be a, a difference in the response. One would then think those kinds of different differential comparisons would probably be pretty robust and resistant to the influences of a lack of blinding. But I think in each instance, you really have to think about what the, what the impact of blinding or not blinding is on, on the outcome and whether behavioral changes and persistence on therapy, which can be impacted by a lack of blinding, how those will impact the outcome. Will it, won't it, if it doesn't, if we can really believe that it doesn't affect it and have evidence of that, then I think that it, it makes the, the results much more believable. Um, so I have one more question before we get to the panelists and something that we haven't talked about yet But I do want to push a little bit on this because it has come up in other Forums with regard more more it comes up more often in the observational real-world evidence stuff, but it's this uh, blinding of the analyst um, So so far we've been talking about blinding of uh, treatment assignment now the question is um, regardless of that um, for the actual analyst who's, who's using, and even if you have a randomized study, you're collecting real-world data, your, your outcome might be measured through real-world data sources, and so you have the analyst who's collecting that data and coding it and all of that stuff. Um, should that analyst be blinded to the, um, uh, the, the sort of the treatment group when they're looking at those uh, particular outcomes? So maybe, Satrajit, I'll, I'll turn it to you since you focused in on the statistical perspective. So. So yes, from my perspective, the analyst, because he will be analyzing the data, so he need to be blinded in order to have any, any, any kind of a bias to bring into the analysis aspect. So I think that if you think about a, 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 our evidence, which is solid, I think uh, blinding of an analyst is very important to me. Any other, okay. Can Nancy. I add to that? You know, we, well, we heard a Saturday speak who works for a pharmaceutical company, and I think we could assume that the or the assumption is that the analyst has a stake in the outcome, in the end point, right? And that they want to show that their treatment is better than another one. Um, I work for a for a clinical research organization, and you could argue that our our statisticians, you know, want to protect the sponsor. But you can get very convoluted in those arguments. And my close to 40 years' experience is the analysts, they just want to follow the statistical analysis plan. They're not invested in the results. So the question of whether it's an independent analyst or not, and I have no objection to the blinding. I just haven't ever yet seen something where when you have no economic interest in the outcome of a study, whether you go to that that if you have a, a statistical analysis plan that you agreed at the outset, you just execute it. 
I, I would just add that we had some, I think, very interesting presentations earlier about the role of adjudication. I think for very common events, uh, I think we heard some pretty convincing evidence that adjudication may not always be necessary. It may enhance precision, but not outcome. I, I do remind you, I think there's been data for many decades that what we consider to be a very objective endpoints um, are very much influenced by the reader's perception of what the disease is. So when you, for example, um, put a diagnosis code for a radiologist reading an MRI, it influences the results of the MRI. That's a hard, objective endpoint. Uh, I'd say adjudication, we've all seen the adjudication packages that come through for CD outcome trials. Many of them are black and white and some of them are gray. And, uh, and I think there is clearly a risk that uh, an unblinded reader will, will read something in a way that's different than a blinded reader. And I think, again, if you are talking about a very large set of events, um, you, you know, it may be a more sensible decision simply not to adjudicate than to adjudicate in, in a, an open label sort of way. Uh, if we're talking about rarer events, I think, I think that blinding the adjudicator is absolutely essential. Satraji, did you have one more sure. comment? Uh, yeah, and, and I, I mean, uh, definitely, I, I hear what Tansa was mentioning, but I think it's, it's still, I mean, if, if it's still very important because we're talking about often confirmatory evidences. So it's very important to keep the integrity and the practice, and especially also when interim analysis comes in. Sometimes we have seen that, right, in this setting. And I think it's as much possible if we keep that into, I think that the belief and the robustness of the data would, uh, would be more uh, applicable. To appealing to people. Great. Um, so we're going to go ahead and turn to our audience uh, for uh, Q uh, questions and comments at either of the microphones. Would Jesse, if you go over there, you might get called on sooner. Because um, uh, I go back and forth. <laughs> uh, Ellis, uh, do you want? Hi, I'm Ellis Unger from uh, Office of Drug Evaluation One, Office of New Drugs, FDA, in the government. Um, the um, I want I want to make a comment. I want to direct it to Nancy. So um, we were talking about objective and subjective endpoints, hard endpoints, softer endpoints, and, and you made the point that if, if you have persistence of effect in a subjective endpoint, it's probably not expect, you call it placebo effect, I call it expectation bias, because it persists. But there is a great example of a, of a situation that not many people know about, so I'm gonna explain it, um, where this was shown to be uh, problematic. So back in the mid-1990s, we were, in the cardiology community, we were searching for ways to help patients with intractable angina who weren't candidates for bypass or, or PCI. And out came this great idea of transmyocardial uh, laser revascularization. So you did a thoracotomy, you took a laser, and you burned several dozen holes through the heart with a laser with the idea that this was actually done. <laughs> People are aghast. Um, um, and the blood would percolate you know, through the myocardium from the inside to the outside and angiogenesis would occur and new blood vessels would form. This, was, this device was clear, or these devices were clear. Um, and patients got remarkable improvement in their angina. I mean remarkable, a couple of functional classes. And the cardiovascular community said, well, I don't know if this works. Or it's, there's clearly expectation bias here because people are definitely doing better, but I can't believe anything other than expectation bias. But it turned out that when you look long term, these patients got benefit past a year. And everybody said, okay, well, it can't be expectation bias, along with what you said, Nancy, because how could you possibly get such prolonged improvement? And then the, it was possible, it became possible to do this with a sham control, because the catheter, catheters were developed that would deliver the laser energy from inside the heart. So you could take a person to a cath lab, do the laser from inside, and do a sham procedure. And Marty Leon directed such a study called the DIRECT study, and there was absolutely no difference in angina relief. There were way more uh, adverse events with laser than without. But it, it was, it, it's worth thinking about that example, because most people, I think, would agree with you. I, I would have agreed with you 20 years ago, but the DIRECT trial kind of, you know, throws some cold water on that. Well, certainly a good example of the power of positive thinking and the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all about, you know, uh, uh, context-specific issues. And, and your point, I think, speaks to the fact that we don't know what we don't know. And that's true, but the 
it's quite an unusual story. Yeah, I, I think my, my own view is the more desperate the patient and the more gee whiz the procedure, the stronger the expectation bias. You've got cells, genes, lasers, <laughs> maybe throw in some artificial intelligence. <laughs> you will, you'll get your expectation. Yeah, bias. thank yeah. you. Want that. And then when you do a thoracotomy, people really want it to work because they invested. So you're oh. arguing for placebo controls. Oh, yeah, yeah. I won't call yeah. it a sham. I would call it a sham. Yeah. Can I also just make the comment, I think it's important to highlight that I don't believe these pragmatic trials should be seen in isolation. I mean, these, these are not to replace explanatory ICTs as I see, these are to complement. So I don't think we're talking about replacing uh, explanatory RCTs. Um, but if, if you have explanatory RCTs and you do some pragmatic uh, trials or trials in a healthcare setting with a randomization component and you see similar results, I would argue that's, that's fairly convincing. Uh, Jesse? And, and you're alternating sequence I, I, yeah. here. Yeah, thanks for the advice. Yeah. I got more steps. <laughs> I, I knew what was going to happen. Johnson. So, yeah, Jesse Brill, <laughs> Jesse Brill, Johnson & Johnson. Um, so as long as we're telling stories, and I wish I had a publication to cite, uh, but uh, one of the people on my doctoral committee was Tom Chalmers, who's kind of one of, one of the fathers of the modern clinical trial. And he told a story, which they never published, that they did a study where they took a bunch of statisticians, they generated data which, which were null, so no difference between the treatment groups. They gave half the statisticians, they said, group A is active, group B is control, and the other half, they switched the roles. And there was a tendency to find in favor of the active treatment, no matter which one they called the active treatment, when in truth there was no difference between the groups. So there it, there's, it's anecdotal evidence, but uh, go ahead. analysis plans. Yeah. Uh, Cindy Gurman from Syrups Consulting. Um, uh, thank you for the panel for some, some really uh, thought-provoking comments. Um, I, I think, to me, it, it, it all comes down to uh, uh, the research question that we're trying to address, and I think we heard that this morning as well, um, in, the, in the fact that, uh, to me, there is no one size fits all. You either blind everybody triple blinded or you don't blind at all. Um, there's a lot of middle ground in between. Um, there's a lot of ways to blind and reduce bias without having that triple blinded um, clinical trial. And if we're trying to answer a question in the real world setting, um, you know, does this drug work versus standard of care or whatever, um, if you go into a physician's office, they're gonna give you a prescription. They're not gonna blind you to that prescription. Uh, so if your behavior changes, you know, it's gonna change in the real world, right? So if we're trying to address a real world question, it seems like we should try to address a real world question. Um, and I, I, I would say, uh, just to, to echo something that Nancy said as well, um, there are ways to use quantitative bias analysis and other types of analyses. I know, Peter, you said, can't really make it robust if it's not robust, but um, there are ways to estimate the bias. And I think we should be thinking about, will it change the results? Do you have a large enough effect size and a large enough sample size to where it wouldn't change the results one way or the other? And if it wouldn't, we probably don't need to blind. It is expensive, it is costly and, and com complex. Um, if it will, if you have a small enough um, uh, effect size, you know, maybe you should blind or uh, maybe you should be thinking about a different design. Thank you. And I could just, uh, a couple of comments, Cindy. I mean, I, I think you raise a very fair point and sometimes our trials are designed to try to figure out what is happening in a real world setting that may be different from a regulatory, um, a regulatory decision that needs to be made. Uh, I think in the context though, we have to recognize that the interaction in a, in a physician's office and how a patient is interacting with a physician is very different from the setting in a clinical trial in many ways in terms of what we're trying to, to achieve. And the influence the physician has can be very beneficial. That interaction, both the medication and the interaction we know has a beneficial effect. The question is, is it going to be a differential effect when you're having a trial and will that effect be more in one arm than it is in the other? That's the problem, not so much the issue of whether or not there is such an effect and whether it's important in the clinical paradigm where it is important. Um, and so I, I don't disagree with you. In the clinical setting, that's part of the therapeutic 
the therapeutic benefit is, the, is that interaction with the patient. But when we're trying to answer a question, we want to isolate the effect of the drug and from the therapeutic, that, that therapeutic interaction. Um, a, a, unless that's the question that you're asking, and sometimes it is, and sometimes that can be quite, quite relevant. Uh, Bob? I guess one observation is that most effect sizes are small. That's too bad, but that's usually true. Um, I have a word complaint. Uh, these trials are all being described as uh, drug versus standard of care. That is incorrect. Uh, the patients in both groups are getting standard of care, and you're adding a drug to one of them and comparing it with no addition. It's not placebo controlled because you haven't used placebo, but these are not comparisons with standard of care. These are everybody on standard of care uh, with and without drug. So it's drug versus no drug. Not standard of care. Well, wait, wait, no. wait, hold on for a sec. Um, you say that so glibly. My understanding in what we see in the pragmatic trials is you assign, uh, treat, you have a uh, condition of, of clinical equipoise or treatment equipoise, and you assign a treatment, and then you, the patient either gets that treatment, and I agree that standard of care is a bit of a misnomer, because there's no standard. It's just whatever the doctor would have prescribed otherwise. Aren't the people getting the new drug also on the standard of care? They are. I'll, it, bet, they it, are, I'll bet they are in this one. They're so, not getting an experimental drug, or, or a, the, they're not the focus of the question. You, in, most, in most of these kinds of things, you're adding either a drug or no drug to the standard of yeah. care. And so gets so in this specific care. separate trial, uh, eligible patients are patients who are in need for further intensification. So if they decide to participate, they will be randomized to either semaglutide or something else. So they will add something else. And in that's what we call standard of care. So new so, drug versus a new treatment. You know, uh, so in that one, if they didn't get liraglutide, they got something in addition. They could get liraglutide if they wanted that, yeah, in the standard of care. Uh, any other drug than semaglutide. So, so they are, both arms are escalating, you could say. I see. So why do you expect to see a difference? Um, that's I mean, suppose, a, suppose the, the uh, <coughs> one group gets randomized to uh, liraglutide or takes liraglutide, then you won't see a difference? We believe so based on the effect size of semaglutide. I see. Well, in, in a lot of these things, it is drug added to standard of care versus standard of care alone. There's no placebo, but that's what it would be in a placebo control trial. This is just a no treatment trial. Um, I had one other question. I, didn't, I came a few minutes late, so I might have missed it. But what was the purpose of SEPTRA to do? You already knew that the drug affects glycemic control. <coughs> was it to look at these other things like health resources? And I, I don't quite understand yeah, the so, so, of the so when you already knew what it did. We, we know the effect of, of uh, semaglutide when you study it in a highly controlled, somewhat artificial setting uh, where, where a drug is provided uh, for free and you have frequent trial visits. Um, it's back to why we wanted to do this trial. We wanted to see how this drug fares in terms of true effectiveness when you introduce it into a setting in which it's intended to be used when it's on the market. That's one uh, uh, answer. The other answer is that in this trial concept, uh, we are able to look into other novel endpoints, uh, healthcare resource utilization, adherence persistence, when you don't get the drug for free. Uh, so stuff like that. Um, so that was the key uh, to, you could say, objectives uh, for, for doing this trial. Okay, but you're only going to see a benefit if the effect in the treated group is different from the other one. So the other ones better not take something that works just as well, or you can't possibly see a difference. That's the real world, right? <laughs> I know it's the real world, and but you already risk. know yeah. the answer to that. Yeah. If somebody, if, if you compare one drug with another drug with the same effect, you're not going to see a difference. Duh. So, we, we, <laughs> but they, they are taking a different drug, right? Um, so, and, and you can say, I would argue we don't know. That's why we're doing the trial. Um, nobody has done this before. So it's really to compare semaglutide with anything else? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Adrian? All right, it's always good to hear Bob being continuously optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, this actually, uh, Nancy kind of touched on this a little bit, but I want to get the question out there in terms of the value of information here. And so maybe specifically for Simon or Nancy, like in terms of, uh, we talk about blinding as like, you know, it's actually simple. Like we have infinite resources, et cetera, 
and uh, it seems like that's not necessarily the case. So, uh, can you um, describe what 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 is actually the level of cost difference between what you did in designing Sepra versus if you had done the same objectives and had it blinded in terms of either total cost change or time? Because I think that's one of the key questions that comes up. In a perfect world without any limits on resources, sure, this would be terrific, but it does limit how many other questions we can answer. And then also in the context, you know, um, certain blinding may be really important in early development, but later in life cycle, uh, the safety profile is pretty well established. And so like, you know, it's kind of chewing on the end. So I don't know, Simon, what would be the, the cost? Did you guys ever think about that? We didn't think about that. That was, that was not the deciding factor, actually. Um, I'm sure it would be much more costly. Like, uh, uh, could you give uh, up, yeah, uh, I maybe, guess, like, maybe, I mean, I can 10%, help. Yeah. 20%? Well, let, let, me, let me give yeah. Simon a hand here, if you don't mind. Um, I work on the CRO side. We do this question yeah. all the time. And people come to us uh, late. I, I'm glad you brought up the point about label expansion versus new approval, because yeah. I think that's an important part of the context. You have a lot more information. It, it, it influences your tolerance for risk. But what we see is when uh, clients come to us and say, I want to do what I call a classical um, double-blind randomized control trial, and then they see the price and they go, oh, well, what else can we do and how can you make it real world? What we've seen time and again is the cost is roughly half. Half. So it's a big number, and that's not doing any fancy adaptable stuff. Right. With you know, That's the classical. Still, they come to the site, they get the treatment, they come to the site for all the follow-up. So I think, I think the cost implications are large, and it's a half or less. I, I think there's also a generalizability point that we've talked about a little bit in here. And the sites that you go to who can store drug, monitor drug, account for the drug supply, have the staff for that heavy infrastructure are not, I think what you see and I'm guessing, but what you see that for the benefits of the treatment in such a high, such a fancy setting with so much equipment and skills and monitoring is different than when you go to the community center. And we're, a lot of the questions we're asking about comparative effectiveness is, is how does it work for the rest of us, for the complex patients and the patients who don't go to the big, big centers. So I think you lose generalizability and it certainly costs a lot more. Not it's the answer for everything. But it is the answer for I mean, some. It's, it's cost and time. And, and just to underscore that kind of generalizability, like at Duke, if it's a blinded study, like for where the people have to go to get the investigational drug, it's literally in a basement in another building away from the hospital. Okay. If it's open, uh, then it can actually be done right there. And so in certain settings, that could be uh, really important. It actually speeds everything up. No. Can I just make a probably a somewhat controversial comment? Um, this issue of generalizability, I, I think that one of the things that's worth studying is this issue of generalizability. There's a sort of understanding, I think, in the community that uh, randomized clinical trials that are traditional somehow are artifice, artificial, and the random, real world trials are the real world. That's the accurate answer in terms of what you'll see in practice. I'm not sure there's much evidence that that, that or is robust that actually speaks to that. Traditional randomized clinical trials, I think, can be very costly, difficult to do, and I think the advantage of real-world trials is they can be larger, they can be much less costly as long as they're sufficiently robust to get an answer. But the idea that, that traditional trials don't give you the right answer, that it's an inaccurate answer because it's not generalizable, I would push back on that. I think the evidence that it's not correct is, is limited. And I think the biggest difference that I've seen when they've been compared is adherence. And I think that is an important point. That can be a relatively important thing to investigate. Differences in adherence, for example, for a subcutaneous or the advantage of a monthly versus a daily. Those are relevant questions to ask. Those are different questions than does the drug work. One thing that Bob said earlier, which I think is an important point, if you don't take the drug, it doesn't work. That is evident, but that is the biggest influence when you go to a real world setting. Now, does it not work in renal failure patients or in patients with cirrhosis or in patients with different stages of disease? Those are issues that should be examined very carefully, 
But I just want to point out that, generally speaking, I think the traditional trials do give you an answer that is, in fact, generalizable. I think there's little evidence that traditional trials, in fact, are, you know, are, are inaccurate in assessing. They have great internal validity, but poor external validity. I think that's a research question which has not been addressed. I think it's worth addressing. But I think right now it's more of a hypothesis. And I, I'm afraid to say that I think in this community it's more than a hypothesis. It's almost an assumption and a, uh, an unproven accepted fact. I, I think I would challenge the community to say, if you really believe real world evidence trials that are properly conducted will give you a different answer other than through adherence, I think it should be studied rather than just simply perpetuated because I think uh, it's not well demonstrated. I, I would agree with that assertion. I told that you that it, I'd uh, be con controversial. It, it, so it's unknown in terms of like, certainly you know the uh, um, efficacy trials, they generate a robust answer and so it's very clear what that answer is. There are definitely questions in terms of other populations. So if you just look at baseline, uh, typically patients who were treating are older or different in comorbidities. And so there are different yeah. things that we just don't know. Sure. If and when you look at subgroup, uh, if you look at the forest plot subgroup by age, renal function, all of the things that are typical in large outcome trials, they look by a subgroup. I would, I would ask you to look at those carefully because generally speaking, although not always, the subgroup influences are relatively modest and the best, the best estimate of the overall treatment size is the overall effect in the, in, the, in the population. And other than random variations, we don't tend to see huge effects. Now, there are clearly substantial and important exceptions to that. Drugs that are, that are for example, taking SGLT2 inhibitor, of course, we understand that its, its effect is contingent upon adequate renal function. That's evident. I think we're, the, we're actually in agreement that we'd like to go from 2% of what we usually see in terms of get participation in trials to something more. So then it, it can be um, sure, because all the subgroups are typically too small to actually address those questions. So sure. doing larger trials, I mean, what Warren said this morning. Okay, um, so thanks. So, so that is all the time we have for this session. There will be a, um, an open comment period. Um, we're going to go to the next session. Uh, so actually, first there's going to be a break. Uh, then you're going to come back here at 3.05, because that's when we're going to start the, um, the, this next session. And then right after that, we'll have a comment period, too. Thanks for a terrific discussion on uh, the considerations here. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to get started. So. Um, let me ask just the final uh, uh, panelists to join me up on stage and uh, go ahead and make your way to your seats for this next session. Thank you. Oh, that was quick. Good. Thank you. Okay. In this last session, we're going to dive into um, a little bit. We're going to take a bit of a turn away from the sort of the operational challenges and issues with uh, pragmatic trials that we heard earlier this morning, and then we did dive into. Um, the sort of impact and consequences and considerations related to blinding. Now we're going to turn to um, um, this topic of, okay, so what does all this have to do with our um, inferences that we actually make on, the, um, on these treatment effects? Uh, for example, issues such as real-world patterns of treatment, um, including crossover, early stopping, intermittent use. Um, how do all of these impact the trial analyses and um, our uh, inferential statistics that are calculated? Uh, we'll be considering these issues um, uh, uh, during, during this particular panel, and then I do want to remind you all that right after this session, we do have an open comment period as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our panel. Uh, kicking us off will be David Price, the Primary Care Rep uh, Respiratory Society Professor of Primary Care Respiratory Medicine at the University of Aberdeen, UK, and Managing Director of the Observational and Pragmatic Research Institutes in Singapore, and Managing Director of uh, Optimum Patient Care in Australia and, and the UK. Uh, all over the place. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, Vince Wiley is uh, joining me, uh, principal scientist at Health Corps. Uh, Mark Levinson is director, division of Biometric 7 at the Office of Biostatistics and CEDAR FDA. Uh, Jesse Berlin, uh, vice president of epidemiology at J&J. &J. And then Lisa Lavange is a professor and associate chair, Department of Biostatistics, Gilling School of Public Health, of Global Public Health, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, so I turn things over to David. Thank you very much, and uh, great honor and pleasure to be here with you all today. You've heard about my rather strange life already, so thank you for that. Um, 
And I do actually genuinely have a, a base in Singapore and Australia, but I very rarely go to Aberdeen, or there we, and you, I, you might ask why, or maybe why not. Um, but we've been doing a lot of real world research, I guess for a long time. I think my first published paper with real world data was 1995. <coughs> so I think I've got the t-shirt for the most wrongly done studies, as well as some of maybe hopefully some of the more helpful studies. And, I was asked to originally talk about one recently published paper in JAMA, the Twix trial, but I thought as well, I was exploring some of the issues for this session that I bring in two other um, pragmatic trials that one we've completed <coughs> a long time ago and one that we're about to commence, where it brings up slightly different issues about inference. Um, some of you may have seen this paper in JAMA recently. It was a UK HTA. Um, funded trial to look at the effect of theophylline in COPD. Theophylline is a very old drug, um, used at normal doses, it, it just improves patients a bit but not as good as standard medicines, um, but it's a pill and at low dose was thought to potentially make a difference. So this trial was really funded on the basis of cheap, old technology, could it improve outcomes for COPD which we know has bad outcomes. And this is on top of usual care and on top of basically all of the maximised therapies that we would normally use for people who have bad COPD. So people with lots of flare-ups of disease. And we actually randomised them to theophylline and placebo. And people said, why were you randomising in this real-life design? Well, because we could. It wasn't too expensive. It cost us about £150,000. It's not worth much in US dollars these days. Um, and uh, we, we were able to send the drugs out by post, and we minimised the study visits. So there was a baseline of six months and a year. And health outcomes were collected both from electronic health records as well as patient report at the end of the study. So um, this is a, a diagram we drew up a few years ago. You know the Preissay wheel, of course, but this was the one where we tried to think about the ecology of care versus the type of patients in studies. And um, Jerry Krishnan, who's, I know is in the audience, was also one of the co-authors on this, where we tried to describe how sure we were about the diagnosis through to the ecology of care. And I, really what we thought with Twix was that we insisted that they have a good diagnosis of COPD, not necessarily specialist laboratories, but a good diagnosis. So, but fairly normally cared for, maybe a little better than normal, but so we put it in the middle there. And what did we find? Well, I've never seen an odds ratio come out like this, or a hazard ratio, or a rate ratio. 1.00, <laughs> adjusted 0.99. It didn't work. But there were a few interesting issues. Um, and certainly it was very pragmatic. We were using it in a clinical um, scenario. We were lucky to be able to use placebo. And there was no comparator to study because there isn't a comparator in these patients. Um, it was well covered. It represented primary care, secondary care, minimal inclusion criteria apart from the fact these patients really needed extra medicines. However, we had some limitations. A quarter of the patients stopped taking treatment. Why? Because we did informed consent and we gave them a lovely long leaflet that told them all about the potential side effects of theophylline. So they all got gastric upset and stopped it. Um, so we actually had to over-recruit, so we actually go back and get extra money and put a load more patients in. Now, is that the right thing to do? I don't know. Um, we also use patient-reported exacerbations. Maybe there's some bias, but we did verify with the HRs. No true measures of adherence. So we certainly got no result. We believe, and I think we're pretty certain there's no result to be found there, but there are, if there'd been borderline, there would have been real question marks. What about some lessons from some other studies, though? Some of you will be familiar with this trial that we published a few years ago in the New England, again a UK government-funded trial, to look at leukotriene antagonists, a pill for asthma, that in efficacy trials versus inhaled steroids works badly. Well, it works, but not as well as inhaled steroids. And as a result, most guidelines make statements like this, inhaled steroids are the most effective preventer drug for adults and older children, da, 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 da. However, one of the questions that came up at, right at the end of the last session was about 
What about, what about real-life interactions? Now, I don't believe that adherence is the only real-life interacting factor. And patients are excluded from classical asthma trials on a large number of grounds. In fact, 98% of patients are excluded. 98%. So that's on the grounds of smoking, more than 10 pack years in their lives. Not having severe enough disease. Um, not having other comorbidities, particularly right at severe rhinitis. Not having something called reversibility, a big improvement in lung function. And the question is, does that bias the results? And so one of the things we set out to do in this trial was to really broaden the inclusion criteria, try and study some of those subgroups. We didn't have enough money to do all of it, but to at least look at some of that. And we are comparing very different technologies here. We're talking about a pill that requires no training. People know how to swallow pills generally. Higher adherence in studies, it works quickly. It works pretty well in non-allergic disease, treats the nose as well as the lungs and might be more effective in smokers. Whereas the inhaled steroids taken by an inhaler, patients can't, don't know how to use them, they don't take them. More gradual effects, doesn't work in the nose. So you've got different technologies. So we believed it was right to randomize patients to either receive a leukotriene antagonist or an inhaled steroid at the point of care. Patients with telephone randomization, normal prescribing, reimbursing extra costs through the healthcare system to the, to the payers. And we set our primary endpoint at two months and our final endpoints at two years. And what we basically saw, and this again is, I, I would put it here because it was, a, it was more of a clinical diagnosis, less confirmed than the Twix trial. And what these patients look like versus standard RCTs out there, they're a bit older, they have less severe disease, many more smokers. And the other thing is we had very low dropouts, 4% over two years versus other standard trials around that time of about 16%. And what do we find? Absolutely no difference. <laughs> so, is the meta-analyses wrong? Are the guidelines wrong? Well, we actually found, of course, patients took more of the leukotriene antagonists, a pill. People also who smoked did better. Those with rhinitis, there were some hints of doing better. So many real-life factors interacting, and I think those are incredibly important to explore. The other problem that occurred, though, is crossover. And we managed to keep it really clean for two months, and then the problem occurred is that you go back, you, you're given a leukotriene antagonist, a pill not recognised by UK guidelines at that time, at least not in that position. And so you go and see a doctor who's a locum in the practice. He says, what on earth are you doing on that medicine? You shouldn't be on that. <laughs> and switching them over. They weren't switched for any other reason. There was no greater exacerbations. So, so we actually obviously did two things. We did a true ITT and a per protocol to really try and understand, also get into the subgroups. So I think these issues are really important when we think about inference. And I want to finish with one last trial, which we're just about to start. We got funding. I had to spend a long time with the Ethics Committee last week in the UK, so I've flown all around the world this week, um, trying to discuss what level of consent was appropriate. There's loads of studies of adherence devices out there that show adherence support improves adherence, but never improves outcomes. So who's going to pay for it? Good question, eh? So we spent a long time persuading a a company to do a cluster randomised trial with us using a, um, an add-on that Propeller Health provide on top of a standard inhaler for people with COPD who have bad outcomes and poor adherence. And we did it by doing this as a cluster randomised trial because our question is, it's not does this device help, that's not our question. Our question is what is the impact of an, an enhanced adherence package? the right drugs, the right add-ons, with the practice becoming more aware of adherence and starting to think about it more, patients becoming more aware. What does that do to outcomes, both for those who take up the technology, but also for the broader practice population who are also managed by the same doctors and nurses? So that's why we've gone for a cluster randomized trial and with using hard outcomes of flare-ups of COPD. 
Now, what makes this possible? Well, we're very lucky. We've, brought a, we've created a network over the last 15 years of 800 primary care sites in the UK on the back of quality improvement programs where we have access to all of their EHR data. And we also have some patient reported information and their willingness to participate in research. So we actually can identify the right patients for them and help them when they're, if they are in the randomised arm. And what's important for me in terms of inference, and I think this slide I think is my most important slide really, is what populations we're looking at here. Yes, there's a group of people who take up this technology. And there's a group in the control practices who would have taken it up when we quiz them at the end of a year. That might be our primary population. But there's also all those other patients who flared up with poor adherence who didn't take up the tech. And then those with poor adherence actually were doing pretty well. Well, what's very smarter than probably. And then there's the other frequently exacerbating patients. What is the outcomes for all of these populations, not just the ones that actually take up the tech? And hopefully we won't end up with another negative trial of adherence support. Thank you very much for listening. And the reason I put a question slide up, it's all about the question, which is what I have delighted to hear somebody else say earlier. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vince Wiley. Great. Thanks, Greg. And I, I definitely have a better appreciation for blinding now sitting in that yeah. seat with the, uh, <laughs> with the lights going on. Literally. Um, so when we sat down and discussed what we wanted to talk about in this uh, you know, particular panel session, you know, one of the things we wanted to look at was the heterogeneity of the populations that are recruited into real world trials and how that might impact you know, causal inference. And uh, what I thought I wanted to at least use an example for you today to, to kind of reflect actual patient populations and the considerations that at least that, that we have gone through in this one particular trial and how to pick a study uh, and how to pick a study population was to use the, an Air, the AIRWISE trial, which is a trial that we're doing in, in COPD. Real briefly, the, uh, the AIRWISE trial is planned enrollment of about 3,200 COPD patients. Uh, Health Corps is a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Anthem. We have access to the Anthem claims data, so we are having a subset of folks who will get claims data on as well as some non-Anthem Health Plan members. Uh, patients are going to be randomized either to dual bronchodilator therapy or triple therapy, which is dual bronchodilator therapy plus an inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, it's open label, 12-month follow-up. There's only two visits. There's a randomization visit and then a forced visit at the 12-month uh, mark. Though if they were going to have that normally scheduled, then, then they, would, they would go as, as, as normal, usual care. Uh, really trying to get it in community-based physician sites. And, and we haven't talked much about that today and probably a little bit out of the scope today, but you know, really trying to broaden this not only to research sites and having patients that are quote unquote real world, but doing it at places that uh, maybe aren't akin to doing research, but where most of the care in America occurs. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about using administrative claims data to identify those practices in patients. Uh, and then briefly, our analysis, it is a non-inferiority, as you would expect uh, with, the, with the design, as well as the primary endpoint time to first moderate or severe uh, COPD exacerbation. So that's the basis of the trial. Uh, when working with existing data, you know, David talked about some of his work in using EHRs. In, in this particular study, we're leveraging administrative claims data uh, to a large extent. Uh, so we helped in developing the protocol. Uh, certainly, we, we, we found some gaps in care that we thought that the study could address. Uh, looking at current treatment patterns, and I'll show you how that helped to influence our inclusion uh, criteria, uh, as well as sample size calculations and ultimately what our endpoints should be. You know, we looked at, for instance, we modeled some of the uh, COPD exacerbations we were seeing in the, in the uh, population and, and used that to help inform our sample size calculation. We performed a protocol feasibility. You know, we had some great ideas, but did we have enough patients and enough sites to be able to, uh, to pull it off? And then finally, we actually used that data to help recruit and reach out to those sites and help the sites identify those particular patients. So what I want to do is then show you um, how we used a uh, kind of a preparatory retrospective study to help inform our, our, 
our design. So I come from a clinical trials background. I did clinical trials for 10 years. I was the crazy clinical pharmacist running through clinics trying to get patients and working with the physicians and then, and then and talking with the patients and consenting them. And I did tons of respiratory studies. And David will tell you, every one of those studies, I learned how to do spirometry. I, I've, I've done thousands of spirometries in, in my lifetime. Um, we did that with all our respiratory studies. But we said, well, what goes on in the real world when somebody has a COPD diagnosis? And what we found was 27% of patients had a spirometry result within one year before or after they got diagnosed. So we said, huh, okay, well, let's, let's, let's keep that into consideration. Also, what we wanted to look at is, well, what, are, what drugs are people on? And th these were slides that I presented at the CHEST annual meeting a couple years ago in a, a presentation of these results. And I, one, of the, one of the things we looked at was different combination therapies people were on. And, Basically, no matter what level of, of, uh, of gold status you were, that's, those are the guidelines for COPD treatment. Um, as far as combination therapies goes, ics lava was by far the most common therapy, and LAMA on the, uh, another type of therapy on the monotherapy side. So we looked at that and said, okay, that should help guide us so we're, we'll have a, enough of a population. So we had a lot of hard discussions when we went, got down to the inclusion exclusion criteria and ended up, and, and I had lots of discussions with potential investigators on the pros and cons of this, but we did decide to not require spirometry for the, uh, for the inclusion of the patients. What we said was it was gonna be defined by the study physician. If that study physician had spirometry results on hand and that informed their uh, inclusion criteria, uh, their, informed their, their diagnosis of COPD, awesome. If not, then if that, if that physician had them and were treating them as a COPD patient, we, uh, we, we did that and we felt um, that was justified based on what we were seeing in the real world patterns and we wanted to replicate it in those patients. In addition, uh, we decided to, based on what we had seen of, as far as drug use goes within patients, um, that these would be the appropriate therapies that people then would be stepped up to the, the one of the two arms that we were randomizing them to. So trying to show you here what we tried to do was use existing data to be able to help identify uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The other thing I would note when I present this typically is this is all the inclusion exclusion criteria for the trial. You know, when I present clinical trials, typically I would need four or five slides and have to truncate. This is all that we have. So again, a very heterogeneous you know, population. So as far as implications on this and implications on, um, on, on causal effect, it, you know, certainly we, we talked to some folks that brought up the potential watering down of, uh, of effects. Uh, and Peter even brought up the fact of, you know, does that really matter, is it, is it all adherence or not? So, you know, I, I do think that there is, there's something to be said for watering that down. But I also think that even more important is that we are gonna be studying groups of patients who are not included in, in the clinical trials. And as someone who did clinical trials and had, uh, appropriately so, had a small cohort of patients who went from trial to trial, mm -hmm. um, I was always hoping at the end of the day, gosh, I hope they're representative of everybody else in the U.S. because several drugs were approved based on their, on their results. So I do think it's important as a, you know, someone who was uh, practiced clinically and worked inside a patient-centered medical home and advised patients and physicians of what drugs to treat to be able to have that information. The other thing, and I think my fellow um, panel members are going to bring it too, a lot of the discussions we've had around Airwise and other trials that we've done have really talked a lot about what do we do analytically as far as adherence goes, you know, the crossover, early stopping, intermittent use, you know, doing analyses that look at both ITT and per protocol, you know, those patients if they had had adhered to, to therapy. Other key aspects as far as causal inference go are missing data and what do you do uh, around missing data, and certainly there's experts here that are much better than I, uh, but those are lots of discussions that we've, that we've had. So kind of in, in summary, what I was hoping to, to try to accomplish with a real world example was to show you, uh, you know, an approach that we use to try to thoughtfully come up with uh, what we thought was the most appropriate population, much more heterogeneous than would be uh, in a uh, traditional uh, RCT, and then these other factors that may impact causal uh, inference. So. With that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Greg to go to the next Great. speaker. Yeah, thanks, Vince. Thank right. uh, turn it over to uh, Mark Levinson. Oh, sorry, which is the four? Uh, the big green one. Okay. No, the big one. The big green one. 
Okay, so I think I have to start by saying I've been wrong in uh, wrong two ways before I even start my talk. I thought by now someone would have said something like a randomized trial becomes an observational study on day two. I don't think anyone said explicitly that, uh, but I think uh, we've heard a lot of things like that. Um, the other thing I, I felt wrong in my mind is I thought this uh, topic would kind of come out of nowhere from the rest of the day, but I think starting from Bob Temple's talk, we heard issues like ITT, whether that's relevant or not, and that's very much what this is going to be about, so I'm going to return to that. So, uh, I mean, the basis behind a statement like this is, you know, randomization is great, but right away things happen, like patients drop out, uh, patients have severe adverse events, they switch therapy, you, lo you lose them to follow up, you have missing data. All, all these things uh, sort of break the, um, break the randomization. And the lessons we know from observational studies, uh, uh, which are basically causal inference, can be applied here. Uh, that's, that's not to say that, uh, that all of a sudden this is going to become an observational study and we're going to you know, have all the issues with that. Uh, but uh, there are some lessons about defining the causal question that I think would uh, help here, you know, def uh, clarify what we're trying to get at and hopefully achieve that better. Uh, so I'm not here, uh, well, it's like Mark Anthony would say, I'm not here to praise <coughs> observational studies, but I think there is uh, something to learn from them. Uh, so first I'd like to start uh, by showing some actual adherence in two studies, a traditional clinical trial and an observational study. And I believe these real world trials, the adherence may fall somewhere between. Uh, so don't pay attention to the Kaplan Meyer curve here. What I'm interested in is the number at risk. Uh, so this is a kind of a well known study, uh, uh, Dabigatron, a novel anticoagulant versus the traditional uh, warfarin anticoagulant. Uh, this was one of the confirmatory trials to establish. Uh, it's ev uh, evidence for effectiveness. And on the bottom, you can see the patients, how many are around in various follow-up points. So it starts about 6,000 patients for each of the three arms. Uh, you lose very few at six months, and at 12 months, you still have lost less than 5% of the patients. So this is an ITT analysis, so these patients are still being followed and not necessarily on drug. Uh, but we can see on the next slide that the that the um, patients are pretty uh, adherent in this, um, that after one year, um, generally about 15% of the patients are no longer on therapy. Uh, so, I mean, these traditional trials are designed to avoid all the issues that mess up the randomization, in including blinding as in the last session, but as well as making sure uh, you follow the patients as well as hopefully in encourage some way of adherence to the, to the therapy. Um, so contrast this um, with a very high quality observational study of basically the same question. And again, I'm not focusing on the outcomes here, I'm focusing on the number of risks. So this was a, a comparison of a number of novel anticoagulants um, using CMS data. So the numbers are quite large at, at time zero. Uh, but um, by, by six months, we've already lost, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let me get this right. We've already lost you know, most of our patients by six months, and by a year, we only have a small fraction of the patients. Um, I think, as I said earlier, I think in real world trials, we're going to see something between what we saw in the last couple of slides and this pattern, depending on probably how real world they are. Um, but you get a question, would you run a non-inferiority trial with a, you know, adherence like this? Uh, just an aside, you know, there's a lot of interest in why or why not observational studies agree with uh, of randomized trials, and I think, you know, besides the obvious confounding, the adherence is going to be a big issue, and that will continue to be an issue uh, with uh, real-world uh, trials using real-world data. Uh, so we may not see them always agree with the traditional trials for a number of reasons, including adherence. Okay, so now I'm just going to spend the last two slides, as I said, to try to define what we're estimating at, what's, what the causal question is. 
And I'm going to use this framework uh, that's in this ICH, this International Guideline uh, for Statistical Principles. Uh, it's based on this concept of estimate, so that's what's your, what you're estimating. Now, it's not a very catchy word, but you don't have to worry about the estimate. Let's just think about it. That's what you're trying to estimate here. And uh, this, this, I recommend you read this. It's, it's a very, uh, I think, thoughtful uh, uh, document to explain to specify what you're trying to estimate. And there's basically the, these four components, population, variable, intercurrent events, and, and I'm going to go into that in more detail in a moment, and the summary measure. Uh, now, you think the population is a pretty straightforward thing. Well, that's just the inclusion, exclusion criteria. Well, uh, that's not always, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's not always the case. Uh, uh, for example, with missing data, you may not have uh, follow up on a representative uh, population. So let me speed up. So, um, in, intercurrent events, those are events that occur after randomization. So that's the stopping therapy, crossover, uh, and a, a serious adverse event. So, these are things, and it's particularly missing data too, that really might mess up your randomization. Uh, so, there's, there's a number of ways that are discussed in this guideline on how to address these intercurrent events. And they use different terminology for various reasons. For example, everyone talks ITT, but it actually people mean different things sometimes when they talk about ITT. And there's really no such thing as that when you have necessarily missing data. Uh, but the treatment policy is basically what we think of ITT. Well, whatever happens to these patients, uh, that's what we care about. You know, if they stop therapy two months into a two-year trial, that's fine. That's what the real world's about. Uh, there was an interesting paper by Miguel Hernan that argued against that strategy for obvious reasons, like, you know, you might by, by diluting the effect or, for example, if, you know, half your patients drop out for a serious adverse event and, um, well, <laughs> um, um, if a number of your patients drop out for a serious adverse event, uh, and there, you know, is that like rep your final efficacy uh, really representative of the outcome of the trial? Uh, so even, and this is what Bob Temple started the day with, if no one's actually taking the drug, is this really what you're interested in? And I, and I was afraid this would be a controversial topic, but it seems like a number of people during the day felt maybe ITT is not the right approach. So that it brings us to this per protocol approach. Uh, per protocol, you know, this is while people are on drug. Uh, but unfortunately, it becomes a little more complicated than that. Uh, just censoring people when they stop therapy and then doing the analysis on that data uh, may not get you the right answer because the people who are censored, the people who uh, stop therapy, the people who switch therapy, they may be different from um, other, from the people who don't. And that's where all this causal inference comes in. And that's things like instrumental variables. I think Jesse will talk a little bit about. That's one solution to uh, getting this per protocol analysis, but it's not straightforward and it often involves some assumptions. And I'll just mention one last strategy that's mentioned in this guideline, and that's the composite endpoint. So, for example, you might define your endpoint as like an NMI or stopping therapy. Uh, so, you account for both the adherence problem and, and sort of the clinical outcome. Uh, so, perhaps we might discuss more of this in the discussion, but that's basically what I have to say. So, thank you. Great. Turn to uh, uh, Jesse. Do, do I have slides? Or? <laughs> okay. See, now every time I come to one of these, I think I should really print out a copy of my slides so I'm not standing up here in front of everybody with no notes. <laughs> so here I am standing. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, you want to go back? I want to go back. <laughs> okay. It's causal inference, not casual inference. I made that mistake. Um, so, so the first thing you're going to learn is that I never work. You'll see my slides, and you'll know that I never worked from McKinsey. <laughs> 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 Sorry, had to get that one in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I do, since we've been talking about this question of heterogeneity, I just want to spend a minute or two on, on this issue of, of um, heterogeneous populations. And the main point I want to make is how are you ever going to know um, if treatment effect varies across populations, subpopulations, if you don't include subpopulations in the study? So, um, you know, maybe it's not the first study you want to do, but uh, at some point you do want to get a sense for how, how treatment effect is going to vary. 
so, um, and that gets back to the generalizability question also, because uh, you know people use that word generalizability, but you know we're, we're pretty sure that not everyone responds, and so th we're always kind of faced with that question of where is treatment going to be most effective and who's at risk of adverse events. Um, and I, I do want to make this suggestion of a kind of a compromise. Um, and typically, we, we in our trials we exclude uh, certain populations. Um, without getting into pregnant women, uh, let's just say uh, people over 75, I was going to say elderly, but as I get older, elderly keeps getting older. <laughs> um, but if you take people over 75, let's say, who might be excluded from the initial uh, registration trials, uh, then we, we go into uh, post-market and we know nothing about how the drug's going to work or what the adverse effects are going to be in that population. Uh, so the, the ethics and of not including those people, I would say, are pretty questionable. Excuse me, questionable, just because we we have no information. Then you know, then now we're in a in a truly observational study. Um, so my compromise suggestion is uh, maybe there's a way to include a broader population, e even if we're not going to do that as the primary analysis. What if we were to include a broader population in the the early studies? The primary analysis is going to focus on the narrow population that we would have done normally, uh, but now we have some additional randomized evidence um, in those populations that we otherwise wouldn't understand at all. And you know, the, the finance guys are going to kill me for making that suggestion. But, um, too bad. Um, so what I want to do is talk about this. Um, it's a paper, and, and I'm not suggesting this is the answer. There's a lot of assumptions that go into these kinds of analyses, um, but it does get into this topic of causal inference methods. Um, and the reason I put this up is to remind me to say that Yi Ting Wang is really kind of the brains behind the paper. Um, so Yi Ting and Mar Marsha Wilcox. Um, so if you have any technical questions, don't ask me. Um, <laughs> but this, this was published in clinical trials a few years ago, um, and uh, it, it's trying to get at this issue of noncompliance and crossover. Um, there, there's a, a lot of literature in this area of causal inference, um, various approaches around to controlling for confounding um, or addressing noncompliance. Um, and the one that I'll, I'll just mention, because it, it's, I'm told, my experts tell me that um, this idea of principal stratification, which is what we actually use in the paper, it's principal spelled with an A-L, um, by the way, um, that there's a parallel between that and, and uh, instrumental variables, which is Bill Crown, are you still around? Because um, don't kill me for saying something stupid. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> you, you can come up and correct me. Um, but the, the principle behind instrumental variables, it comes from economics uh, and theory. Um, is that it's a variable that's related to exposure, but not to outcome, except through exposure. And if you take a step back, randomization is, we're, so we're talking about these large randomized trials, randomization is, it meets, the, it's the perfect ra uh, instrumental variable, because <coughs> it completely determines, at least at the beginning, completely determines treatment. and. It, it should not have an effect on the outcome, except if the treatment works better than the control. So it's really kind of an ideal setting. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we, we did some simulation studies. Um, the setting here was randomized trials of, uh, for cardiovascular safety for diabetes drugs. Um, and you all know, I assume, that the, the principle here uh, nowadays is you have to rule out an increase in cardiovascular risk of a relative risk of 1.3. Um, that's the regulatory guideline. And that's a non-inferiority trial um, for a safety endpoint, right? And non-inferior, in one of the drafts of the study questions, that the words non-inferiority were mentioned, so I thought I'd call that out. Um, we generated hypothetical trials. Th these are going to be big studies. Hypothetical trials of 10,000 total subjects randomly assigned to treatment or control. Um, treatment, we're allowing for treatment discontinuation and crossover. And this principal stratification idea puts people into these bins of compliers, always takers. So compliers are people who take what they're assigned to, 
always takers are always going to take the active treatment no matter what you tell them to do. Um, never takers are never going to take it no matter what, what you tell them to do. Um, and then there, there's a group that we left out, which are the, uh, I forget what we call them, but they're the, the, you do, they do the opposite of what you tell them to do. Uh, so we, threw, we didn't consider them. Um, so, but one, the, one of the assumptions we built into this analysis, and there's some evidence for this in the literature, is that people who are poor compliers are going to do worse no matter what drug they're taking. And th there's a number of examples of that happening. So we, we built that in with varying levels of, of effect. Um, two minutes. Um, so what did we find? Um, the, the causal analysis always or almost always removes the bias due to the crossover. Um, there are a couple of small exceptions. Intent to treat is always, um, except when there's no treatment effect, intent to treat is biased. Um, when the upper bound estimates from the intent to treat analysis were, le were greater than 1.3, the corresponding estimates from the causal analysis were also greater than 1.3. So we're okay there. Um, but the, the flip side is not true. You can have ITT analyses where the upper bound is below 1.3, but the corresponding causal analysis, the upper bound can be above 1.3, and that happened about 60% of the, 66% of the time. Th there's an aside here, which I didn't mention, and I'll, um, I'll run 10 seconds over, but for a safety question like this, if, if we screw up because of poor compliance for an efficacy question, then it's, it's our problem. We haven't shown that the drug works. If we screw up because of non-compliance on a safety question, then it's everybody else's problem. If we miss a safety issue because of lack of compliance, you know, that's a bad thing. So the point of this is to understand how bad could the safety problem be uh, under perfect compliance. Um, so that, that's what we learned. Um, that the survival analysis removes the bias, um, but there's a cost, and it's a theme I, I got onto this morning. Uh, the cost is when you start applying these methods, you increase the variance of the estimate. So that's where that difference in upper bounds comes from. Um, you, know, the, you can have a nice tight confidence interval for the ITT. When you blow up, you, you apply the causal analysis and you blow up the variance. You know, you're fixing the bias, but you're blowing up the variance estimate. And so your, your upper bound goes above. So um, the, the message here, which I said this morning, and I'll just emphasize again, is. You know, we, we delude ourselves, that was David Madigan's word, um, we delude ourselves into thinking we know more than we know. So uh, part of the message today is that we really need to be good, at, better about acknowledging uncertainty in the analyses when it's there. And I think I'm probably done. All right, thanks. Listen. Uh, thanks, Jesse. So we'll turn to Lissa. It just works. Perfect. Okay. So in the nature of being a true panelist, I'm sitting on the panel. Uh, also watching you guys struggle with the lights. And <laughs> I just uh, was asked to close out the session with some uh, comments and reactions. And this is a topic that I am interested in for a number of reasons, not just comparative effectiveness, but also my stint at the FDA. I was involved in the E9 guidance that Mark alluded to um, and all the problems with adherence, poor adherence and missing data and what that can do to your randomized trial. And I think with pragmatic trials that may be the, at least in the top two of the things that can go wrong. Um, but, but outside of this session, one of, my, one of the favorite things I heard uh, was from Steve Pianadosi earlier. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Um, brilliant clinical trialist, and your book is still one of my favorites. Um, but the idea that we go into these real-world trials and we think that we've got these big data sources, access to big populations, and by definition we're going to be more real-worldy. Um, but if you filter down and filter down and filter down a very big number, and you still end up with a very big number, it's no more real-worldly than a clinical trial if you've lost 80 percent of the people that you started with through your filters. And I think that that, that idea of trying to get the data structures and go to the results back earlier at your point of contact is really, is really quite good um, and something that we should probably think more about, especially 
when I think of the data structures people are building and the data models, common data models with big data, uh, and electronic medical records are almost always the cornerstone of those data sets. Um, but anyway, back to this session. The, so Bob Temple, of course, aren't you glad he spoke at the beginning of the day and not the end of the day so we wouldn't end on that note? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but Bob had some actually great things to say, as he always does. Um, and he called out this idea of the ITT, the, the um, population or the analysis method, whichever way you want to go with that definition. And, um, you know, the, when I, again, when I think about the purpose of real world data and using it to generate real world evidence, when I hold on to randomization in a pragmatic trial and try and sort of have my cake and eat it too, uh, it, it, the, what's called the treatment policy estimate in ICHE9, it's, it's very much not called ITT for a reason I'll say in a minute, it's a treatment policy estimate. It, it seems philosophically to fit to me. You, you're going into an existing healthcare system, you're starting uh, the patients on some path of treatment, and then you're going to be hands off and see what happens because you want to see in a real world day, uh, setting, like in the, um, the trial talked about earlier, um, the, Sima, Sima, uh, the Novo Nordisk trial, uh, where you can stop and start other meds, we don't care, uh, the trialists don't care, you get randomized and hands off, let's just see what happens. That's our best estimate of real world. Well, that's the spirit of a treatment policy estimate. You randomize and you take the outcomes that you can get and you don't really pay attention to the intercurrent events, which could be taking a rescue med, crossing over to the other arm, um, because you want to see what happens in the real world. So philosophically, it's lined up. It's not called ITT in E9 for a, for a very good reason, because people use ITT in different ways. ITT, if you go back in the literature, was will, really intended to define a population, not an analysis method. And it means everybody, randomized, regardless of what they took. So it's as, tre it's the, it's as randomized instead of as treated. Well, <coughs> how many papers do you read, especially in pragmatic trials, where they, they say, oh, we did an ITT analysis, but we lost 20% of our patients, but we still did an ITT analysis. Well, actually, you didn't if you don't have an outcome on everybody, right? It's not ITT. And that's why E9 purposefully didn't use that language. I can't say it's ITT unless I have an outcome on everybody. Uh, now, what happens then? Okay, well, if I'm gonna be true to that, I'll have to impute an outcome. If I've lost them or if they've crossed over and I don't wanna use the outcome I have, I have to impute something else. And that's where things can start to go wrong. And E9 talks about that a lot. Um, there are good ways and there are bad ways to impute outcomes. A bad way to impute an outcome would be imputing it as if the person didn't drop out or if the person didn't have a side effect or if the person didn't take a, need to take a rescue med because there you're just assuming that they didn't have to do that, but they did have to do that. So that's a parallel universe that I'm not that interested in, right? Um, and we used to joke um, Tom Permit was the statistician, is the statistician in Cedar, who was our point person and, and lead and did a lot of the writing on E9 as well as the strategic thinking. And we used to joke um, that if we followed that imputation method and called it ITT, that we would end up approving drugs that only worked for people who couldn't take them. And you have to think about that for a minute, but because um, all the people that drop out get good values imputed as if they didn't drop out. So, so that's, that's tricky if, if you want to go the real world way and use a treatment poly, policy estimate. Uh, I think it makes sense with, with pragmatic trials, but you do have to have an outcome. And where you get that outcome, you're going to have to put some thought into. Now, the other analysis people have talked about all day is the per protocol. And, and there's a niceness about per protocol because you would like to find out um, what really happens if you stay on the drug. And I, I've had lots of conversations with Bob about um, the, over the years about these real world trials. And you know, if they, the one thing I think they can't do is, this, is find out what the pharmacological effect of the drug is. They can find out what the effect of the drug is in a real world setting. But if you really wanna know what the, what the drug does, if you haven't learned that earlier in your phase, then a pragmatic trial is not going to get you there for all the reasons that Bob and everybody else have mentioned. The effect gets attenuated for lots of different reasons in a real world setting. So we know it can't do that, but that still doesn't mean that you might not be more interested in it if you could estimate the drug in the real world setting 
but account for the, the people who can't take it, account for the crossovers and so forth. And you can do that. You, you, E9 talks about how to do it not, again, in a, in a nonsensical way. You don't want to take just the people who finish, the people who finish the trial. Uh, you don't want to take, we would call that completers and compliers or per protocol population. Um, because you don't know who would have completed had they been assigned the more uh, hard to take drug. So in the case of um, David's trial with the tablet versus the inhaler, he had a lot better adherence on the tablet. The people on the inhaler dropped out more, but would they have adhered better if they'd had the tablet? Now that's one way to interpret it. Um, the real way to figure that out is with these causal uh, inference methods that observational studies have used and uh, economists too, going back in the history. And the idea is to try and equalize. You want to try and buy back the randomization of advantage that you lost by having differential dropouts, uh, by predicting adherence or predicting need for rescue, whatever you need to predict. But that requires covariates, and some of the covariates are pre-randomization and some are post-randomization. The post-randomization ones are really tricky statistically. Um, that, but, it, but it can be done. They're sophisticated methods. They're causal inference methods. They have been shown to work in observational studies. They can work in a pragmatic trial to get you back to an estimate, a treatment effect that you're interested in. Not just one you can estimate, but one that you really would like to estimate. So here, I'll conclude with my, with my philosophical feeling, and this is after my several years at FDA and going back and forth in academia and pharma. To me, this is the, the, the biggest problem here is that these methods, like the causal inference methods, um, they, rec they don't fit well with the regulatory need for pre-specification. And this is a I think this is a common problem. I worked a lot in rare diseases uh, in my whole career. Um, rare diseases, there's a big push to use external control data. And, you know, sitting inside the agency, uh, listening to people who are very distrustful, which is what a regulator's job is. We have to challenge uh, industry to prove to us that they did the right thing. Um, how do you, you know, if, a, if an external control exists ahead of time, how do you prove that you didn't just pick the worst outcomes so that any drug would look good, right? Well, how do you pre-specify when the data exists already? There are ways to do it, but it's not our usual way. Randomized trials are so easy. Everything's pre-specified. They're not easy. They're hard. As, they're very hard to conduct. But statistically, pre-specify, have your analysis plan, and then don't touch it and let the trial run. We at least know that we can prove we haven't, you know, done anything untoward. When the data exists already, that gets harder and harder. So meta-analyses are another example. We worked, Mark, Bob, and I all worked on the meta-analysis. Jesse, you worked on it. <laughs> the meta-analysis guidance. And... Um, what it's, it's the same, you're grappling with exactly the same thing. The trials have already been run. You know what the outcomes are. So how can you prove that you didn't just pick the trials that will give you the answer you want in the meta-analysis? Well, we spent a number of pages trying to explain how you might do that with pre-specification, but it's hard when the data already exists. I, I would argue the same, well, and actually the quality stuff is similar too, because, because you have to live with the data you have. You have to live with the trials you have in a meta-analysis. The follow-up may be differentially, uh, in, differential in length, but more importantly, differential in different in quality. Um, so now you're in a pragmatic setting, and you want to use data that either already exists or exists for another purpose. So you've lost control. You don't, in a prospective randomized trial, you control everything. You control the duration of follow-up. You control the quality. You, you've lost control for that and you lose some of the advantages of randomization even when you randomize inside a pragmatic trial and you have to convince the regulators that you're doing the right thing, that you're not picking things to make, to make the results look good. So I, I just, I saw that as sort of a common theme across, um, across, across all three of those problems and these, it, it kind of comes home with the causal inference methods because they're hard, they're difficult, but they work. But, they, but do they work, can they work in a regulatory setting? We have to figure out a way to mimic pre-specification so that we can use the hard methods to buy back what we lose when randomization breaks. Uh, so that's sort of my ending philosophical statement. Thanks. Right, thank you.
Um, okay, so um, great presentations. We have 15 minutes left on this panel. If I learned anything from the previous sessions, I should go to the audience now because I always end up telling people that we can't get to them. Um, uh, and watch nobody have comments in this session. So if, if a, a, any uh, questions or comments, we tackled a lot of issues in this particular session with regard to um, not just, uh, you know, a lot was on the sort of, sort of um, causal inference methodology, but also we think about earlier things that we heard um, today about the, you know, if you're unblinded or if you have a lot of um, measurement error on your outcomes or um, you have a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the, um, the sort of the clinical practice patterns that are, are reflective in the real world. What does that all mean with getting to reasonable estimates of treatment effect that we can believe are, are trustworthy? Um, uh, so that, uh, so, you know, any comments on that from our audience? And then, um, Lisa, you talked a lot about, and I, this did come up earlier in, with, um, with Nancy, and um, Nancy has talked, early, you know, before today about things like uh, as treated versus intent to treat and um, this sort of per protocol. So, Lisa, you brought up a lot of issues with that that maybe the, um, there are comments from either fellow panelists or others in the room to, to sort of weigh in on that. Um, so with that, I'll turn to uh, Bill. Uh, Bill Crown, Alton Labs, and appreciate the panel. It's terrific. And Lisa, your, your, uh, your comments, I think, really summarized a lot of the issues beautifully. Um, I just want to kind of reiterate that I think we do have sort of a lot of this experience to draw upon from the observational world, and so we get this randomization on the front end, in these studies, but now we're sort of presented with a lot of the same design issues as we get non-random attrition and we get these, you know, issues about how to deal with adherence and that what are measured over the same period as the outcomes and so forth. Uh, and um, the thing that struck, strikes me is that we've got these different causal frameworks. So there's, you know, there's the Judea Pearl directed acyclic graph people and there's the epidemiologists with the propensity score and related methods, and there's the econometricians with instrumental variables and simultaneous equations, and there's even machine learning now is, you know, targeted maximum likelihood is beginning to develop um, causal inference methods in addition to just prediction methods. Um, and I would sort of encourage us to think about um, what is there sort of a, a unifying way to bring these different methods together to think about, you know, maybe the directed acyclic graph kind of idea is sort of like a, 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 a mathematical ideal that we would like to be able to get to, but then it breaks down because there's two-way causation and things like that that uh, <coughs> economists and psychometricians deal with. And then there are issues that are being raised about, well, propensity score, Methods may inadvertently introduce colliders that are, you know, so they introduce issues that, you know, people just aren't, you know, thinking carefully enough about. So I think we can learn uh, from these different causal inference perspectives, and it's just something I make a comment about that I think we should think about. Any, any comments? Um, I, I can't speak about the methodology at all because that's beyond me. But I think one of the things it points to and I have this all the time with my own <coughs> statisticians, is that's great to try to solve things after the, uh, the end of the study, but it's an awful lot better if we try and get the data right at the beginning. And so I think that there needs to be a very big push as part of, as we start to do these pragmatic designs, to get as much characterization done at the beginning, to keep as many patients in as possible. It's really hard work. We managed to get it down to 2% in one of our studies. You know, and if you can do that, it really makes a big difference. And in fact, one of, the, one of the lessons, I think, from the real world stuff going across to the RCTs is actually that loss to follow up of patients when they're withdrawn from drug is one of the things that I think we should be challenging that way around as well. So I think we need to get that bit right. And then, then the method, methodologies, yes, they're, they're going to be incredibly important, but I think we need to try and have as maximum data we can to enable that and to expect the dropouts, to expect the crossovers and anticipate them yeah. and really work with it rather than just to try and solve it with our analysis. That would be my personal thought. What, Any other comments? Yeah. One, one quick comment to that, if I could. Um, so if you read ICHE9, the gist of this by defining estimand, which is not how you estimate but what you estimate, you can also just call it the treatment effect, 
the whole gist of that is to do it up front and to plan ahead for how you're going to handle these events that might happen so that you're not doing it at the end of the study. Yeah. Um, and that alone, I think, was one of the biggest contributions. Don't wait till it's done and then say, oops, I got missing data. What am I going to do? Uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of methods were mentioned there, and I, I won't speak, I, I won't address which might be the better method or not, but I, I think what Lisa was getting at in her main comments was what would work in the regulatory world. And, uh, and obviously I think the most important thing is something, is free specification. Uh, but there are you know, other aspects too, uh, you know, whether the assumptions can be tested. Uh, whether you have the data necessary to implement these methods. Like in a pragmatic trial, you might be collecting less data, so you may, not, you may have less information on why people drop out or so. Uh, so, I, you know, there are, there are a lot of methods out there, um, but I think there are certain attributes like pre-specification, uh, appropriate sensitivity analyses, appropriate diagnostics that will be important to make this work in a regulatory setting. Great. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, next question. Um, Jay Aram from Pfizer. Uh, for Lisa and perhaps Mark, what do you think the value of a registry, I'm thinking again in the rare disease area, uh, what is the value of a registry where voluntarily physicians in different parts of the world are contributing into a database then analyzed? What do you think? Um, well, so I think of registries as being extremely valuable as a source of control patients or as a way to understand the trajectory of a disease, and they're used quite a lot in, um, in the study of rare diseases. Um, they, they could also have the outcome data. I think people tend to think of pragmatic trials being done in EMRs and claims database environments because of the availability of the outcomes, um, whereas I think of the registry as being more complete on the patient side and the recruitment side, but I don't know, it depends on how the regularity is for data collection, whether they have the outcomes or not, but I, and I honestly haven't any experience with a pragmatic trial that's built off a registry as much as other databases, but other people might have something? No, I mean, uh, we've, we're, we're, we're running, no, we're, we're not running any very pragmatic trials or registries, but we are, we've actually got a, um, an EMA approved SAM study on the back of a registry for, for the safety of one of the biologics in severe asthma. Um, and that, that was, the, was the original plea was for a special study, which didn't make any sense when there was a perfectly viable large registry running globally, which we, which we were able to amend to turn to produce that data. Um, and I think there are some real opportunities around doing things like that. The challenge are, I, I, the challenge of trying to run a pragmatic trial in multiple countries, but I, I guess it does make sense for rare diseases where you can build the numbers. Um, you know, and uh, so I, I, I could see it happening, but I don't, and I, it's a great idea, but it hasn't been done. That's not what I know of. Hi, Mark from Luton FDA. Um, a question about uh, these large pragmatic studies where you're tracking uh, the use of a, a drug um, post market, you're following along in a real world design looking at. Uh, the use of the drug. You see the drug, uh, initially uh, patients start the dose and, and they're, they're using the drug as prescribed. The num number of units that they're using over time is consistent, but then it, it trails off. And the question is, why are they reducing the use of their, that drug? It, um, and is it, is it phase four dose ranging? Are they, are they adjusting the dose because their, their disease is getting better? And it may vary from drug to drug, or is it because the drug price is so high that they're adjusting the, the dose to, to uh, tighter their, their, uh, uh, the drug use? Because they're paying out of pocket or third party payers to pay for it. Um, how do you tell the difference between one, one possibility versus another in a, in a real world setting? Are there, are, there, are there tools that you can use to uh, look at their, uh, I guess you can figure out whether the patients are getting worse while they're taking the drug or not, or if they're, uh, getting other drugs on top of that, but are, are there other ways to look at why drug use is, uh, is it, is it really non-compliance or are they trying best to comply, but they, they're just uh, adjusting their doses? Um, yeah, we, we've looked a lot at adherence and I, I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's multifactorial is the big problem. Um, in that there's the whole patient beliefs about medicines, whether they, whether they feel they should be taking something long term, 
where they feel should have drug holidays. But there are also other things that go on is that, and one of the things that actually no one criticised me for for the Elevate paper, and I thought they should have done, was actually <laughs> patients self-treat to target. You know, they have a personal target of what they want to achieve, and they take enough medicines to reach that. So actually you could argue they took more of the pill to get to the same effect as they got to with the inhaler. And actually they then made a choice of levelling off at that amount. Now, I don't know. Um, but I think there's a bit of that in there. And so I think you've, you've got to, and to try and explore that in future work, certainly one of the things to try and look at is getting some attitudinal um, work from the patients, because particularly as we can start to monitor adherence much more effectively, um, it starts to become possible to say, okay, what was going on with your thinking? And there were some very good beliefs about medicines questionnaires out there to really capture what people think. So I do think they, they can be brought into the picture, but nobody has truly done it at this point in time alongside a study. It's been done in real life settings, but not really alongside a study. Vince? Yeah, just a couple comments. One is uh, the answer to all those bullet points you put out are yes, 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 and there's a longer, there's a longer <laughs> list. Um, a couple things that we've tried to do in our studies to pull that out. One is uh, you know, certainly uh, trying to keep cost equal between groups and, and typically what we've done by doing that is make it a little bit less than what they would normally pay out of pocket based on their insurance, but still having some skin in the game, if you will. So we've tried to, to modify that, but still try to keep it some real world elements. Second, if we, we do in some of the studies have some um, kind of satisfaction questionnaires. We, we, we really struggle. We don't want to be too intrusive in there, but in some of the studies we have tried to, to pull those out and some of those studies are, are going on right now. And lastly, analytically, uh, we've talked a lot about the fact if you don't take a drug, you don't get the effect, which um, I, I completely agree with. But one of the things we try to do in many of the, we do tons of sensitivity analyses in these, we do try to take a look at see varying levels of compliance and what that means to, to outcomes. So great question. Can I, I, I want to jump in on this one too. So um, just elaborating a little bit on what David said, um, Mark showed some of the anticoagulant data from observational study where there's this huge, huge drop off in who's staying on drug, um, which we, we also see. One, and rivaroxaban is one of our drugs. It was on the slide there. Uh, and my, my colleagues in medical affairs tell me, right, people don't feel sick. People, even people with AFib, they're not feeling sick, so why do I want to stay on this medication? It's expensive, it's a pain, but I gotta go to CVS every month. And, um, and e even with antibiotics, I think you see that people don't complete the full course of antibiotics. So once they start feeling better, they stop taking the drug, and then you know, five years later, there's uh, re antibiotic resistance because of that sort of thing. The other comment I want to make is even in randomized trials, and this is just one of my pet peeves, um, I, I spent my first few years at, at j and J reading a lot of study reports, and every study report, here's the list of reasons for discontinuation, and it's adverse events, lack of efficacy, and a couple of other ones that are specific, and then patient choice. It's like, what, we saw one this morning, where patient choice was one of the line. Okay, the patient, why is the patient choosing? <coughs> it's gotta be one of these reasons. Thanks. Uh, next question. Hi, I'm Alka Shanik from Sanapi. Um, we have an expert panel here, and as, as we develop and bring new medicines to market, the clinical trial program is there, but we are trying to get real-world evidence earlier and earlier. My question is, when we launch drugs, and, and as they start to pick up in the market, the, the prescriptions are few. How, in those cases, would you suggest or advise uh, you know, designing studies to generate real-world evidence uh, in early initiation of drugs, new launch drugs? The, 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 short, oh, answer, yeah, the short answer is be patient. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but more, more seriously, what, what we do typically now is we plan, we, we go through the exercise of the sample size calculation. Um, and so sometimes we'll also plan um, it's hard to call them interim analyses, but we'll kind of look along the way without doing an analysis that generates a treatment effect. Um, but we say we're, we're going to pull the trigger, you know, we write all the code uh, and we say we're going to pull the trigger on the analysis on uh, when we get to this many events. So we'll pre-specify exactly when, and we have a detailed analysis plan 
that's uh, we we post our protocols in advance, um, and we stick to them, um, and then you know we get to 603 events, and that's when we run the analysis. So that's a way of kind of protecting yourself against peeking at the data over and over again until you get the answer you want, and then publishing. Thank you. That's a, that's a fair point because in an RCT you don't want to do inter too many interim looks without right. you know, but but in an EMR data refresh maybe there's possible. Right. The, the temptation is always there, and we, we spend a lot as, as an heavy group surrounded by people who, who uh, well, we, we have a lot of internal discussions, let's just say, about what the right way to do this is. And what it always comes down to is you need to write a protocol, you need to adhere to the protocol, and, and we're pushing more and more now for posting protocols publicly so that you know, we're committed to an analysis plan, strategy, an analysis plan before we ever really look at, at the associations. You know, we'll look at, at the marginal data, so how many exposures do we have, how many events do we have, but we're not gonna look at the two by two table until it, it's pre, we reach the predefined point. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay, um, so that wraps up this session. I think it was a great dis discussion on uh, causal inferences. Um, so thanks to the great presentations and panelists. Now I walk up here. Um, so this, uh, this next uh, and final session of the day is a, a little bit different than what we've been doing so far. Um, the one thing is the length of it is entirely dependent on everybody in this room because it's just the um, open comment um, session. It is an important aspect of this particular meeting and the questions or comments that you all have and those of you on the webcast, um, this is your opportunity to um, provide feedback, provide comments that might inform future planning and guidance development, and this is the opportunity to get your comments um, on the record. Um, probably not the best session to ask a lot of questions. I mean, you know, it's only me up here, and so um, you may not want my answer, although I'll try to, try to not answer or, or, or um, comment on your comments unless I feel um, really compelled to do so. Um, uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll open it up to the floor for any uh, comments or questions, and I'll ask our staff if anybody's emailing um, through our webcast um, questions to go ahead and throw those up at me too, or comments. And so, so we answered every, so, so no, uh, no, no further thoughts uh, uh, for things on the record. That's perfectly fine. I, you know, I don't want to push you uh, into territory you don't want to go to, but um, um, I'll pause for, for any, any comments or, or feedback. Okay. Okay, well, there's, you know, Beltway traffic and all of that uh, pending as well, so I can understand. <laughs> um, uh, so, so um, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just wrap things up. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you can't can't get rid of me, Jesse Brown, Johnson and Johnson. I, I just you reminded me that I wanted to respond to mm -hmm. Lissa's question about uh, kind of drawing this analogy to pre-specification. So I already pounded on the point about pre-specifying a protocol. Um, and and to, to answer Bill, since I, I run an epidemiology group, we do a lot of propensity scores. Um, and what, what we've actually started doing, uh, which you can do when you have a big database, is uh, fit the propensity score first. Before we ever look at outcomes, we'll fit the propensity score. And then we can do a lot of diagnostics based on that to know do we have a potentially valid comparison or not. And if not, and it's a little hard to define the criteria for, you know, how do you know whether it's good enough or not, but, but at least in principle, you can say there, there's some threshold um, above which or below which we're, we're not going to run the analysis because we don't believe that the comparison is going to be fair. Um, but it is possible in some situations. It's a little harder when you have an ongoing trial to do the matching kind of in real time. but. There might be a way to do it. Okay, okay thanks, Jesse. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, close us up for the day. I do want to um, remind you, I have some summaries of some of the things we talked about, so hold on. Um, uh, I do want to remind you, though, that uh, we're not done. Like, tomorrow is another half day, unfortunately. I won't be with you tomorrow, but um, Mark McClellan will be here, so, you know. 
that that'll be good too. So you know, may not be as okay. Um, so um, uh, we did hear. Uh, uh, I mean, this was a, a critically important um, uh, set of discussion topics that we had today. Um, uh, we did dive into a lot of details with regard to the considerations and using randomized designs to generate real-world evidence on effectiveness. I mean, mostly we're talking about observational designs and retrospective database analysis. So it was really nice to spend the entire day focused in on using the um, the element of randomization when generating real-world evidence. Um, the questions that were addressed today and the comments. Um, were very much related to the issues that the FDA outlined in their 2018 framework. And the discussion today and tomorrow will help um, FDA as they consider these issues and work toward um, guidance. But we did hear a lot on the considerations um, on how these, um, these studies can be implemented. We had a lot of um, panelists and speakers talking directly from their own experiences in implementing randomized studies that do generate real-world evidence. Um, one of the big areas that we did, uh, I guess the main thing that did come up in the very beginning is let the question drive the design. And I think we heard that throughout the entire uh, length of the day, that these things come up, but it depends on what the real question is that you're trying to get to. Um, with regard to data measurement and the, those issues, you know, first and foremost, um, I think it was really important that um, Sean Tunis brought up that, you know, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't, basically what he said was we shouldn't just look for the endpoints that are easily measured. Or if we have a data set, let's just find the endpoints that we can measure in that data set that we should really think about what are the most meaningful um, endpoints to look at. There are many methods of bringing stakeholders, patients, regulators, um, providers, and payers together to figure out what are those most meaningful outcomes with regard to the particular disease um, that we're examining and then try to find the best ways to actually measure those outcomes. Um, sometimes that might, uh, those, uh, those ways to measure those outcomes might come from electronic medical records or claims data or registries. Um, and we did hear that, uh, you know, with, uh, in comparison to traditional clinical trials, at least those data elements, they can help us with the issue of loss to follow up as you continue to collect longer term outcomes and have a, um, a, a, a way to collect uh, additional data elements uh, for, for, for the longer term to help with loss to follow up and, can, and at least measure that and, and um, deal with that. We also heard um, that clearly there are issues with, um, um, with the measurement error and misclassification. And uh, we did learn there's not necessarily a problem if you have misclassification as long as you can measure it and it's uh, balanced across the groups. So remember um, that that's an important aspect. Um, we did turn to blinding. Blinding was a, it was a wonderful discussion. Lots of considerations in many instances where uh, we can't blind, but uh, we did hear a lot of good ideas and, and input on what can be done in those situations. And um, we did hear about the, you know, the, the, the impact or the, the sort of the influence that the objectivity of the endpoint that you're measuring has on that, the, um, whether or not there is therapeutic equipoise, um, whether or not uh, there's an expectation of benefit, uh, what that uh, size of the treatment effect is, and heard some that uh, perhaps measuring the durability of that effect uh, when you don't have blinding could be um, something worth measuring. I won't summarize the causal inference, I mean, we just had it, so, um, uh, so it's a front of mind of all of you, and, uh, uh, but we did hear a lot of issues that did come up. Um, and I was uh, impressed with the, the degree of methodology and analytic approaches that we have that deals with uh, these issues of uh, heterogeneity in the population in terms of how the patterns of care are, um, heterogeneity and treatment effect, uh, acknowledge um, uh, the uncertainty in, in the analysis, the importance of acknowledging the uncertainty in the analysis. And then um, I won't uh, summarize because I didn't quite understand, but the um, uh, as treated versus intent to treat versus per protocol, but lots of issues there um, to uh, maybe follow up with Lissa, uh, Lissa on. Um, but so, so thanks for sticking with us today. Thanks for uh, sticking around the, the entire duration of the day. We do look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a safe, uh, safe evening, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.